Dragi vdeleženci konference, ki ste se nam pridružili tu v dvorani in tudi tisti na spletu, lep pozdrav imenu ekipe Parkov Jaške zgodovine. Dovolite mi, da se najprej zahvalim glavnemu organizatorju, študijskemu centru za narodno spravo, ki nas je povabil k sodelovanju in se tudi odločil to imenitno mednarodno konferenco organizirati tu pri nas v Parko Vojaške zgodovine, v tej nekdani italijanski vojašnici. Verjetno se te odločitvi bo trovali dobra lokacija, lepi prostori, domišljam si tudi prijaznost našega osebja, a odločitev ni brez pomena in simbolike. Primorska, del slovenskega nacionalnega ozemlja na zahodni strani Rapalske meje, se je namreč že pred sto leti znašla pod oblastjo fašizma. Ta je zelo hitro zato, da se sledi demokratičnega življenja, ne samo na državni ravni, ampak tudi na najnižjih ravnih vse do lokalnih skupnosti. S prepovedjo rabe slovenskega jezika in na razne druge načine pa grobo posegel nacionalni in kulturni razvoj. Ta nekdanja vojašnica, ki je za fašisti gostila še nemško nacistično in na to jugoslovansko komunistično vojsko, je tako priča vsodnega zgodovinskega dogajanja, muzej, ki je danes v njej prepostavljen v spomin in opomin. Res smo ponosni, da lahko danes gostimo tole konferenco. Vsem skupaj želim lep dan. Respected lecturers, dear organizers, dear conference participants who have joined us here in this hall and also those online, welcome on behalf of the team of Park of Military History. Allow me to first thank the main organizer, Study Center for National Reconciliation, who invited us to participate and also decided to organize this remarkable international conference here in Park of Military History in this former Italian barracks. This decision was probably influenced by the good location, good conditions, and I mentioned also kindness of our staff. But the decision is not without meaning and symbolism. Primorska, part of the Slovenian national territory, which was located on the western side of the Rapallo border, already faced fa fascism 100 years ago. It very quickly suppressed all traces of democratic life at all levels, including in local communities. By banning the use of the Slovenian language and in various other ways, it grossly interfered with national and cultural development. These former barracks, which after the fascists also hosted German Nazi, Nazi and then Yugoslav communist army, is thus a witness to a fateful historical period and the museum that is in it today is a me memory and a reminder. We are really proud to host this conference. I wish you all a nice day. Spoštovane kolegice in kolegi, v imenu Študijskega centra za narodno spravo se vam iskreno zahvaljujem za vašo odeležbo na današnji mednarodni konferenciji. Hvala tudi so organizatorjev Parko Vojaške zgodovine Pivka za njihovo ponovno gostoljubje. Novinar po imenu Benito je konec prve svetovne vojne ocenil takole, citiram. V svet trepeta vsi kontinenti so razdeljeni v isti krizi. Ne obstaja niti en sam del planeta, ki bi ne bil pretresen od tega ciklona. V stariji Evropi ljudje izginjajo, sistemi se lomijo in institucije propadajo. Konec citata. Mussolini je dobro ocenil stanje duha, ki ga je prinesla prva svetovna vojna. Pravilno ocenjen politično družbeni položaj pa je botroval njegovemu političnemu usponu, zaradi katerega smo se danes brali tukaj. Na Štujskemu centru za narodno spravo smo se v stoletnici pohodno na Rim odločili, da organiziramo mednarodno konferenco s priznanjem ministra Konjaki. Prav posebno pozdravljam med nami našega slavnega govorca, profesorja Bosoka in seveda vse ostale paneliste. Konferenco smo nekako razdelili na štiri stebre povezane za zgodovino fašizma. Tako bomo danes slišali referate povezane za fašizmom z veliko začetki CF oziroma italijanskemu fašizmu, na to referate povezane za slovensko zgodovino, zgodovino Balkana in Srednje Evrope. Žal nekateri kolegi niso uspeli priti na konferenco osebno, bodo pa prislati z nami preko Zuma. Prepričan sem, da je pred nami čudovit dan, poln dobrih referatov in debat, ter da bomo naš dogodek lahko k malo nagradili v objavljeni obliki znanstvene monografije. Dear colleagues, please receive a warm welcome in the name of the Study Center for National Reconciliation. A certain journalist named Benito wrote by the end of the 
First World War in Il Popolo d'Italia, I quote, the whole earth trembles. All continents are riven by the same crisis. There is not a single part of the planet which is not shaken by the cyclone. In old Europe, men disappear, systems break, institutions collapse, end of quote. Mussolini excellently depicted the post-war period in this quote. His understanding of political and societal vulnerability led to his rise. And 100 years later, we are gathered here today. At our center, we have decided to organize an international conference in this regard, which would include some of leading experts on fascism. I am grateful to our keynote speaker, Professor Bosford, for being here with us, as well as to all of our panelists. The conference papers could be split into four pillars. First one is dedicated to fascism with a capital F. The other three are geographically limited to Slovenia, Balkan and Central Europe. Unfortunately, some panelists could not come in person, but we will likely hear their papers via Zoom. I am convinced that there is a wonderful day ahead of us, full of discussions and excellent papers. I sincerely hope that our event will be shortly upgraded into a published, edited volume. Thank you. So thank you very much to Mr. Janko Bustiancic, the director of the Park of Military History Pilka, and to Dr. Tomasz Ivesic, the director of the Study Center for National Reconciliation, for the welcome speech. Um, I am also delighted to welcome you all at the conference on the centenary of the March on Rome, organized, as we've already said, by Park of Military History and Study Center for National Reconciliation. So the approaching anniversary will remind us of how Benito Mussolini came to power and how the rise of fascism transmuted into a new ideology spreading worldwide, but especially in Europe. In the words of Mark Mazawa, the three rival ideologies, liberal democracy, communism and fascism, saw itself destined to remake society, the continent and the world in a new order for mankind. The incessant struggle between them to define modern Europe lasted most of the 20th century. So what is the current state of research on fascism and what are the promising new perspectives in this regard? We are honored to welcome some of the, um, some of the best scholars in the field to open up horizons and perhaps challenge the persisting understandings or interpretations of the phenomenon. I am really delighted to introduce our keynote speaker today, Professor Richard Bosworth, Professor Emeritus from Oxford University, an eminent scholar on Mussolini and fascist, fascist Italy, who has written extensively on both topics. He held various teaching positions at the University of Sydney, the University of Western Australia, and the University of Reading. He has held various fellowships, including fellowship at the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, at the Australian Academy of the Humanities, research fellowship in the Humanities Research Centre of Australian National University, and is currently a senior research fellow in history at Jesus College, Oxford. His recent books include Whispering City, Rome and its Histories, Italian Venice, A History, Claretta, Mussolini's Last Lover, and most recently, Mussolini and the Eclipse of Italian Fascism, From Dictatorship to Populism. His keynote lecture today is entitled The Centenary of the March in Rome and the Many Falsities of Italian Fascism. Thank you very much for being here with us. It is, of course, a tremendous privilege to be invited here um, and especially to be invited to give a keynote address. I feel that my major claim really to be giving a keynote address is that I'm very, very old and therefore very, very decayed. And so um, if you find things about my address that are particularly annoying, please just forgive it on the grounds, well, the poor old man, what do you expect? Um, I probably am one of the few people here who was actually born when the Second World War was still on. Um, I was born on quite a significant anniversary because my birthday's on the 7th of December, and so I was born on the second anniversary of Pearl Harbor, which has nothing much to do with our topic today. I must say I came from a totally non-military family. My father was a research scientist and therefore spent the Second World War working away on that matter without ever being inducted into the Australian Army. 
and without ever fighting the Italians or anybody else, really. So perhaps that also helps to explain some of the oddities in terms of my interpretation of fascism. I did write a formal paper um, a couple of months ago and sent it on to a Paulina. I believe it's been circulated. And what I propose to do this morning, because I want to finish on time if, with a bit of luck a bit early, is that I will mainly um, uh, speak from the last 14 or 15 pages of the paper and um, leave out the, uh, some of my rude comments about Ruth ben Geert and um, other people in the historiographical section of the paper. But I guess it does seem to me that apart from the curiosity of me being old and having some connection with Pearl Harbor of a strange kind, the real, um, the real uh, point of being here at the moment is that we are just about reaching the centenary of the March on Rome. The March on Rome, which of course has a fake date anyway, doesn't it? Because Mussolini was actually appointed prime minister on the 31st of October and not on the 28th of October. On the 28th, no, 28th of October was actually rather a messy day. But afterwards, um, the regime made the 28th of October the symbolic day of the start of the new um, fascist um, chronology um, and the day of the Rivoluzione, the day of revolution. Um, so where, where we've got a centenary, that was the initial prompt. But um, the secondary prompt is obviously the election of, um, or seemingly the election of uh, a government led by Fratelli d'Italia in Italy at the moment. And the idea that an Italian prime minister Perhaps the oddest thing of all, I suppose, is a woman. What on earth would Mussolini have made of that? Um, but um, a woman who seems herself, when she was in her teenage and so on, to have been one of those many young Italians who admired Mussolini, who celebrated the fascist regime, and although she now says, well, that's consigned to history, one does wonder whether that's actually possible, I suppose. And I think one of the sub-themes for us today um, when we're thinking about Italy, at least, should be to try to wonder why it is that in Italy um, a positive memory of Mussolini's regime remains has remained so pervasive in the country ever since 1945. And there it is, 100 years later, again, around today. Um, I do think we also, to remember the context, and obviously we are in the very place where our conference is meeting, um, the appalling policies pursued by the regime towards Slovenians. And my, the written form of my paper um, starts rapidly with a reference to the comment by Aldo Vidosani, party secretary, briefly during the Second World War, who actually talked blithely about exterminating all Slovenes. Um, the Italian regime in practice wasn't much given to complete genocides, um, but the fact that an Italian could say that from a person, from a position of at least, I don't know that Vidosani really did have much authority, but he was secretary of the fascist party, but, um, that he could say that shows something about the mindset of people who were really rather dumb in Italy um, in 1942, and as a background to our thoughts today uh, here um, at uh, Puka, if that's how you pronounce it. Um, okay, let me then move on to the, um, uh, as I said, leaping over um, a large part of the um, historiographical bit of my paper. I think I'll just start, however, with a very recent book, and that is the book by my friend Paul Corner, which I'm sure must have been published in Italian before the English edition, but the English edition has only very recently come out with Oxford University Press and the title Mussolini in Myth and Memory. Um, it's a scholarly, it's a short, it's only about 150 pages of text, judgment on the regime. And a judgment which I think sums up very many things about um, the regime. If um, uh, uh, colleagues here who um, have a more intimate knowledge of what's been going on in Italy over the last weeks would like to discuss this later, I suppose I'd like to know whether Paul's book has had any effect on Italian opinion and um, both positive, I suppose, in the sense of showing people what it is that he's saying, or negative in the sense of people writing off Paul and wanting to be particularly hostile to him. His subtitle of the book is The First Totalitarian Dictator. That means that there are some differences between his and my understanding of Mussolini's rule 
since I tend to be the in uh, in the literature the person most doubtful about using the word totalitarian too readily to describe what actually happened in fascist Italy. The prime intention of Paul's book is to demolish these positive memories of fascism that I've been talking about already, still held by too many Italians. It is, after all, remarkable that three people from the Mussolini family are active on the far right of Italian politics, two granddaughters, Alessandra, who's after all been notorious or famous or celebrated or something or other for quite a long time, and her, her half-sister, Achele, and the great-grandson coming back from Argentina, I believe, with the really wonderful name of Caio Giulio Cesare Mussolini. I think if uh, I can jump on my granddaughters, I better persuade them to have a child and call, call it, ideally if it's a girl, I suppose, Caio Giulio Cesare something or other. Wow. Um, anyway. Um, obviously, we do live in a world where um, names turn up. And um, again, while I was thinking about this paper in May 19, in, in May of this year, um, the son of um, the Philippine um, President Ferdinand Marcos, Bong Bong, as he's apparently known, Marcos, was duly elected um, President of the Philippines, despite his father's record as a vicious and corrupt tyrant. And that also, I suppose, his mother's record as a vicious and corrupt tyrant. Um, what seemed to matter in a landslide victory was that name brands have a frightening, seductive potential, whether in business or in politics, a matter that we shouldn't forget. So it's appropriate for Corner in his book to emphasise that Mussolini did not, in fact, bring serious economic advance to Italy, was anything other than a clever and successful statesman encouraged rather than eliminated corruption. And his regime was, of course, one where trade unions and a free press were suppressed. Under fascist rule, a secret police had free reign. It mightn't have been terribly numerous, but it did have free reign, and many a pr petty provincial party tyrant could violently attack his foes, maybe murderously attack his foes, um, be they political or familial or personal. In any sensible world, Corner has emphasised and argued irrefutably, the Mussolini name brand should be well beyond its use-by date. As his concluding words put it in the book, those who are still indulgent towards fascism and enthralled by the myth of the Duce should open their eyes and look a little more closely at the realities that lie hidden behind the myth. Their memory may be deceiving them if they look hard and reflect a little they may even discover that much of what they think about Mussolini, much of what they remember about Mussolini, is not really about Mussolini at all. And that does, I think, reflect something of the title of my paper. I agree with Paul, of course. Um, but um, there are some differences. And let me then, in the, um, in, in, in the major segment of my paper, start with foreign policy as a logical starting point. What do we make of Mussolini and foreign policy, fascism and foreign policy? Many are sure that capital F fascism and also small f fascism means war. And Mussolini certainly bore personal responsibility for Italy becoming Germany's ally in an axis that, at least in the case of the Nazi side of it, was determined on global war, global war and genocide. In November 1940, Winston Churchill, for his own purposes, alleged that one man alone had brought Italy to ruin. And since 1945, many commentators have agreed. I guess recently, really, um, my uh, friend from Leeds, John Gooch, in his uh, military history, taking Italy up to the Second World War. Not all Italian historians, however, do. For two generations, a number of them, have instead charted a baffled realism in fascist diplomacy, at least until late in the 1930s. Other countries, they say, especially Britain during the lead up to the fascist invasion of Ethiopia in October 1935, through a muddle blended from their own imperialism and their uneasy readiness to appease Nazi Germany, but not fascist Italy, they argue, eliminated Italian freedom of choice of allies. So should we look more closely then at the nature and purpose of Mussolini's war. Soon after entry, on the 10th of June, 
1940. It was, of course, an ill omen anniversary to choose because it was the um, um, 16th anniversary of the kidnapping and murder of Giacomo Mattiotti that um, Mussolini chose to enter the war. So perhaps he should have done that as he entered the war. The regime compiled a wish list for victory. The nearest it came until 1943 to setting out its war aims. It was, to say the least, immodest in its extent. Let me give you the list. Nice, Savoy, Malta, Corsica, Dalmatia, Tunisia, part of Algeria, Djibouti, Chad, Niger, Sudan, British Somaliland, Kenya, Uganda, Tanganyika, Nigeria, Cyprus, Perun, Socotra, Aden, Kuwait, Bahrain, Transjordania, and Hadramat, while also having control over Egypt. Mm. <laughs> um, the tally was obviously blatantly replete with the delusions of Benito Mussolini and his fascist dictatorship, with its reiterated praise of war and conquest and its Romanità. Even if, of course, I don't think Caesar's legions ever made it to Nigeria. Perhaps, therefore, the 1940 catalogue sums up the aspirations of that Italy which for 80 years or so, in what an annal historian might know as the moyen dure of national history, had been the least of the great powers and of Italy's sacro egoismo, of Italy's egoism in foreign policy. During the First World War, officials in the Ministry of Colonies had nurtured similar grandiose ambitions, if mainly focused uh, more on, indeed once Roman, Asia Minor than on Africa. So the list is interesting, and it's also interesting for me as a historian, after all, who began with my first book being entitled Italy, The Least of the Great Powers, a book that had the not quite finished Victor Emmanuel Monument on its cover, and a book that reflected the fact that in my first research as a historian who was going to become interested in Italy, I had to walk past the Victor Emmanuel Monument every day to go down to the Bibliotheca di Storia Moderna a Contemporanea and think about why the Victor Emmanuel Monument was where it is, next to the Capitol, looking out over the Forum. Not a fascist building, although the fascists did finish it off, but a liberal building, an Italian national building. So what I think about that list, that extraordinary list, is that in copious ways it's both a fascist and an old-fashioned set of ambitions. Imperialist European statesmen in the 19th century might have found it normal enough, if outrageous, for a power of Italy's actual strength. What is less obvious in such ambitions, then, is fascist with a small f ideology. Many travails in interwar Europe had structural bases in the Wilsonian promise of self-determination that is of nation states, with clear democratic and popular boundaries. However, we know that after 1919, as reflected in the quote that Tomasz gave us a few moments ago, each of the new nations of Central and Eastern Europe were nationally incomplete and therefore all but automatically pursued irredentist ambitions to get back people they claimed were their own from over the border and to expel people who they claimed were not their own to somewhere else. They all but automatically then pursued irredentist ambitions of the sort after all common in Italy before 1915. Pre-war pre irredentism had been the major prompt for Italy's aggressive entry into the First World War. And again, there's an important adjective, aggressive entry. Every war which Italy entered after the Risorgimento was always entered aggressively. No one ever attacked Italy. Italy entered wars on its own behalf. And that seems to make Italy an exception to the sort of perhaps rather comfortable theorising that my Australian friend could have been my student, but the silly man did medieval history when he was an undergraduate from the University of Sydney, Chris Clark, 
argued in his multi-celebrated book, um, 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 <coughs> sorry, um, what's the damn book called? It, sleepwalkers. sleepwalkers, thank you, that the, the people sleepwalk into war. Italy's leaders never did. They didn't in 1915 and they didn't in 1940. Um, so there's some contrast perhaps um, with Nazi. After 1933, the Nazis pressed forward rapidly in Austria, in the Sudetenland and Danzig, where perhaps their policy could seem to be Wilsonian for self-determination, as Hitler extended the rule of the Third Reich over German-speaking peoples. Of course, many more lived further to the east in what had been the boundless lands of the Romanov Empire. What might be termed Nazi irredentism may help to explain why the great majority of Germans applauded Nazi policy until the very end, pushing into the background other elements in their regime's ideology, and especially what was most important about it, of course, the pseudoscience-driven determination totally to liquidate Jewish Bolshevism. In the Italian case, irredentism might explain a thrust to Nice or Savoy or Malta or Corsica or even Dalmatia and Tunisia, but not to the rest. Yet, of course, millions of Italians lived outside national borders, not in Europe or in the Mediterranean, but in the New World. Despite pro-immigrant rhetoric, even at its most fantastical, fascist Italy never aimed to bring New York and Buenos Aires, the United States and Argentina, Brazil and other places where families had migrated from the Italy's home to the Patria, home to Italy. Rather, their war aims were determined by old-fashioned European imperial power politics. Typical, therefore, was Mussolini's insistence in June 1941 that fascist troops join the Nazis in their murderous and absolute invasion of the Soviet Union. <coughs> Much fascist rhetoric was expended on the need to purge Marxism from the world. In the Italian dictatorship, such words had been used domestically ever since the squads had emerged to trash socialist and communist meeting places and newspapers in 1920-1921. But when it came to government practice after October 1922, Soviet-Italian relations were studied in their normality, trade, notably, for example, in war material, seemingly oddly, proceeded, although at least according to one eminent diplomat, the Soviet Union never ceased to view Italy as, and I quote, a minor state, easily manageable, never more than of secondary importance, in some, the least of the great powers, or perhaps something less. For Italians, anti-communism remained a key verbal pledge, given military reality also in the... Um, a decision to back Franco and the Spanish Civil War. But that apart, it was for domestic consumption only. So it should be asked, when Mussolini demanded part in Operation Barbarossa, what did he think his forces would do in Soviet lands? The answer is that they would support their ally and therefore insist on equality with it in a Machiavellian, sacro egoismo man manner. It would be okay at the peacemaking. Such association did not stop Mussolini, of course, on a number of occasions, frantically trying to persuade Hitler to seek a compromise peace in the East, a hope that, to a hope that totally failed to understand that the invasion had been driven by Hitler's and Nazism's deepest ideological beliefs. In some, in the East, lay a paradox within the fascist, small left fascist alliance, one Axis partner, was warring for racial and ideological genocide. The other was warring as the least of the great powers. Here, fascist foreign policy carried quite a few ambiguities in its purpose, as well as continuities from its liberal predecessors. Why did the dictatorship imagine itself ruling in Kenya, Uganda and Algeria, therefore taking over the French and British empires in Africa? We know that Hannah Arendt, in one of the first post-war efforts to plumb the meaning of totalitarianism, identified imperialism as the begetter of modern evil. In proof, she cited Cecil Rhodes, certain fame these days in Oxford, um, saying, quote, expansion is everything. These stars, these vast worlds which we can never reach, I would annex the planets if I could. Thereafter, Arendt argued, expansion as a permanent and supreme aim of politics 
became the central political idea of imperialism. It drove old empires and allowed England's best sons to indulge in massacres of subhumans in its empire. But according to Arendt, imperialism's legacy was most unrestrained in Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, where it possessed genuine mass backing. Fascist Italy, to her mind, was not significant enough to deserve a review. But what place, we should ask, did imperialism take in what I always want to call the Italian dictatorship? Here again, a structural moyen dure note is enlightening. When it comes to tracking Italy's entry into world wars, there are evident parallels between the liberal regime 1911-1915 and the fascist one 1935 to 40. In 1911-12, Italy didn't bother to send the fading Turkish Empire a formal declaration of war before aggressively invading its North African territories, which insisted on calling with Romanità Libya on the model of classical Rome. Its conquest was brutal, but scarcely finished when Franz Ferdinand went to Sarajevo. Once the Greater War had begun across Europe in early August 1914, Italy waited more than nine months before declaring, uh, before entering the conflict on the 24th of May 1915. By 1918, its surviving control over Libya was slender, and over the de next decade and a half, much fascist murder was needed finally to control this liberal empire. But then another prelude resounded. In 1935, Italy invaded Ethiopia with massive military superiority, pitiless brutality, poison gas, and stentorian propaganda. Yet despite proclaiming victory in May 1936, its rule was never uncontested. When Italy entered the Second World War, again after a pause of nine months, it con its control over East Africa proved feeble and fleeting, and eventually Libya as well was lost. The aspiration to empire of the Third Rome by the least of the great powers proved farcically inferior to that of the First Rome. 500,000 indigenous men, women and children went to premature deaths in the Italian Empire between 1922 and 1944. About half the death toll of the Italian dictatorship, let us never forget, that the Italian dictatorship did send to their deaths around about a million men, women and children. I should concede when I use the figure 500,000 that colonial governments were still insufficiently modernised to be sure about this figure. I must also admit that some victims fell to black-on-black -black killing, as they're called nowadays, given Italy's employment of Ascari, indigenous troops, from one or other of its territories, often in the harshest fighting. Yes, please. <laughs> if they paid... Sorry. I'm not quite a Pavarotti tenor. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. If they paid much attention to such matters, purist Nazis must have been troubled by one young fascist of eminent family, in fact, for the son of Cesare Maria de Vecchi di Valci's mom, who paralleled such black soldiery to the Aditi met metropolitan Italy's crack brigades. It is also unclear what Hitler really made of Mussolini's easy promise in May 1939 that shortly Italy would be able to draw an army of 500,000 local soldiers from its Ethiopian subjects. There was, of course, no real plan of doing this, but still. After 1945, it took official and patriotic observers decades to admit that the fascist armies had used poison gas on indigenous forces in the empire, or that until it was expelled, the regime continued to indulge in pillage and massacre. Most Italian historians, in fact, have remained Eurocentric in their focus. Perhaps Paul Corner is too, I fear. Still today, there seems little desire deeply to pursue what a British historian has graphically depicted as, and I quote, Italy's national shame in Ethiopia. Forgetfulness was all the easier because Italy's empire vanished more quickly than did those of other European nations. When peace resumed in 1945, Italy became the first to be decolonized. Its loss of empire was resented by much of its pre- and post-fascist political class. Liberal philosopher and historian Benedetto Croce used the heavily freighted word detato, dictat, to express his dismay at what the victors were doing. They were, he lamented, and I quote, devouring a piece of Italy's body. 
the anti-fascist Croce had also been moved in 1935 to send his senator's medal to noisy fascist campaigning, demanding gold for the patria. This purist liberal's equivocal relationship to empire prompts another question. Was the regime's imperialism fascist, capital F fascist, or Italian? I do not have time to provide many details on this matter, but it might be noted that, when state propaganda portrayed empire, it often related stories by visitations of members of the Savoy dynasty. As an Australian, I can understand this, because after all, my country also frequently visited by some damn princeling or other from the British royal family. Perhaps appropriately, the Marcia Reale, the Royal March, not the fascist anthem Giovanezza, plays meaningfully, I suppose, in Augusto Giannina's late fascist film, Benghazi, 1942, trying to have another solution to what actually had happened in Libya. By contrast to the royal family, Mussolini never went to Ethiopia, Eritrea or Somalia. He made two visits to Libya, the first in 1926, just after he'd survived Violet Gibson's assassination attempt, and the second more flamboyant in its rhetoric in 1937, when he waved aloft the sword of Islam to proclaim Italian leadership of the Muslim world against its Anglo-French oppressors. Again, lots of propaganda, but I don't know too much reality. Recently, Roberta Perga has written a fine book reassessing fascist policy in Libya. A study merges that colony with a count of regime action in the Alto Arege Sud Tyrol. In such borderlands, she finds extensive and detailed state settlement policies with parallels, she says, to what Nazi Germany hoped to do in the East and Japan achieved in its acquired territories. In her view, therefore, fascism aimed at new, not old empire. But she admits that the Italians who, following fascist initiative, emigrated to Libya, remain more loyal to their families and their paesi of origin than they did to fascist experimentation ideology. I'm quoting, there was often little meeting of minds between settlers and planners. Settlers employed evasion, subdiffusion, withdrawal to construct their own lives in their own manner, not especially totalitarianized ones, in other words. The newcomers were far poorer than the regime had imagined they would be, they were therefore all the less made by any part of fascism had so far played in their lives. They were not even especially productive. State employers found that local Arab workers had higher productivity than did the immigrants. Um, indigen um, the locals assumed two-thirds of the jobs going. In some, there may have been 1930s fascist plans for new empire, but in practice they were defeated by what Italians were actually like. Study of the attitudes and behaviour of immigrants transferred by the regime to Ethiopia produces a similar story. Settlers tended to crowd into urban centres, notably Addis Ababa, and they find employment and or entertainment as though they were home in Italy. They blamed fascist officialdom for the troubles in their lives and what they deemed was the pervasive corruption, never of course their own, sighing if only Mussolini knew as though the Duce was a distant Ancien Regime monarch. Racial legislation expanded from 1936 and was a major stimulus of the regime's switch to anti-Semitism in 1938. But many Italians, um, when in, in the empire, ignored its ban on sexual and personal relations with indigenous women and men. In any case, policy aims fluctuated, notably when Amadeo Duke of Aosta took over as Viceroy in December 1937, following months of what a historian has called genocide. Aosta, who had been schooled in England, looked like a servant of, of the British Empire and endeavoured better to pacify Ethiopia by winning to the Italian side chiefs in one locality or another in a manner not unknown in other European empires. Shifting policy should not surprise. When in 1935 Italy began the Ethiopian War, no planning for immigration had been drawn up despite the massive number of Italians who'd left their country before 1922 and the regular link in fascist rhetoric between empire and lands that needed filling by dedicated immigrant work. In many senses then, Ethiopians between 1931 and 1941 experienced an Italian dictatorship as much as they did intrusion from a totalitarian regime. Another piece of empire deserves quick notice. 
In April 1939, Italy seized its client state, Albania, across the Adriatic, lands which over the centuries had sent peasants to set up Albanian visit villages in various parts of the Italian south. What policies were pursued there towards a people who could be viewed either as Europeans or as racial inferiors? More research is needed, but what we so far know is that a policy of wheeling and dealing with compliant local chiefs quickly became the reality of Italian occupation. Immigrants were few and unwilling, and no genocide was contemplated to clear space for them. Another irony appears. By 1940, official figures show that 3,852 Italians left for Africa, while 46,968 moved elsewhere in Europe, not of course to Albania, but rather mainly as guest workers to Germany. There, Nazi German employers were sure that Italian immigrants were racial inferiors, um, while somewhere in the functioning of the Axis, Mussolini understood that these Italians abroad were hostages against any Italian ambition, ambition to sunder its friendship with the Nazis. In sum, fascist imperialism was both murderous and filled with contradictions and compromises. As the major, highly critical recent historian of Italian imperialism has included, the country's rule in Africa, while idiosyncratic and doubtless violent and bloody, was ra rather overall neither better nor worse than that of the older powers. If this was totalitarianism, it was Italian style, in the sense that an anal historian could locate much of the histoire of Inimentiel of fascism, or simultaneously point to many strands of older Italian histories from a moyen or a long durée. What, what, so let's switch now to something else. Let's enter an arena where my understanding of fascism is not the same as that of many other historians. I do not have time to express it fully, but let me try to sum up its chief features. I must highlight something obvious, um, an issue that I have hinted at before. The term small f fascism is ubiquitous in our political discourse. Except among a small minority of exaltés, it signifies something very bad. Warmongering, racist, tyrannical, murderous, epitomised in Auschwitz, a place where humankind reached its nadir. Its chief enemies in our world of triumphant neoliberal or liberal democracy are ourselves, those who favour the market, private property, legal process, a free press, cultural debate and individual identity. Fascists, we believe, are nationalists of an extreme and vicious kind. They desire a state that overwhelms business and the individual. Their ideas are universal. They can pop up anywhere. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot today. But we should note that the initial coiners of the theory of universal fascism were Mussolini's Marxist opponents. For them, fascism was universal because everything was international and thus universal. Class always trumped nation. As PG leader Palmiro Togliatti underlined in 1935, fascism, fascism everywhere was the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, most imperialist elements of finance capital. It was therefore always part of the class war fought by the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. Fascism was in no serious sense genuinely anti-liberal. After 1941, Stalin's Soviet Union combined the Russian nationalism of its great patriotic war with an ideological purity by defining its enemies as fascist fascism. It therefore discounted the fact that the Nazi racists were the dominant element among its invaders, and it, it made anti-fascism the cause of what was to be the winning side of the Second World War. The excess became a natural and inevitable combination in many accounts of Italo-German relations or as it was often expressed, Mussolini-Hitler relations. When after 1945, the wartime alliance between market liberal democracy and communism disintegrated into the Cold War, liberal democratic theoreticians of totalitarianism were soon presiding the West that Nazism and communism were the opposite sides of the same coin. Italy was only given a minor place in such theorizing, but the generic word fascism with a small f survived as perhaps it should have done, since, as was noted, as I've already noted, it had been Italy where totalitarianism was first proclaimed, indeed, on the 28th of October 1925. But should we accept that Italian fascism and German Nazism were all but identical? 
Two years after Mussolini used the third anniversary of the March on Rome to define totalitarianism, Mussolini, in an article in Gerarchia, the party journal, stated, quote, in many countries something like fascism is flourishing, while Bolshevism views fascism as its most terrible enemy. Around this time, however, the Duce was inconsistent, sometimes averring that fascism was not for export, but drifting towards accepting um, and adapting the Marxist idea that it was universal. But where might this flourishing occur? Not yet in Nazism, since in 1927, Hitler and his movement were small and disregarded by Mussolini. In fact, when regime commentaries examined and the excessive parallel with Nazism is set aside, even past 1933, an alleged link with Italy can be located in the Spain of Miguel Primo de Rivera, in Kemal Ataturk's Turkey, and in many another authoritarian or reactionary government. Um, after the Democrat election victory in November 1932 in the United States, Italians drew comparison between Mussolini and F.D. Roosevelt. Was, was Roosevelt the stronger dictator, Mussolini asked. Soon impetuous young fascists were also wondering whether Stalin was another duce and the Soviet Union, in spite of itself, was it fascistizing? Let us use this breadth of comparison to measure the dictatorship at the end of Mussolini's first day, decade in office. In that regard, we might take seriously the Duce's interview with the Swiss, uh, German Swiss Jewish journalist Ludwig in spring 1932. Then Ludwig concluded the fascist movement has done great things for Italy. Mussolini was a great statesman. The ideology of fascism, the Duce had told him, contained elements that other countries might adopt, although Italy was unusual in always being a country of outstanding individuals. With Nazism rising in the north, Mussolini took the chance to deride the delirium of race. National pride had no need of it, he said. After his decade in office, he told Ludwig he was inclined to moderation while being sure that systems are illusion and theories are fetters and therefore downplaying ideology in his regime's purpose and achievement. Mussolini was soon to renounce this interview and deny his words. Yet it is true that throughout the first decade in office, Italian fascism had set in place much tyranny but not yet gone to Auschwitz. Mussolini often talked about war, yet um, there are paradoxes there. For example, in a speech for the anniversary of the 27th of October 1930, he pledged fascist Italy arms itself because every state is arming. It will disarm if all disarm. Be fully clear that we arm material and spiritually to defend ourselves and not to attack. Fascist Italy will never be the first to start a war. Even though he then went on to suggest that one can thus see a fascist Europe that is a Europe inspired in its institutions, doctrine and practice by fascism. Um, in the empire, its toll of victims was growing, but for other Europeans, not yet in an untoward manner. As late as May 1934, um, French Marshal uh, Hubert Laiuti still maintained that, quote, fascist methods, methods of occupation, pacification and policy in Libya were the same as that pursued by France in its, in its empire. So there's a story of lots of repression, and again, I'm going to have to leap over some of my, some of my written paper, I fear, in order to meet the deadline. But let us remember that in Italy, in, in Rome, for example, the Romanità, three kings jostled for authority, Mussolini, Victor Emmanuel, and the Pope. We'll hear more about the Vatican side of dealing with fascism later today. But it is odd that the pervasive regime slogan, Mussolini a sempre ragione, Mussolini is always right, but dictatorial freedom from error had to be adapted to papal infallibility. So across the time, but there was someone else who was always right and someone who had much more historical weight on his side than Mussolini did. Um, the, 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 the squads, the MVSN's ambiguous relationship with the National Armed Forces left further space for old ideas and practices to survive. It was not for nothing that when Mussolini fell in July 1943, Marshal Pietro Badoglio, Duke of Addis Ababa, what a title was that, replaced him um, as an ex, of course, uh, head of the chief of the general staff. A fine, what about the bureaucracy? A fine study of the Italian public service has noted how imperfect its fascistization was. Fascist governments, we learn, fostered not so much deep belief as conformism, a failure to criticize when criticism was needed, and petty corruption. Raccomandazioni remained an automatic part of job application and promotion 
and promotion in a working life, the number of bureaucrats spiralled up. Um, the family. Did the regime do anything to alter the nature of the Italian family? Even Mussolini, after all, had a family and acted as though he had a family. Indeed, acted as though he had quite a few families, given his numerous illegitimate children as well, the people who, children in a way that he wanted to find some sort of sistemazione for. So did regionalism. Mussolini was scarcely alone in knowing that Southern Italians were different and inferior from Northern Italians, and that Tuscans always behaved in the way that Tuscans did. He was, after all, a self-conscious Romagnol. Similarly, gender had its own history under the dictatorship. Mussolini and his followers boasted of their steely patriarchalism. Mussolini said that women couldn't reason, but in his last days, when I was writing this study of Claretta Patacci from her diaries, one, one, one finds a rather sweet situation where Claretta, backed up by her mother and younger sister, Miriam, is fighting a war against Raquele Mussolini, a war of women on Mussolini's head as he's um, in a depressed manner confronting the end of the Second World War. Miriam Patacci, when she was still a girl, when she was 18 or 19, wrote to Mussolini and said, listen, mate, listen, dictator Mussolini, um, you may think you're always right, but it's Claretta who's always right. She actually uses the phrase, Claretta ha sempre ragione. I, I don't know that you tried that with the dictator of North Korea and it would get you far nowadays. Um, so it's time to reach the final section of my paper, and I hope I don't go too far over in time. If it flamboyantly celebrated its Decennale in October 1932, the Mussolini dictatorship faced little serious resistance at home and abroad was often approved. Its second decade brought disaster, notably in its humiliating incompetence militarily, politically, economically and socially, as Italy's ignoble second in the Second World War. In fact, it is already, already by 1939, it is probable that many Italians had conditioned their earlier consensus and even Mussolini can be found readily distinguishing between people he called the fascists and the Italian people. What it should be asked, why it should be asked, had the seeming success of 1932 so quickly frayed? Let me try to advance two new ex uh, explanations that perhaps we can argue over today. The first is that after getting around to a detailed definition of capital F fascism in 1932, guided by the severe intellectuality of philosopher Giovanni Gentile, the regime instead went what we would nowadays call populist, the word we are now able to understand in the era of Trump and what used to be of Boris Johnson. As, Morris, as Mussolini phrased it in a speech perhaps appropriately in Naples in October 1931, he was now determined that he would andare decisamente verso il popolo, go decisively towards the people. Such a destination meant that even while tame fascist intellectuals waxed ever more fervent in their claims about the novelty and achievement of revolution, the dictator and his charisma more and more dominated all. In the 1920s, Mussolini had felt it necessary to place himself into a remarkable span of ministerial roles. In 1928-9, he was Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of the Colonies, Minister of the Interior, Minister of War, Minister of the Navy, Minister of the Air Force, and held the new minister, Ministry of Corporations. He lauded it over the meetings of the Cabinet, a survival of liberalism that was curiously mixed with meetings of the Fascist Grand Council, a man meant to be on top of every contemporary issue of government. Yet his actual method of administration had become the interview. The recent availability of his appointment books to researchers showed quite a hard-working dictator who generally was at his desk in, at Palazzo Venezia from about 8.30 or 9 a.m. each morning and did not leave to about 8 p.m. each night, six days a week. To be sure, there was time for siesta, and we know that Claretta's diary in the late 1930s um, shows that there was space left for as many as a dozen phone calls a day from Mussolini to her while they argued about their sex lives. It's not surprising also to find uh, his secretariat ensuring that his last scheduled meeting each day was often with a woman. In this um, parade of interviews, Mussolini saw his police chief, Arturo Bocchini, of course a, a, a bureaucrat, not a party man in terms of origins, almost every day. The Duce somewhat timidly requiring reassurance that anti-fascism was not progressing. Naturally, there were similar considerations of foreign affairs, the economy, 
developments in the party and other fundamental matters. Equally, time was found for, for Professor Mussolini to meet intellectuals, Italian and foreign. This orality of administration must have been tiring and demanding if you have one interview and then another and then another and then another and then another. Um, and so tiring, demanding, and perhaps more important, confusing, whether to Mussolini or to those who'd been graced an interview. Survivors of the regime remembered a crowded anteroom in Palazzo Venezia where party hierarchs squabbled over policy and behaviour while they awaited their interview. The regime may have boasted that it made the trains run on time, but interviews might not. Similarly, more than one memoirist has recalled that Mussolini, anxious to avoid stress, tended to agree with the last person whom he'd seen, leaving his juniors to fight their way to action in contest with others who had the Duce's blessing for aims that contradicted their own. Mussolini's readiness to assure such visitors as Ezra Pound and Rabin Dindrath Tagore or, or, or Stefan Zweig that he was up with their latest publication and fully plumbed their most complex ideas. Um, he, he assured Ezra Pound, for example, that he fully had understood and read from one moment to the next Ezra Pound's Cantos book open on the desk. Peril. Had he? Of course not. Um, no wonder in 1938, then, the Duce could philosophise. I have become a prisoner of myself, of others, of events, of hopes and illusions. Today I must open think, often think what I do not say and say what I do not think. Yes, there's a real gap between the two Mussolinis. Sometimes it is profound and terrible. Perhaps one day one of the two will beg an armistice, break his sword and submit. I still don't know which one. My God, can you get more portentous than that? So too, the interview could promote, prompt doubts, as one young generation fascist remembered of a meeting in 1939. Um, he remembered being disillusioned with fascism and the dictator when he found an ageing man, not quite as old as me, dressed in a blue suit, needing reading glasses to scan a text with a green shaded light illuminating it, and then offered a handshake and not a Roman salute when the young visitor came into his office. No doubt Mussolini's speechifying could still electrify forcibly assembled crowds. That Giorgio Maloney's success demonstrates Christopher Duggan was doubtless right to argue that Mussolini's charisma survived the regime's failures in the Second World War. But when it had come to actual policy making, charisma did not entail clarity, and the accompanying lack of checks and balances did not assist the pursuit of wise policies for Italy. There was one other crucial change in the second decade of the Italian dictatorship. A generation ago, some British historians made a name for themselves by highlighting the Second World War that Britain lost. It was, of course, that contested in culture, economy and style of empire with the United States. Equally, it should be agreed that very soon after 1933, Italian fascism had to cede place in ideological authority and actual strength to German Nazism. Telling was the failure of attempts between 1932 and spring 1935 to launch a fascist international under Italian leadership, a conference at Montreux on 16 and 17 December 1934, which uh, had avoided inviting any Germans, um, ending in evident failure. A few months before, Mussolini had also tried unsuccessfully to ginger liberal democratic states into blocking Nazi ambitions in Austria, made plain by the barbarous murder of Engelbert Dolphus on the 25th of July 1934. From then on, the reality was that small-f fascism meant the Nazi and not the Italian variant, and it's no surprise to see Italy linking with the Nazis in Spain, joining the Axis, and opting for anti-Semitic racism, despite the fact that the country's relatively small and patriotic Jewish population had in great majority been content with fascism. So what a hundred years after the March on Rome should we conclude about the place in history of Benito Mussolini, the fascist party and movement, and the people of Italy during the ventennial between 1922, 1943 or 1945. Mussolini should not be bracketed with Hitler, the true believer in racist ideology of Nazism and the practitioner of global genocide of Jews and communists. Mussolini was a more ordinary dictator and therefore a better guide to past, present and future men. As far as I know, there's never been a female dictator maybe Georgia can try, um, no, surely not, who, who grabbed personal control over their nations. The ideology of capital F fascism was at its most original and purposeful during the first decade of the Duce's rule. 
After 1933, it could not keep up with the competition from Nazism and faded into a mixture, not unknown elsewhere, of assailable charisma and a lying populism. Now the dictatorship did not merely talk of war as it had in the 1920s, but pursued it bloodily in Africa and inexpertly in Europe. The fascist revolution brought 20 years of rule by violent men, but it did not drastically change Italian society or the Italian economy. It was always more of a political than a social or cultural revolution. In the end, it destroyed Italy's post-resorgimento ambitions to be a genuine great power. Its insistent propaganda about reconstituting a Roman Empire for a third Italy proved utterly hollow. After they instituted their republic in 1946, Italians, no longer a great power, could avoid being involved militarily in most global battles. No doubt their new political system was only roughly speaking democratic. It obviously retains some insecurities today, even under the guidance of Europe. Yet Italians have been able to enjoy a global presence in culture, in design, fashion, food, aspects of family life, religion and tourism, what might be called progress. For ordinary people, a major improvement on a search for greatness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for this truly illuminating paper. We will have discussion after the end of the first panel. That is, after all the panelists have finished with their presentations. So I would like to welcome our first speaker on the panel, first panel today. That's Professor Aristotle Kalis, who specializes in modern European history with a focus on interwar fascism in Germany and Italy, as well as propaganda in Nazi Germany. He is an author and editor of several books on fascism and totalitarianism, including Genocide and Fascism, The Eliminationist Drive in Fascist Europe, and Nazi Propaganda and the Second World War. His current research interests include modernist ideas and about urban planning and architecture, contemporary radical right populism and the mainstream, as well as mobilities of ideas. His presentation today is on the banality of fascism, reflections on the circulation and translation of fascism in the periphery. So, please. Uh, again, for last time, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And I have quite a, a, a steep um, role um, ahead of me after, after our uh, broad brush, uh, very informative keynote address. Um, I should say a few things about the title of this. I'm not trying to be provocative. I'm very aware of the fact that any use of the word banality is sometimes may come across as begging for provocation, especially in the broader film of field of 20th century history, um, the notion of banality of anything, um, particularly when it comes to examples of evil, uh, one way or another, is problematic. But I hope I'll be able to explain what I mean by this banality. So, um, as the introduction to me was saying, one of my recent interests is on the um, mobilities of ideas rather than mobilities of people. Now, the, the mobilities idea, the mobilities a trope here is very, very much at the heart of this talk because I talk about the circulation of fascist ideas. Um, the second bit after the circulations is also very important. So not only are we talking about how fascism, into many inverted commas, fascism spread. Uh, we are in post-COVID uh, time, so all these kind of metaphors do kind of conjure up all sorts of images about contagion and so on. So it's not just about the spreading, but it's about sticky ideas. So uh, um, I'm, I'm going to try briefly and explain this. And then the translation, and the translation is probably the more important of those elements. 
in this discussion. And the final keyword is the periphery. Now, when I started designing this paper, I had this grand ambition of talking like a proper charlatan about Yugoslavia as well. Uh, but then I had a look at the, pay, at the program, and I am in the company of experts. So who am I to come here and talk to you about Yugoslav era fascism or fascism in Yugoslavia? So uh, in talking about the fascist peripheries, I'm going to use a safe case study. Uh, and that's the case study of Greece. Now, Greece qualifies as a Balkan country and qualifies as a Southeastern European country. So I suppose I'm not straying too far away from the, from the goal of the conference in that respect. But I will not resist the temptation of bringing in Yugoslavia to the end. Okay, and you will forgive me, quite like a keynote speaker said sometimes, you will forgive me 10 times more if what very broad brush I may offer in relation to Yugoslavia is something that you consider inappropriate or problematic or so on and so forth. Uh, so, let's see whether that works now. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's not exactly how I, 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 I'd organize it, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, it's fine. Actually, can I ask you for one favor? Can you refresh, no, 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 from, from where? Can you refresh the page? Yeah, but it's only from there, that's different computers. Oh, I see, okay. Okay, so, oh, so, so this is the mouse. Yeah, and that's the keyboard for the computers. Uh, oh, there we go, so if you're in, if I do this, there we go, that's better. Um, and I will have, need to have this here as well. So, uh, the, the introduction, I've already given the introduction, but um, I wanted to problematize a little bit that notion of fascist circulation. It's fascist with, as you said, the small f, okay? This is how I, I would use the word today. I'm not going to qualify the small f, but I will refer to Italian fascism when I mean it in that respect. Now, I'm using this illustration not because it maps onto anything with regard to fascism, but in order to highlight this idea that in the 1920s and 1930s, no matter what we historians think about what fascism was or wasn't, there was quite a general perception that something much bigger than an individual country or an individual politician or ideologue was going around and changing the political landscape. Okay, this is a little bit uh, too complicated um, too, too broad, as you can see, it includes the, the, the Soviet Union as part of this. It, it, it's not what I'm after, but I'm, I'm interested in the circulatory, transnational, indeed global reach of this rogue, if you like, new political force um, in that respect. That's from 1938, uh, but that's true. So, something very important happened in Italy, and it happened in hindsight, in 1919, or in 1921, or in 1922, or in 1923, or 25, and so on and so forth. But a number of things that happened in Italy during that time drew the attention of an international audience towards what was happening in Italy, as if that mattered to them, being far away. Which is a very interesting proposition in many ways, because why would, and I'm talking about here, first half of the of the 1920s rather than later on, we take this for granted that people would, would be interested in something like fascism, but actually why would people in other countries be interested in a, in a rogue startup of essentially losers in the early 1920s, okay? Of course, it, it changes from 21, 22, and even when Mussolini is appointed prime minister, why would that be recognized by such a significant initially and growing in number, number of people uh, as something relevant uh, in that respect. Well, the, the mobility's perception, the mobility's perspective on fascism, on, 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 on ideas moving, if you like, um, it's not about what the fascist regime in Italy was doing in that direction. So, Professor Bosworth talked about the CAUR, for example, the, the Montreal Conference uh, in, in 1934. There were all sorts of Italian initiatives 
to subsidize uh, uh, rogue organizations, rogue political parties, including, of course, in Yugoslavia, with devastating uh, uh, consequences. Uh, I'm not talking about this. I'm, I'm not talking about this kind of circulation. And certainly, I, I entirely agree again, uh, Mussolini was quite ambiguous about whether he saw his own fascism as an export product or an or international product. But at the end of the day, it didn't matter that much in the sense that others outside of Italy did not wait for Mussolini to tell them whether fascism was an export product or not. They were already learning, they were already appropriating, and I'm going to come to this because the, the, the default word here is imitating, and I hate that word, and I will explain why. Uh, so something, whatever happened in, the Italy, in, in Italy at the time, proved quite influential, well beyond Italy and in a large number of countries. So that ideas circulate, that information circulates in the early 1920s is no surprise. Um, I put it into quotation marks, we live, we have been living in modern times and increasingly we live in even more and more in the era of banal mobilities. What do I mean by this? Another banality there for you. I mean that mobility is the default. Something that happens in one part of the world, the world very soon will find its way as a piece of information to other parts of the world. That was happening already in the 19th century, uh, not as fast as in the early 20th century, not as fast as in the uh, second half of the 20th century, but more or less, I did a study of the reception of the March on Rome in Greece, so essentially, the, 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 the appointment of Mussolini takes place at the end of uh, um, October. So let's take the 28th, even if it's a problematic date, but uh, as a starting point, 29th, maybe the news hasn't filtered through the newspapers, but by the 30th, you expect that the news has uh, come. Can I grab a bottle of water? Yeah? Is, it, is that OK? Yeah, sorry. I, I have a similar problem. So. Um, I'm not interested in this part of the circulation. Uh, for me, the circulation is about something else. And let's just, just go back here. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, sorry, and it is. In an era where information comes from left, right, and center, and that applies to the 1920s, why does something, as I said, a, a kind of radical startup with, again, not proven roots, no authoritative figure, of course, Mussolini was an authoritative figure, but he didn't have the sort of kudos that, that we, we ascribe to him much later, internationally. Why did this idea stick? And I'm using this term into embedded commerce. So the fact that the idea travels is only the easy part of the equation. Why do some people far away engage with it? And what do they do once they engage? So the idea sticks, but what do they do when they engage? And here's my problem with imitation. Uh, um, when I was a PhD student, I kept reading books about um, is this movement fascist, is this movement fascist, and so on and so forth. And, and I remember, um, I didn't do my PhD in the case of Greece, um, that, uh, but, but, but I was reading something about Greece and it was like, uh, um, there was no such thing as Greek fascism. Greek political leaders imitated Italian fascism. And that kind of upset me in many ways, not because uh, uh, it, it comes from this, but be because I think it's such an easy explanation. To imitate something is flattery. To imitate something means that you have chosen it from amongst a number of potential options to actually make it your own. And when you imitate, you don't just imitate, you actually translate. Hence, my second point about translation. If you read in this uh, a little bit of Latour's uh, act you know, actor net network theory, you're right. I do think that every kind of communication in that respect um, is, a, is an act of translation. So if we're looking for that kind of fascism that was developed programmatically somewhere and stayed like this and the others were imitating it and sometimes not so well, that's not my kind of interpretation because I think that everybody is translating what they perceive to be happening somewhere else. So why did fascism as an idea or as a piece of information stick? And I think this is, 
This is where the banality comes very handy. I am not going to get into definitional issues and I'm not going to get into classificatory issues. And I'm going to make a statement that I'm going to qualify. I consider personally the definitional debates on fascism as closed. Not because they have reached a point of consensus, but because they have run their productive uh, course. They are, they, they, for, for too long, they have become quite repetitive. They have become counterproductive in the sense because I think no matter how important it is to give fascism a, a citizenship amongst the serious isms, and we can debate this or not, um, the essence even of the most sophisticated definitions of fascism point to something that whose ingredients are inherently banal. Nationalism with ultra in it, okay, fine. Uh, demonization of the enemy, tick. Sense of uh, uh, glorification of national unity, tick. Uh, populism, which is a very important and many, many times underrated characteristic of that fascism, um, tick violent action and violent activism in pursuit of a dream of radical change, tick. This, here is the interesting thing about what I call the fascist alchemy, and, and I'm not obviously the first one to say like this. Uh, George Moss uh, said decades ago uh, that fascism was a scavenger, and a populist scavenger, that's what he meant. He was using, he, uh, uh, it was using fascism, of course, not, that doesn't exist, all these ideas. Uh, kind of bringing them up, bringing the most popular ones, putting them all together. I think that fascism is a form of alchemy in the sense that the ingredients are common stones, but somehow the synthesis is quite powerful. And indeed, it's quite unique. And indeed, it's quite sticky, but it's sticky because of the banality of the ideas themselves, of the ingredients of fascism per se. The fact that nationalism was so central to the fascist premise, the fact that the, the notion of national unity, the fact that uh, there was a sense of demonization of the other, all these things made fascism, the radical message of fascism, incredibly sticky in that respect. Um, the, the other thing that I take issue is the notion of fascist peripheries. And I suppose my, the biggest plea of my paper in the end is to Abandon this kind of idea that there is an orthodox or mainstream fascist narrative that goes from Italy, let's say, uh, to, to, to Germany with some kind of important movement, tick Romania, maybe Hungary if you are lucky, and so on and so forth. And then there's the others, the quasi, the, the, the proto, the, 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 the near almost fascist, the not quite fascist, and so on. I don't think we need that because it creates a kind of an imagined geography of the fascist era with all those peripheries one of which, of course, is the periphery of the country that I'm going to talk about, but pretty much Yugoslavia is part of that periphery of fascism, where fascism didn't quite make it, as if it's some kind of failure, tried but failed, because they didn't learn enough or because they didn't pick up the lessons enough and everything. And I don't think that is a useful one. In fact, I would say that not only this periphery is co-produced fascism, but their production of fascism is probably far more creative and interesting for historians of fascism as well as other historians uh, compared to everything else. Um, so um, this is this thing. So I'm going to try and go back just to very briefly walk you through the case of uh, my main case study here. Um, into all Greece. Uh, and again, as I said, I will be making quick reference to Yugoslavia. There are a lot of things to talk about the peculiarities of the Greek context in the 1920s. And his, historians of fascism in Yugoslavia would probably use many of those tropes. Um, Greece, um, I mean, the chronologies of fascism have been uh, generally created with, Germ with Italy and Germany in mind. Um, I don't know why it's not uh, playing, but let's try again. Um, 
when, when we talk about the rich, I remember Samuel Keynes' book on, on, on the history of fascism. Group, fascism in Greece be, be, begins in 1936, as, as if nothing else happened before. Suddenly, in 1936, somebody called Metaxas um, becomes this dictator, and he's not really fascist, according to Payne. You know, he's a kind of little bit wannabe, but he doesn't really make it, and so on and so forth. But Greece had a lot of peculiarities. In fact, quite like Robert Gerwart is saying, you know, 1918 does not mark the end of the war in actually the majority of European countries. <laughs> Uh, in, in Greece, the war just started in 1918, and of course, the war goes uh, uh, devastatingly wrongly, and in 1922, there is a big catastrophe, which creates a kind of rupture in national politics, and as a result of this, there is a period of national, what, what, what Greek historians call national discord, i.e. a division of political loyalties between monarchy and, uh, and republic, between two political figures, and so on and so forth. So as you can imagine, the Italian experience cannot, of course, be mapped in the slightest on the, on the Greek experience uh, in, in many ways. Um, so context does matter in that respect. So very briefly, because I know I've got about six or seven minutes, so you know, this is the thing. Imagine what's happening in Greece at the end of October, beginning of November 1922. The Greek army had just been routed in Asia Minor. Uh, it's a national catastrophe, which will lead to millions of refugees and so on and so forth. The, the news of the march on, on Rome did not even make it to the newspapers. I'm not talking about headlines, I'm talking about columns in the middle. Why? Because people had other things to worry about. Something becomes sticky when people can notice it. When you are inundated by other parts of the reality, of course it doesn't. But fascism does catch the attention of the Greek audience. And here is the other point I wanted to make. Fascism does not travel in a vacuum. And then it arrives in a country like Greece or in a country of Yugoslavia, and people will just were sitting idly, and then suddenly fascism arrives. And they say, aha, there are already contexts, there are already networks. And in Greece, those networks have been very interesting before 1918 or 1922. I don't know whether this is going to work, but now it's not working. Uh, uh, these networks were already interesting in 1922. They were, they were your typical networks, paramilitary networks. There were um, anti-liberal networks, anti-socialist paramilitary networks. You can see here some general information. You have your sort of imitators, into inverted commas, people who, for example, in 1922, a week after Mussolini gains uh, power in Italy, is given power in Italy, create the organization of Greek fascists, okay? So these are the people who are picking up the whole thing. But the really interesting networks that engage with fascism in the process are actually quite different, and they are people who are looking for a third way, trying to overcome the divisions of the past, but also people who are looking to cure the parliamentary system. So here is the dominant understanding reception of fascism in Greece. It's not the radical movement. It's not the revolutionary movement of national renewal. It's actually the political cure to ensure national unity, to defeat the enemies of the country, and to make the system work against the rot of parliamentarism, whether as an alternative completely or as a short-term cure, harsh cure, in order to defend the system in that um, respect. So this is the context in which fascism sticks in Greece and becomes a big part of the debate uh, in the 1930s. Okay, uh, um, and here's the interesting thing. There's a big debate in 1935 in one of the mainstream Greek newspapers called Kathimerini about parliamentarism or democracy. And people go on about, and it's really striking how their understanding of fascism is about regimes rather than movements, because that's what they're looking for. That's what resonates with pre-existing uh, understandings. And in one of the articles it says, no, Greece can become fascist following the tradition of Mussolini, of course, but as a leader, not as a revolutionary movement, squadrista, and so on and so forth. Miguel Primo de Rivera, the first one in 1923 to create a dictatorship that also acknowledged fascism. A number of people, including Ataturk, that, that you mentioned, and Stoyadinovich. 
So here's a reference and a rogue genealogy of fascism in that respect that, of course, leads to Yugoslavia. Because I went over time, I'm not going to get into Yugoslavia, but I was struck that Stanley Payne introduces Yugoslavia in pretty much the same way that he introduces Greece that not very much was happening in the 1920s or early 1930s, and it's 1935 when you have SPOR. And yes, there are a couple of other organizations before, but in the end, SPOR becomes the, the umbrella organization for everything. And the Stoyadinovich idea, I read some, some articles uh, uh, also to, to refresh my memory about the state of uh, bibliography. I mean, the typical trope that I encountered was a so Yadinovich was not really fascist, even if he was doing weird things like, you know, allowing his rallies like Novi Sad in 38 to have fascist salutes and everything. But he was not really proper fascist. He was copying a few things. I say that this is not the way to understand somebody like Metaxas in Greece or all these people who engage with fascism in Greece. And indeed, I would query, but I'm looking forward to hearing what the colleagues who are experts in Yugoslav history have to say, uh, uh, that this kind of, these kinds of translations, active, engaged, critical translations of what people perceived as a fascist experience and a fascist narrative are very much part of the history, not only of fascism, but of the broader anti-liberal, anti-socially political spectrum in Europe at the time. And I have to say, rather than treating peripheries as somehow uh, unsuccessful, failed, or quasi, or not quite cases in the history of fascism, we need to actually understand them as co-producers of the, of the history of international fascism in the 1920s and 1930s, and stop benchmarking them against the experience of a particular country or a particular group of countries that we have exposed factors selected as the normative fascist narrative. I thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for this vivid presentation. I'm sure it will spark a vivid discussion later. Um, now I'm also very delighted to uh, welcome our second speaker on the first panel. That is Professor Lucia Cecchi. She is Professor of Contemporary History at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. She has published monographs and many articles on the relationships between the Catholic Church and politics in Italy and Latin America. She is also the author of The Vatican and Mussolini's Italy, published in 2017. Today, she will talk about Pius XI and fascism in Italy, conciliation and competition. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this conference and for giving me the opportunity to talk about the Catholic Church in Italy. Before, uh, while uh, I was listening to the Bosworth uh, Greek speech, uh, I feel uh, as uh, Achille de Gasperi at the <laughs> Peace Conference in Paris in 1946, uh, when uh, he said, uh, I speak in this conference uh, uh, and I feel that uh, everything except your personal um, courtesy is uh, against uh, uh, Italy, <laughs> not about fascism, uh, uh, in the Ventennio, but uh, about the present moment <laughs> with uh, Fratelli d'Italia, etc. Um, uh, the subject of my presentation is very broad, uh, and um, I decided uh, to focus here on the stages of the approach between Mussolini and the Holy See between 1919-1922, um, because in these stages uh, I'm going to highlight the aspects of realpolitik, but also the ideological aspects. First, I consider the point of view uh, of Mussolini, then uh, I look at the Catholics, uh, finally I conclude with a look at the losers of this stage. It's a, a very short period, but the dynamics of the relation between Catholic Church and fascism in Italy are all already emerging. Uh, the first actor, Mussolini. Uh, I quote, 
um, I quote uh, a sentence um, is uh, in an interview 1939, but he referred to 1919. I sought the pulse of the crowd and understood that amid the general disorientation, my public was there. Um, end of the quotation. This disorientation to which Mussolini referred in these words was that of the setbacks and ambitions, the fears and hopes of the post-war period. Listening to the pulse of the crowd in 1919, Mussolini still did not hear the heartbeat of Catholicism. He came from um, anti-clerical radi radicalism, you know, Mussolini understood that political life had swung to the left, but having slammed the door on the socialists, it seemed to him there were essentially two new forces from which he could seek support for, for his political aspirations, the ex-combatants and the futurists. So, in the manifesto of the Futurist pol political party, Filippo Tommaso Marinetti, uh, proclaimed a form of an intransigent and integral anti-clericalism. Uh, they wanted um, that Italy and Rome should be swept clear of churches, friars, candles, and madonnas uh, in a violent and resolute way. Marriage should be gradually devalued in a favor of free love, and then divorce made easy. Uh, we know that up until that moment, the anti-Catholic line of Mussolini and uh, of the movement of the fasci di combattimento had remained clearly pronounced and uh, as an intransigent as ever in the program of uh, um, June 1919, the expropriation of all properties of the religious congregation and abolition of all bishops' revenues was still present, as in the San Sepulcro program. Um, but the Mussolini philo-Catholic bold face was decided for you know, political reason. It coincided with the shift to the right of fascist movement when uh, Mussolini uh, decided to seek a wider and more socially diversified constituency. So in the second congress of the fasci di combattimento held in Milan from 24, 25 May 1920, Mussolini dismissed Marinetti's demand and uh, an uncompromising aversion to the papacy be propounded. His words clearly indicated his wish to trace uh, a viable political road towards the conquest to power. To this end, what was needed was uh, a pragmatism um, unblinkered political evaluation of uh, the Italian reality. Uh, as for the papacy, said Mussolini, we need to be clear, the Vatican represents some 400 million people scattered all over the world, and uh, an intelligent political approach ought to use this colossal force with a view to its own expansion. The new policy line uh, induced Marinetti to quit the fascist movement a few days after and the end of the Congress. In the following months, uh, fascism began to grow into a mass movement, trousing the organization of the far left with the violence of its fascist action squads and presenting itself to the middle classes, landowners, industrialists as the paladin of uh, Italian uh, civilization and defender of um, bourgeois uh, society from the threat of Bolshevik uh, revolution. 
Uh, the vote phase uh, con, uh, coincided in some respects uh, with that of the Italian nationalist movement in 1912-1930, when men like Luigi Federzoni and Alfredo Rocco had urged that the anti-clericalism um, typical of the nationalism in the early years of the century be um, jetonized and the uh, Catholics be offered a return as active protagonists at the heart of Italian culture and society as a necessary condition for political success. The repudiation of the anti-clerical and anti-Catholic past characterized Mussolini's electoral um, campaign for the general election in May 1921. He was elected and uh, entered the chamber together with uh, 35 other fascist deputies. And um, um, his uh, rev uh, revirement was expressed in his um, debut in parliament, debut in parliament, his intervention in the chambers of deputies on uh, 21 uh, June 1921, on the occasion of the traditional debate in response to the speech of the Crown, Mussolini devoted significant passages uh, of his uh, um, speech to the religious question. The anti-clerical line was now stripped of the political significance that it had effectively assumed. All this now seemed somewhat anachronistic to, fa to the fascist, whom Mussolini described as uh, eminently unprejudiced sp spirits. Mussolini also spelled out uh, some uh, programmatic points uh, that um, um, further clarified uh, his thoughts on the religious question. His uh, um, position um, of, on the relation between Italy and the Vatican uh, um, was explained in these terms. Uh, the, uh, it was necessary to guarantee materially, material aid to the Vatican. Uh, the, he wanted to be the privileged interlocutor of the Holy See on the political level. Uh, and uh, outstrip on this point uh, the Partito Popolare. But there is a point uh, that uh, ex uh, explains the approach, the new approach uh, of Mussolini. The approach is, is, uh, to the Vatican uh, was mediated through the Romanitas, the idea of Rome, and uh, he, he said Mussolini in this speech, I, I affirm here, that the Latin and imperial tradition of Rome is today represented by Catholicism. The, um, it was an idea that of Romanitas that had um, tormented the, the man of the Risorgimento before and after 20 September 1870. But here, the Risorgimento interpretation was presented with the inflection impressed on it by the nationalist. Uh, the connotation uh, of duty to um, humanity was uh, uh, so strong in uh, Mazzini, Mazzinian, Mazzinian uh, I, um, thought uh, uh, is not here. The emphasis was placed instead more pragmatically on the imperialist duty um, of the right to rule. Anyway, the fascist leader placed on the agenda proposals and the prospect that would soon be met with a favorable response by Pius XI. And uh, through the Pope, uh, um, uh, the, the, the support of many Catholics. So in the new um, program, we have not uh, uh, anti-clerical, um, um, aspects uh, um, 
even if uh, in a fascist party uh, there was a strong personalities uh, with uh, an anti-clerical approach, Luigi Farinacci is the most important, and um, the, on this line, um, uh, part of this line uh, was uh, a struggle against the Partito Popolare, uh, the attacks uh, um, the, um, against uh, the Catholic Party were intensified um, uh, because uh, uh, Mussolini wanted to pose uh, himself uh, as uh, the principal uh, interlocutor to the Holy See for the resolu resolution of Roman question. The ground in power and influence that fascism was assuming in the country was hindered by the most important Catholic politician at the time, the Sicilian priest and the founder of the Partito Popolare, Luigi Sturzo. Uh, popul popularismo and fascism, Sturzo and Mussolini, found themselves active on the same constituency and on, on behalf of the same social classes. The one to give the petty and middle rural bourgeois the right to civil and democratic citizenship within, within the state. The other to use the same forces against the peasant leagues and restablish order in rural classes. But uh, w uh, what is uh, interesting is the position of the main uh, journals, main, the Catholic journals, um, the, the closest journals uh, to Holy See. Um, in the summer 1922, uh, Civiltà Cattolica uh, accused uh, uh, more and more fascism and its uh, uh, leader of violence, uh, armed squads, uh, punitive actions, uh, campaign of intimidation. Uh, the conclusion for the Jesuit review in August 1922 was clear. Catholics could neither approve nor support fascism because it was opposed at least as much as socialism to the most elementary principle of Christianity. In spite of the many professions it, it had made in favor of the church to anesthetize con, um, the minds. Fascism was uh, incompatible with the spirit of Catholicism and would be fatally in collision with it. So in August 1922. In the same year, uh, the Catholic Church had uh, a new pope, Achille Ratti, was elected, was elected uh, in February 1922. Uh, he was um, 65, 65 years old and um, the, the first uh, uh, choose uh, the, the, the name, the name Pius, uh, the, 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 the appointment as head of the Holy Office uh, of a Raphael Mary del Val, one of the key men of the anti-modernist crackdown, um, um, demonstrated that Pius XI wanted to be in continuity with Pius X, with his prede pre prede um, predecessors. Uh, but even more than the previous popes, Pius XI was faced by having to come into terms with a period marked by the dramatic centrality of international political developments. Four dictators, Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, Franco, who threatened, at least, at least four, who threatened the European balance uh, of power, the financial crash in 1929, a colonial war, uh, the serious clash between church and government in Mexico. 
a civil war in Spain, Russia laws in Germany and Italy, and preparation of, of the Second World War. The first measure taken by Pius XI were in continuity with uh, the line uh, of um, uh, Dalla Chiesa, and he confirmed Gasparri as a Secretary of State. Uh, but uh, um, the diplomatic activity of the Holy See uh, was posed in a, a hierocratic horizon uh, through the um, team of uh, the social reign of Christ uh, at the center of the encyclical Quas Primas, and what this perspective was uh, linked to the theme of the kingship of, kingship of Christ. Um, to the feast of the Christ uh, the King, uh, the Pope assigned a supreme role, um, and uh, because it meant uh, the supreme role of the Church as a, a global alternative to the modern civilization. And the, the feast uh, was uh, uh, sponsored a lot in Italy by Father Agostino Gemelli. Um, he was uh, the main animator. He, he, he had been the a great animator of this uh, feast also in the during the First uh, World War. Uh, the, the Catholic uh, University in Milan, which he had founded in 1921, uh, at the name of the sacred, uh, as the name of the sacred heart. Um, uh, th this is uh, uh, this was the situation before the march on Roma. Uh, with the march on Rome, uh, um, there um, there uh, wasn't a uh, um, clear enunciation uh, by the Holy See. The Pope. Uh, wrote l'Osservatore Romano in 30, 31 October 1922, intended to remain above any political contest, thought without renouncing his guiding role that presides spiritually over the destinies of all Catholic nations, so neutrality. The day after the March of Rome, the Jesuit father Enrico Rosa was accosted by a group of black shirts in the Piazza del Popolo in Rome, and to the sound of obscene songs and uh, anticlerical jeers, invited to make the fascist salute to their penance. But a few days after the formation of the new government, Cardinal Gasparri, the Secretary of State, in an interview given to a French journalist, called fascism as a necessity for Italy. The country, said, was threatened with anarchy, and King Victor Emmanuel III had done well to entrust the post of Prime Minister to Mussolini rather than order the troops to open fire on black shirt. The cardinal concluded, let's give him a few months before making a judgment of the coup d'etat. In the Curia, the credit would, be, would seem to have been speedily repaid in his first speech as a premier the head of the government promised a particular respect for Catholicism and the Church. And uh, he ended his speech by invoking God's blessing on himself and on Italy. Mussolini's respect for the Vatican in this phase did not amount to a systematic policy, but was rather expressed in a series of provisions. Uh, the government uh, display um, the, the, the mandatory of the crucifix in school classroom uh, and uh, successively in all public, public offices. 
provision were made in, in the, for in the introduction uh, in the civil calendar of various uh, religious holidays. Uh, uh, the government also intervened to keep afloat the Banco di Roma, which had a central role in the control and direction of the main Catholic banks. Uh, the, the Grand Council of Fascism declared that fascism was incompatible with the one of the historic enemies of the Church, Freemasonry. Other provisions went in the direction of protection of morality um, to um, curb pornography and alcoholism. Um, so we, we, we go speedily in a, a positive uh, embrace, uh, positive um, relation. Um, uh, I cannot speak here, you know, <laughs> the gen gentile reform of the school. Uh, 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 the position of uh, um, journals uh, as an osservatore romano Civiltà cattolica, vita, vita e pensiero, the, the Gemelli's Review became more and more uh, uh, positive. So uh, we arrive on uh, 5 July 1923 when uh, Cardinal Gaspari entrusted a letter for Don Sturzo uh, when uh, he said to interpret uh, the Pope thoughts and uh, asked uh, Don Sturzo to uh, uh, resign uh, his um, uh, role for secretary of the Partito Popolare. Uh, Sturzo resigned as political secretary of the Partito Popolare five days later, 10 July. And uh, in the main times, the first secret contacts uh, took place between the government and the Holy See on Roman uh, question. Uh, some historians uh, say, um, uh, um, <laughs> say that uh, in this moment, in this summer, the situation in Italy was fluid, but it uh, wasn't so fluid. The Holy See uh, knew uh, that fascist violence was spreading in the country with uh, beatings, abuse, and uh, even murders uh, of citizens. Um, uh, also, Catholic, uh, uh, um, ca uh, Catholic uh, uh, clubs were, were uh, attacked. Uh, 23 August 1923, uh, uh, the parish priest of Argenta, Don, Don um, Giovanni Minzoni, uh, was casually to it. And uh, the, in short, the situation wasn't so fluid, but uh, the Pope and his closest advisors seem to believe that Mussolini and fascism still deserved trust in view of all they had done to the benefit of the Church and all that they still promised to do to solve the Roman question. But uh, uh, it wasn't only a tactical complicity, but more intimate and substantial. Between Catholicism and fascism, there were essential consonances. The cult of the authority, the corrosive criticism of liberal democratic thought, the need for order and discipline, the mistrust of any form of free discussion represented the mainstays of rapport of a mutual complicity reinforced by the perception of the existence of common enemies such as Freemasonry, liberalism, and communism. At the same time, uh, we cannot forget another aspect that will uh, um, show uh, its consequence in the future. Catholics during uh, the Ventennio had a monolithic and authoritarian view of Christianity. It um, was a system um, switched to um, an embrace with fascism for its mon 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 monolithism. 
for both shared and authoritarian, anti-liberal, etc. route. But it was also a system that precisely by virtue of its all-inclusive character could not but be with the totalitarian claims of the state that Mussolini was about to construct. But the consequence of all this uh, <laughs> will be clear in the, the next years. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for this speech and insightful paper, Lucia. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our third speaker on the first panel, uh, Tamara Grisa Pechar from the Study Center from, for National Reconciliation, who is one of the leading historians on the history of the Habsburg Empire during the First World War and the Catholic Church in Slovenia during the Second World War and its aftermath. Her recent research has been on the historical and legal aspects of human rights violations in the territory of the 20th century Slovenia. She has written many groundbreaking articles and monographs on these topics. You're very welcome. The 20th century was shaped, especially in Europe, by three totalitarianism, fascism, national socialism, and communism. And all three have the same roots. The editor of the Oxford Handbook of Fascism, our colleague, Mr. Bosworth, called this period in, in, in the introduction in the Oxford Handbook of Fascism, uh, the Age of Fears. Stéphane Courtois wrote in the Black Book of Communism number no. two, the heavy legacy of an ideology, that the interpretation of history that dominated the period up to the 1990s was strongly influenced by communist historiography, which character characterized the 20th century primarily as a period of struggle between advanced socialism and reactionary, reactionary capitalism. In 1991, however, became clear that the main clash, I'm citing, uh, this is a city, uh, uh, this is what, uh, what he wrote, the main clash, and this was particularly true in Europe, was between totalitarian structures and governments imbued with revolutionary passions and ideological radicalism on the one hand, and democratic structures and governments that tolerated diversity of opinion on the other. Uh, I would agree with the professor of political sciences, Anton Pelinka. His book has just been published a month ago, that few terms provoke as much passion in the 20th century as fascism. And fascism and anti-fascism are alike in the arbitrariness in which these terms are used and abused in everyday life. The term totalitarianism was first used in 19, May 1923 by Italian liberal member of parliament and journalist Giovanni Amendola, who in an article entitled Maggioranza e Minoranza, Majority and Minority in Il Mondo, characterized uh, Mussolini's system in Italy as Sistema Totalitario, which strives for absolute and uncontrolled power. Mussolini took up these terms and used it in a positive sense since the early 1930s. The term totalitarianism has also been applied to the Soviet regime and since the mid-1930s to the National Socialist regime. The starting point of the right totalitarianism is the state, nation, or fascism, race, national socialism, and class of course, communism. The research topic of fascism as political ideolo ideology, as well as the relationship of various fascist movements and regimes have divided historians ever since. As at least since the Second World War, there was a broad debate about the meaning 
Some use it only for the regimes in Italy, Portugal, and Spain, Austria, others for all right-wing totalitarian states, including the National Socialism in Germany. This interest, interest naturally led to a number of comparative studies. In any case, fascism and National Socialism have socialist roots. Uh, that's why the uh, communist did not like to use the term national socialism. They, called, they talked about Nazis, but not uh, about uh, national socialism. And Slovenia is the only country in the European Union to have experienced all three totalitarian regimes. I just, uh, in the paper, I will explain that more because there is no time now, but that is the current criteria that I used uh, for my paper. The first Slovenes that came under fascist rule were those who lived in Venezia, Giulia, uh, or Julian March, as it is called also in, in English. Even before Mussolini took power in Italy, and before the Treaty of Rapallo was signed in November 1920, the Slovenes in Venezia, Giulia, as a consequence of the Secret Treaty of London, were exposed to fascism, the so-called frontier fascism, fascismo di frontiere, on the eastern border had consolidated its ranks against Slovenes and Croats. The symbol of this extreme nationalism, which was evident every, everywhere in Venezia, Giulia, was certainly the burning of the national house Narodni Dom in Trieste, the seat of various Slovene organizations. This was in July 1920. This was the beginning of the policy against allogeny foreigners, the deportation of Slovene officials, teachers, and employers began, and about 100,000 Slovenes had to leave their homes. Most of them went to Yugoslavia, about 20,000 to South America. Because of Gentili's educational reform, Slovene language disappeared from school curricula, place names, surnames, and personal names were systematically Italianized. By the end of 1927, all Slovene associations were dissolved. Most Slovene savings and loan banks were liquidated and Slovene economic institutions disappeared one by one. The policy of extermination, according to, um, according to the rep uh, report of Slovene Italian Historical and Cultural Commission, decimated the Slovene population in Trieste and Gorizia the intellectuals and the middle class representatives were scattered and the rural population turned into a working class. The fact that the population persisted on Slovene soil, that children still learned their mother tongue, that is, that the Slovene language was preserved, is mainly due to the Slovene priests who taught the language to the children and disseminated the Slovene press, even though they were constantly target of police interventions. The first Slovenes who came under Nazi regime were those in Austrian Carinthia uh, after the Anschluss of Austria to the Third Reich in March 1938. Also after the First World War, the cultural life of the Slovenes could develop rather well. Catholic Austria under Kurt von Schuschnigg did not stop the German national circles uh, that were organized especially in Kärntner Heimatdienst, whose goal was to Germanize Southern Carinthia. After the Anschluss, the Germanization tendencies became considerably stronger. Directly after that, the pursuit of Slovenes in the first place priests began. 
in Austria, as in the Venezia Giulia, priests were considered as proponents of Slovene national identity and guardians of Slovene language and culture, and therefore an obstacle to national socialist ideas. In 1939, Bishop Andreas Rora had took over the diocese, also he was not a Nazi sympathizer, and Slovene trees, priests trusted him more than his predecessor. He passed a very problematic decree, valid also in Upper Carniola after the German invasion in Yugoslavia. He prohibited Slovene language in church services. Roraha, who sent quite a few reports about the situation in Carinthia to Vatican, did this to keep Slovene priests in their home parishes and to protect them. But immediately after the invasion in Yugoslavia, Gestapo arrested most of the Slovene priests in Carinthia, not only those who worked in the bilingual territory. As a result of negotiations between Bishop's office and Gestapo, most of them were released by end of April 1941, but were not allowed to stay in their parishes, unlike those who were not arrested. 60 Slovene priests who were arrested were transported to concentration camps, Stachau, Mauthausen, Sachsenhausen, Orian, Oranienburg. Seven of them died in concentration camps or afterwards due to mistreatment in German prisons or concentration camps. Uh, however, most Slovenes came into direct contact with fascist and Nazis, Nazi regime only after April 1941, when Drava Banovina was occupied, you see here the map, and divided by Germany, Italy, and Hungary. Uh, German territory, occupied territory is, is in brown. Uh, green is uh, Italian, dark green, the territory after the First World War, uh, and uh, uh, up there also in blue, Hungarian. The three occupying forces had a common goal, the extermination of Slovene people as ethnic uh, entity. Compared to the Germans, the Italian occupying power proved to be, at least at the beginning, somewhat better. The Italians in the so-called so Provincia di Ljubljana behaved quite differently from how they behaved after the end of the uh, First World War in Venezia, Giulia. Uh, however, the measures taken by the German occupiers against Slovenes can be compared with the measures taken by the Italians in Venezia, Giulia. In Italian, in German occupation, occupation zone, the Slovenes were not allowed to be politically active. But in Italian zone, Slovene cultural institutions continued to exist. The newspapers were st strictly censored, but they were still published in They were still published in uh, Slovene language, but Italian was uh, introduced, of course, and the Catholic Church was able to function rather undisturbed. Here uh, we have to say that uh, the Bishop of Maribor was not able to help his clergy. The only one who could do something was the Bishop of Ljubljana because the Italians had a, a different uh, view of uh, Catholic Church, and uh, already in May, in May 1941, uh, he, uh, Roj Rojman, Bishop Rojman, asked the Vatican to request that the Italian government intervenes uh, with the German government on behalf of the arrested Slovene clergy in, in the German-occupied dioceses of Ljubljana and Levant. And uh, his, his colleague Tom, Tomasic asked him to do so, but finally, of course, uh, the Italian ambassador 
had to inform the Vatican that uh, the intervention in Berlin had not been successful. And the Bishop of Ljubljana intervened for numerous people, some thousand, uh, more than uh, uh, 1,500 names are known until now of people for whom the bishop personally intervened and uh, also for several groups uh, of people. Uh, I already mentioned the priests, children, Jews, clergymen, um, people who were arrested, uh, prisoners of war, Yugoslav of officers, hostages, people condemned under death sentences, internees in Italian uh, concentration camps, and so on. Uh, we don't know exact number, but there were several thousand. In the beginning, Bishop was quite uh, successful, but then the Italians found out that uh, he also intervened for, for communists, and that was then the end of the story. I will write more about that in the paper, of course. Uh, the Nazis in Slovenia systematically suppressed the cl uh, Catholic clergy and even encouraged people to leave the church because Slovene Catholic church clergy was considered as a hindrance to their Germanization plans. That was disclosed already in the report of Reichssicherheitshauptamt written prior to Germans' attack on Yugoslavia. The National Socialists were hostile to everything religious and ecclesiastical. From the ter territories occupied by Germans, nine, more than 90% of priests were expelled uh, to Croatia or arrested and sent to various concentration camps. Church properties were confiscated for the benefit of Reichskommissar für die Festigung des Deutschen Volkstums. Reich Commissioner for reinforcing the German Ode. After the German occupation of a larger part of the Drava Bonovina uh, 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 in April 41, Germans like the Italians in Venezia Giulia began to persecute the Slovenes. Like Italians, their Nazis also excluded Slovene language from schools and offices, Germanized all Slovene place and road names, as well as all Slovene public signs, confiscated and partially destroyed libraries, systematically destroyed the Slovene economic uh, base and banned all Slovene political and cultural institutions. All this in accordance with uh, Hitler's order to lower Germ uh, to uh, who is that? Hitler, of course, came to Maribor. Unlike Mussolini, did not come to Ljubljana. Just compare. But I have someone. <laughs> yeah, uh, according to uh, Hitler's order, make this land German again. Um, machen Sie mir dieses Land wieder Deutsch. The Nazi plan is very clearly illustrated by the protocol of the meeting in Graz in April 1941. The nationally conscious Slovenes in Lower Syria, Slovenes in Carniola, and the Windischers will be treated as enemies of the state. In Lower Styria, all nationally conscious Slovenes will be expelled. In Carniola, only those who are known to be particularly hostile to the Germans. Among the deported will be mainly teachers, priests, officials, civil servants, freelance professions, and the semi-educated middle class. Their property will be confiscated. Likewise, as I already said, church property. Uh, Germans were in Slovenia keen to resettle and assimilate as quickly as possible. They wanted to achieve this by mass deportation of Slovenes to to uh, Croatia and Serbia, but also to Germany, forced labor, of course. 
and at the same time with the mass settlement of Germans in order to Germanize the country. In April 41, German military authorities began to um, imprison nationally conscious Slovenes. Nazis planned to deport between 220,000 and 260,000 Slovenes. However, actually they deported about 80,000 persons, including those 17,000 who escaped deport, uh, deportation by fleeing to the Italian occupied territory. And they were able to stay that there in, in, uh, in uh, Ljubljana province because also uh, Bishop Ro Rojman intervened for them. Besides, of course, 917 Slovenes in Carinthia had to leave their homes. Most of them were deported in April 42 to Altrai, also to Germany. Hitler and Mussolini agreed on resettlement of Gorchers to Lower Styria. So between November 41 and Feb February 42, the Gorchers were settled on the southern edge of Styria region around uh, Gurkfeld, also Brigitte Kirschko, from where the Germans deported the Slovenes to Serbia and Croatia. Uh, Many, uh, about many of them uh, left for Germany. The Italians showed, especially in the later phase, the brutal phase of nationalist ideology. Uh, Italian fascism was responsible for numerous obvious violations of human rights. In the longer term, the Italians also had goals similar to those of the Germans. This included the suppression of the Slovene nationality. Italians and Germans imprisoned people, sent them to concentration camps. Italians, more than 25,000 Slovenes and Croatians to seven concentration camps. Nazis, about 15,000 to, uh, uh, to concentration camps. And of course, uh, 597 mentally deficient persons were euthanized in Austrian hard time. And uh, after the German occupation of Brekmurje, uh, also Jews ended in gas chambers. Both occupiers shot hostages. Nevertheless, the approach and living conditions of the occupied zones differed significantly from each other. Undoubtedly, the Italians acted less radically and insofar also more cunningly than the National Socialist. All three occupying powers wanted to annex their zones to their ter territories quickly as possible. The Italians adopted a statue of autonomy for their occupied territories on 3rd of May 1941, while the Hungarians completed the former union on 16 December 1941. The annexation of the German occupied territories to the German Reich was supposed to take place on 1st of October 1941, but it was initially postponed because the new Gauleiter of Carinthia was to be, Reina was there, was to be installed. And finally, it was abandoned because of the ongoing partisan fighting. Formerly, only the Mistal Valley and the four German-occupied communities in the Upper Moor area were annexed. Also, the occupied territories were never formally incorporated into the German Reich. The German legislation gradually came in so that from spring 1942, the Nuremberg race laws and the military obligation were also applied there which is, of course, against international law. There was also racial evaluation. The Germans issued a, a regulation of the acquisition of citizenship. Germany citizenship was granted to former Yugoslav nationals of German nationality who were resident in the occupied territory on April, for, for the 14th of April, 1941. A second category was were German, uh, were those who got German citizenship on a recall. 
uh, and uh, uh, this group was very vaguely defined. The authority could make the interpretation of the congeneric blood quite arbitrarily. Citizens capable of work had to attend work service up Arbeitsdiensten serve in the army, which was a violation of international law. All the others were considered as protected persons, um, uh, Schutzangehörige des Deutschen Reichs. They lost their st status when they left the so-called German territory. But uh, the history of Second World War in Slovenia can only be understood if several levels of developments are taken into account. In addition to occupation and resistance to occupation, there is also a level of communist revolution and anti-communist resistance led by mainly by representatives of pre-war legal parties. So parallel to the war of foreign powers against Yugoslavia, and thus also against Slovene people, a civil war of Slovenes against Slovenes broke out. Appropriation of monopoly or the exclusive rights of the Liberation Front, which is an umbrella organization that the communists uh, uh, organized after Germany, uh, invaded the Soviet Union, um, the, or the exclusive rights of the Liberation Front to resistance poisoned the atmosphere among Slovenes at the time when it would have been necessary to uni unite and force against the occupiers. And I may add that this uh, is still present in, in our days in Slovenia. And at the end, uh, I would like to show you uh, the list of victims. This is based on on uh, the number total number of ninety seven thousand nine hundred and seventy four. Uh, until now, the number uh, is somewhat uh, higher. We are now at 100,015, but, but it's, uh, uh, we, uh, we still don't, know, don't, don't have a paper that, that uh, tell us uh, in which category to, to, to give the, 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 the higher numbers. So yeah. I present you this. Uh, the numbers change somewhat, but uh, still. Uh, the German occupiers caused most of the victims, over 31 percent. I'm, I'm going to finish. The revolutionary side, over 24,000 and the Italian occupiers over 6,000. Uh, in the paper, I will write some more about that. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentations and for the keynote speech at the beginning. Now we do have some time for the discussion. So. Because we're already, already 15 think, minutes late, so yeah. I think. But I think we have we can have a short discussion still. I think. Would you agree, everybody? Or would you prefer coffee break, perhaps? Or coffee and questions. Coffee and questions. <laughs> that would be the best, I guess. Okay. But okay, let's let's have a short discussion at least. Um, I suggest that you ask questions from where you sit, and then the speakers will come forward and answer. Anyone? Too tired? Well, I don't... May, may I ask Aristotle a question? Because I really enjoyed his, his uh, paper wherever he is back there. Um, but and I like the idea of stickiness. It's a wonderful concept of how ideas move around in a confused manner. 
But I was wondering how much one would also like to think of two other sticky ideas in the period that we're talking about. One was the sticky idea of a dictator, because Mussolini, after all, was the first dictator in Europe. And there'd been a discourse on dictatorship before 1922, and it had two aspects. One was that if you talked about by classicists, by people who were still impressed with classical Rome, it had a positive image still, because dictators were people who came sorted out a crisis and then went, went back home to their farms. And then it had a negative context of crazed inferior people in Latin America who were forever um, handing over their states to corrupt and vicious dictators. So how, when, when um, um, Alfonso XIII called uh, Miguel Primo de Rivera my Mussolini, he didn't say my fascist, he said my Mussolini, my great man, my dictator, I suppose. And the second sticky idea that I wonder about, and I think this is one that really ought to worry us at the moment, is the sticky idea that parliamentary systems are corrupt, incompetent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me that all over the place at the moment, Italy is a prime example, that there have been so many attempts at one political movement or other running the country and running it efficiently, but at the same time, everyone knows that it hasn't done, it hasn't succeeded, it hasn't worked. And so there's a threat of finding something other than a parliamentary system for the Wilsonian formula, the, the cosy, soft, weak Wilsonian formula of mixing new nationalism, self-determination with parliamentarism and with, with a liberal market and so on, all those other aspects of American life. So what do you think about the stickiness of dictatorship of, of anti-parliamentarism? I'm sorry, I, I still have the problem because I think it's really kind of intuitive to be talking to you know, so uh, as yeah. so a front to, 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 to the back. Um, I would say that, I mean, obviously, I couldn't get into a lot of detail with you know, this, but a lot of people saw something that they may or may not have termed fascism or fascist. And sometimes the word is not used quite deliberately, or it's not used for a number of other reasons. They saw quite different things. And, and I use the example of Greece to say that, for example, in 21 22, they were impressed by the, the newspapers calling about uh, the the activist spirit of renewal of the fascist calling for a similar spirit for Greece at a time of a national catastrophe, so that's 1921. Uh, but increasingly, from 1924-25, the movement faced its fears, and it is the stickiness of dictatorship that is really taken uh, off. And, 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 and this, I mean, this association, which I know, obviously, I didn't make very clear because I couldn't go into so much detail, this association of Mussolini with dictatorship. And in the background, some people use the word explicitly, fascism equals dictatorship, some people don't, but again, you know, there's there's a big discussion, and I believe Yugoslav scholars have the same idea, because of course of a very touchy relationship with Italy, which also applies to Greece. You know, you can't really say something easily using the word fascism, but it is there. It is very much the, the key understanding, the key reception, stickiness, as you put it, of uh, fascism, linguistically or conceptually, if that respect, had to do with the technique of rule. Uh, as a problem solver, as a cure, or as a much better alternative to the parliamentary system. Now, the, the stickiness of the crisis of the parliamentary system is something that predates fascism, of course, and a lot of those networks that I mentioned had already been talking at the end of 1917-1918 about something rotten in the parliamentary system. Uh, and in Greece that percolates through the 1920s because you have this unworkable political system whereby the political class is divided not according to left and right, but between supporters of the prime minister versus opponents of the prime minister who cannot talk to, to, to each other. So the external perspective is that system doesn't work, it's rotten, it's corrupt, and so on and so forth. And on that network, if you like, comes the, the added attraction of an alternative political system, which in that case is the dictatorship that is going to solve all these problems. So I suppose my point was that there are networks already in operation. Some are anti-communist, 
some are anti-liberal, anti-parliamentarian, some of them are paramilitary, some of them are revolutionary in the ultra-national sense of the word. And for very interesting reasons, different the people within those networks see something in fascism, as they see it in Italy and later in other countries, that appeals to them. And in doing so, they, in my opinion, they translate what they see into something that they own. And the Primo de Rivera is very, very popular in Greece. The, the Miguel Primo de Rivera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as somebody who purged, as one calls it, purged fascism of the rowdiness of the squads yeah. and made it into a viable political notion. Yeah. Thank you so much. Would anybody else like to ask a quick question? We had a question or a comment. Um, many years ago, I remember reading a book by a Polish historian, um, Jerzy Borysia, and he, he wrote that uh, fascism and this network of the stickiness of these ideas were so much popular because they were coming from Italy and not from some other country. The provenance. Um, exactly. So because it's, it was in Italy. I mean, it was coming from Italy. So and as not, opposed to as opposed to Germany. I mean, uh, or, no, it's just or, uh, or no, not the point. Just okay. somewhere else. But so I was curious about. Interesting. Uh, very interesting point. And thank you for this question because it allows me to say something else. Uh, so on the one hand, obviously, and I will stick with my case study. Uh, Things that are coming from Germany, for example, in the 1930s, are considered to have more of an authority because of the power of Germany, because of the image of Germany, because of the historical connections of Greek conservative aristocracy, including Metaxas himself, with the German stuff. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, yes. And one would say that in many countries, the, recept the perception, stroke perception in Italy is quite similar. So it's a kind of... I don't know, culturally a cradle, or, or in many ways, maybe not so much politically. But in a country like Greece, an innovation coming from Italy does not recommend it. Mm -hmm. uh, the relationship was quite broad, quite like in Yugoslavia, for different reasons. Um, the the, the Dodecanese question had been there since the 1910s. And of course, Mussolini does not recommend himself because in 1923, he authorizes the bombing of Corfu, mm -hmm. which brings this up. So quite like, again, in the case of Yugoslavia, when you know, somehow you, the word fascism is being used as a, as a swear word in many ways, you know, thinking collusion with the enemy. Uh, the discourse in Greece in the 1930s is, although it is Italian, mm -hmm. or it started from Italy, and different to Greece, mm -hmm. and can never be adopted by Greece, aspects of it are very useful. So I don't think Italy recommends it in the case of Greece. I would see how Germany applies in mm -hmm. that respect, uh, but certainly draws attention to a major, a major country uh, has experienced something like this. So the, the common Mediterranean heritage plays no role in this? I think it's overwritten by, uh, well, the Greeks are weird in that respect. Uh, and, and I can say that because I'm Greek, so don't really <laughs> accuse me of stereotyping. Uh, um, um, it doesn't work that much. So I can see how it works on the sort of Mediterranean Latin oh, oh. connection, but there is a very strong trope of Greek specificity. Greek uniqueness and the alterity of the Italian case. I mean, it's really, really striking how people who say very positive things would preface this by saying that Italy is very different. Mm -hmm. Which, incidentally, is not something that is used with regard to Yugoslavia. Okay, so that kind of connection with Stoyadino, which is made quite explicitly in the 1930s, so it's interesting how Stoyadino is is constructed by the Greek opinion in that respect as part of a narrative of their own understanding of fascism as dictatorship and not as a radical movement. But the Italian, the Italian example remains broad. Yeah. So it doesn't work on the Mediterranean coast. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so I guess we need to have a coffee break now. We can carry on with the discussion at the end of the fourth panel. So thank you once again.
So, um, we are perhaps a bit late, but uh, now we have to proceed. So, I'm, um, I would uh, like to introduce the first speaker of the second panel today, and I'm uh, really very pleased to be able to introduce him because he is my doctoral supervisor, Professor Dr. Borut Klavian. Uh, he graduated from the University of Trieste and obtained his PhD at the University of Ljubljana with the dissertation, dissertation titled Trieste and Primorska between the World, War, World Wars in the light of Ch Czechoslovak diplomacy. He also studied in Bratislava, Venice, and Berlin. Uh, since the beginning of his academic career, he has worked as a researcher at the Science and Research Center in Koper. Capodistria, and he is also associate professor uh, of uh, modern history, I think, or contemporary history at the University of Ljubljana. His research mostly deals with the contemporary history of the North Adriatic area, with a special emphasis uh, on the studies of cultural memory and transnational history. His bi bibliography comprises more than 200 items, including more than 50 scientific articles, books, chapters, and reviews in nine languages. Among his recent works, I would like to mention his recent monographic studies on the history of the uh, Nation Narodny Dom, National Hall in Trieste, which he co-authored with uh, uh, Goras Bites. Sorry. Borut, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Kuala Matic. So, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I will concentrate on my paper, uh, not to be too late. So, I will start with, uh, with uh, to mention the um, Narodny Dom, the national, the Slovene National Hall, uh, the main seat of the Slovene liberal organizations. Uh, and the symbol of their presence in Trieste, which was uh, attacked uh, on July 13, 1920. Uh, at this, uh, at that time, this cosmopolitan, I mean, and uh, multinational former Habsburg port city, I mean, Trieste, was under Italian occupation and part of a territorial dispute between Italy and the Kingdom of Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. Uh, on the same day, cafes, stores, banks, offices, and private homes of, uh, of um, um, Slovenes, Croats, Serbs living in the city were vandalized together with the offices of the representative of the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. One of the most prolific historians of fascism, Renzo de Felice, you all know him, defined the attack as the real baptism of organized squadrismo, while other, um, others have found parallels with the Kristallnacht, the anti-Jewish pogrom in Nazi Germany in 1938. Mm. The day after the arson in Trieste, the Narodny Dom in Pula, um, the, the Croat political headquarters in the city was burned in very similar circumstances. So these two violent episodes in July, uh, in the middle of July 1920, uh, are part of a long-lasting tensions all over the northern Adriatic area occupied by Italian forces after November 1918, and they further complicated the so-called Adriatic question at the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, and the arsons of these two national halls uh, are a part of this intricate picture of this Adriatic question. The Rapallo Treaty signed uh, by the uh, delegations of um, Italy and uh, Yugoslavia on November 12, 1920, uh, uh, ended partially this period of territorial indeterminacy assigning the former Austrian littoral to the Italians and most of Dalmatia to the Yugoslavs. That's just roughly, just to make the picture a bit more clearer. This prolonged period of uncertainty in the Adriatic confirms the findings of recent historiographical works, stressing the need for a more extensive and inclusive analysis of the Great War. Uh, however, despite the qualitative relevance of these outcomes, 
uh, many of these works seem implicitly that post-war violence is the result of territorial indeterminacy of a certain space, of a certain territory. But the case of the Northern Adriatic shows that state control is not a guarantee of stability. This is the main finding. As I have analyzed in an uh, essay, I called it Borders in Arms, um, violent attacks directed against ethnic and political opponents continued even after political agreements were signed by Italian and Yugoslav diplomats. Violence did not diminish even after January 1924, when the city of Rijeka, Fiume, was annexed by Italy and the Adriatic question was somehow settled. On the contrary, after fascists took power in Italy, violent street attacks overlapped with repressive legal measures against ethnic minorities and political opponents, and state-sponsored violence represented a major factor of instability. So the fascist party, founded in March 1919 in Milan, first came to power in Italy in October 1922, after a mass gathering later known as the March in Rome. The link between Milan or Rome and geographically marginal borderlands may at first appear a bit tenuous, but former Habsburg territories annexed, annexed to Italy after World War I played a central role in fascism's genesis. In the post-Habsburg Northern Adriatic, fascism first gained mass support. Moreover, the diplomatic battle for Dalmatia, the occupation of Rijeka by Gabriele D'Annunzio and his volunteers in September 1919, and the myth of a mutilated victory mobilized Italian society around the idea of the nation and launched the fascists as guardians of na Italian national interests. In the months following the arsons in Trieste and Pula, and after similar, uh, similar violent uh, um, actions against anti-national political enemies, the fascists gained widespread popularity in the region. The Trieste fascist section became the most populous in Italy, uh, standing at around uh, 14,000. Its membership was more than twice uh, that of the second most numerous in Ferrara. Uh, which had more or less 7,000 uh, members at that, at that time. So Trieste was being the most fascist of, Itali uh, of um, Italian uh, cities. And in many cases, young enthusiasts joined the movement, but several biographies demonstrate that pre-war Italian nationalists were often at the core of the fascist squads. Uh, nationalist mobilization around the Adriatic question favored the local fascist movement and border issues played a central role at the national level. Benito Mussolini, leader of the fascist party during his visit in the region in 1920, recognized the northern Adriatic as a springboard for a radical change at the national level that would bring the fascists to Rome. Let's go back to the post-war um, uh, period to talk about violence. The Great War and its consequences represented a historical caesura for European societies. And despite the Northern Adriatic area having had a relatively long tradition of changing rulers and state affiliations, local populations were heavily affected by the collapse of the Habsburg monarchy and the dissolution of Austro-Hungarian state institutions in autumn 1918. Local inhabitants viewed the collapse of the empire with mixed happiness, uncertainty, hesitations and suspicion. After the war, the area, as I mentioned before, was occupied by the Italian army, and although the formal territorial resolution came about in the Rapallo Treaty in November 1920, implemented in March 1921, the Italian administration worked from um, early on to connect it with the Kingdom of Italy. Um, while many local Italians applauded this approach, others showed little enthusiasm. However, there was no clear ethno-national division. 
for in, uh, in the region. First, because the, the national idea was far from generally um, accepted by the population. And second, because in a multi-ethnic setting, national identifications were often, uh, were often indeterminate and interchangeable. Nevertheless, ethno-national labels played a major role. Slovenes and Croats were especially disinclined to welcome the occupation by the Italian army with open arms. And despite prom uh, promise by uh, General Carlo Petitti di Loreto, the first post Habsburg governor of the region, to respect for their culture and um, traditions, harsh repression of, of non-Italians followed. Along with Slovenes and Croats, I mean the majority in the region, many Serbs, Germans, Hungarians, Czechs, others left the area, while hundreds of uh, individuals were imprisoned and moved to internal, internal parts of Italy. Uh, Friulans and reluctant Italians considered nostalgic supporters of, uh, of Austria, named Austriacanti, were also persecuted and marginalized. Um, last, last numbers speak about between 900 and 1,000 people imprisoned uh, or moved interned into internal parts of Italy uh, in the uh, first year after um, the Italian army occupied uh, the region. Uh, so this means for the last two months of 1918 and uh, 1919. Uh, during the uh, period of territorial competition, the policy of uh, this ethnic segregation aimed to eliminate potential enemies. The ultimate goal of this policy was to make the region Italian. And even before the fascists came to power in 1922, Italian post-war governments aimed at a national homogenization of the area and authorities were intolerant of alternative visions of the Italian uh, nationalist project that sought to unite all citizens of Italy in a nation stand, uh, in a nation state. So opponents were stigmatized as anti-national and enemies of the nation. These phenomena were not limited to the hot post-war period. Rather, they characterized the Italian attitude towards new uh, ethno-national minorities in these freshly annexed provinces, Germans in South Tyrol, Alto Adige, and Slovenes and Croats in Venezia Giulia, as the Austrian littoral was re renamed after the war. And this attitude was backed by several acts of violence, as underlined by Mimo Franzinelli, although fascist violence was not a peculiarity of the new Italian borderlands, it was particularly brutal in Istria and in Venezia Giulia. Uh, violent actions committed by the fascist squads in, in this region um, uh, against Slovene and Croat centers, uh, against uh, um, uh, worker seats, uh, um, resulted in hundreds of burned uh, buildings, uh, seats of cultural associations, uh, houses of the people, chambers of labor, and so on and so on. The, authoritar the authorities generally try to just justify fascist violence as response to provocations. The chronology of events shows no significant change after the official annexation of the region to the Kingdom of Italy in March 1921. On March 19, for example, uh, at the Strunian railway station, fascists on the train traveling from Piran to Trieste fired at a group of children, killing two and injuring five. March, 20, March 24, they burned down a library, a Croat library in, uh, in Volosko, near Rijeka. Uh, in, uh, in the occasion of elections to the Italian parliament in May 1921, they attacked and burned several polling stations, private houses, and so on, and so on. Uh, um, in, some, in some cases, in some uh, cases, local inhabitants fought back uh, and sometimes they even managed to stop the fascists, but were unable to counter the intervention of the Italian army and police troops, whom the fascists usually called for assistance. So punitive expeditions uh, ensued with killings, burning of houses and villages, and mass arrests. 
So the local and the state uh, authorities, instead of taking action, absolved the offenders, covering up the connections between the attackers and the state structures, and shifting the, bl the blame to the Slavs for their disloyal pro-Yugoslav stance towards the new authorities. Um, the fascist movement was thus able to establish itself rapidly, and at the, at the local political level, the fascists subdued other parties in the so-called national bloc, uh, rendered ineffective the hitherto dominant socialists. So they were preoccupied with internal conflicts with the rising communists, and overcame Slovene and Croat resistance. Um, only in rural, rural areas did forms of resistance per, uh, persevere, although acts of re, um, be, these acts became rarer and less effective by the month. Many scholars have considered post-war violence in the borderlands marginal, marginal as compared to that in the central Italian territories, and often view at the, at the specific and separate phenomenon. However, recent research has demonstrated the interconnection between borderland uh, events and their impact at the national level. And the attitude of the Italian elites towards its national um, ethno-national minorities, in fact, played an important role in both internal and foreign policies. As Marina Cataruzza points out, the Italian state structure in this border region was weak, and the Italian authorities tried to make up for inefficiencies with ambiguous strategies, including tolerance of violence, which allowed local fascists a sort of semi-official mandate to carry out violent, violent attacks and violent acts even before they came to power. Uh, how much time do I still have? Five. Five minutes? Okay, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, with the annexation of the region of Venezia Giulia in March 1920, the Slovenes and Croats uh, of, of this area officially became Italian citizens, but their status as minority was not legally recognized, collectively or individually. Here it is necessary to consider the international balances that emerged from the war. Serbia had gained an international reputation for having been the first victim of Austro-German aggression and an ally of the Entente. But Italy's status as a victorious great power put the newly formed Yugoslavia in a subordinate position in relation to its neighbor. In general, Western liberal countries, the victors, of the First World War were allowed a free hand in silencing ethnic diversity. Uh, France and her and its reconquista of Alsace and Lorraine is, uh, is a, a well-known example. Italy followed the same template and optimized it. Conversely, the countries that emerge in the territories of former multinational empires were tasked with providing for the ethnic minorities within their new borders. In the Adriatic, this resulted in an imbalance where Yugoslavia was required to provide formal legal protection for, for the 6,000 Italians living under its rule in Dalmatia, mainly in Šibenik, Sebeniko and, uh, and Split, Spalato, while um, Italy never had any formal treaty obligation to protect the approximately half a million Yugoslavs, uh, Slovenes and Croats, basically, in its own uh, territory. Italian Minister of Foreign Affairs at that time, Carlo Sforza, himself dismissed the socialist deputies in the parliament in Rome who demanded reciprocity, assuring them the Slovenes and Croats could count on Italian democratic traditions. But supposed Italian democratic traditions did not prove solid enough. Pressures uh, on uh, local Slovenes and Croats grew more persistent and restrictions became more severe. And these restrictions to them uh, were varied. Uh, caught between the unpunished physical violence of the fascists and the psychological pressure of the authorities, Many Slovenes and Croats simply decided to move away. 
while many others who stayed Italianized. There is relatively little research as to how this happened. Authorities changed many surnames by official decree, and imposing a new invented name in Italian for places, families, individuals aimed at erasing their ethnic identification. Uh, however, people sometimes change them themselves to hidden, to blend in with the dominant Italian environment, not to Italianize due to the to a alleged superiority of the Italian civilization or due to a perceived inferiority, but rather as a survival strategy. Many switched the linguistic register, making Italian uh, um, uh, the language of communication at home, uh, since the level of multilingualism was quite high. And this, of course, this, uh, this mechanisms of assimilation and national pressure had been present before the, uh, the First World War, but were given a new context, speaking about context, as we did earlier, after the First World War and after fascists came to. Uh, power, uh, when these measures were codified in new laws and put into practice by the state. Uh, now to conclude, I would like to um, to to to, um, to quote uh, Virgili Szczek in uh, he is a Slovene priest and dep a deputy uh, to the Italian Parliament. And he, in, a, in, a, in an article in the Slovenian newspaper in August 1991, explained why there could be no cooperation between the Slavs in Italy and, the, and fascism and the fascist squads. This did not mean that no Slovene and Croat ever joined the fascist movement. There is little known, but we know that there were Slovenes and uh, Croats joining the fascists. But the case of the Venezia Giulia speaks of the basic antithesis between the preservation of an ethno-national identification, in this sense, Slovene or Croat, on the one hand, and fascistization on the other hand, which required the individual to fully assimilate and integrate into the Italian national framework. The moment Italy turned into a fascist dictatorship, it became impossible to remain a Slovene or a Croat. There is no doubt that in numerous cases, the gray zone allowing a clean and undisturbed existence prevailed. But while many national minorities in interwar Europe adopted an integralist vision of the nation in order to preserve their ethnicity, and uh, as Nunez Seixas, I think it, it's pronounced, writes, drawing closer to fascism more or less evidently, this was not an option for Slovene and Croat minorities in Italy. Uh, Slovene and Croat anti-fascists in Italy conceived their demands as a struggle for a more just world, and this included also ethno-national rights. Thank you very much. And now I'm very pleased to introduce our second speaker and a dear friend of mine, a colleague at the study center, Dr. Renato Podbersic. Um, he received his bachelor's at the, in history at the U University of Ljubljana and then his doctorate at the faculties of humanities of the at the University of the Littoral in Koper. Um, he's also an assistant for contemporary history at the University of Nova Gorica, and since 2017 he has been editor-in-chief of the scientific uh, journal called Dilemmas, as well as the president of the Slovenian Historical Society for Modern and Contemporary History. His primary research interest is the history of totalitarianisms in Slovenia, but also Jewish history especially the persecution of Jews in Slovenia and wider Central European area. He's a member of the International Commission for the, for the Study of Holocaust. Among his bibli bibliography, I would like to mention especially his monographic study on the history of the Jewish communities uh, in Gorizia. Renato, the floor is yours.
Hello, Matits. Thanks, Matits. Hello, everybody. Uh, for a long time, Italian historiography has reflected uh, on the fascist dictator Mussolini, who allegedly resisted the introduction of anti-Jewish legislation. Today, however, this thesis is completely refuted. It would be too cheap to blame the beginning of the anti-Jewish campaign in Italy on the German allies, forgetting that the order came from the Duce himself, who decided to launch the persecution on the basis of biological racism. So far, it's mostly the Italian historiography which has turned to the study and research on, uh, of the history of the Jews in the frontier area of the Julian March or Venezia Giulia in northeastern Italy, today the border, uh, border place between um, Slovenia, Croatia and, of course, Italy. In this moment, I have to mention that the author of the term Julian March, Venezia Giulia, Julius Cabenecia in Slovenian language, was a very famous uh, Jew, uh, originally from Gorizia, born in the former ghetto of Gorizia, Grazia Dio Isaia Ascoli, who invented this term in the mid of 19th century. He later moved to, to Milano, Milan, and uh, became a famous professor on the University of Milano of the, it, uh, of the modern philology. The history of persecution of Jews uh, shows uh, great differences, which can be unified in the context of understanding, uh, understanding the complex uh, process that uh, ultimately led to the Nazi genocide of Jews across Europe. Myths and stereotypes, superstitions and uh, conspiracy terror theories, uh, and consequently hatred to the, of the Jews, are present in the European consciousness, we can say from the beginnings, often simply because the Jews maintained a strong ethnic and religious identity to history in the environment of the ethnic, other ethnic groups. Religious uh, prejudice and ignorances, uh, ignorance of their strange language became uh, accompanied by stereotypes of Jewish dishonesty uh, and uh, extortion. In fact, we can say that anti-Semitism is uh, in a content, in constant uh, in uh, European society. The key reasons of uh, it lie primarily in the Christian conception of Judaism and Jews. Just before of, uh, the anti-Jewish legislation was passed uh, in Italy in 1938, organized uh, Jewish communities existed in many Italian cities. The crisis of Judaism was also evident uh, from rabbinic uh, presence in uh, individual cities as four, of, um, uh, four out of 25 cities did not have a rabbi. Those cities were uh, Gorizia, Gorizia, Merano, South Tyrol, Opatia, Abazia, near Rijeka, Fiume, and Rijeka itself, Fiume. Interestingly, uh, the biggest crisis of its kind was in uh, Venezia Giulia. The political uh, rapprochement between fascist Italy and Nazi Germany took a recognizable form in an agreement signed uh, in October uh, 36. This created the so-called Roman uh, Berlin Axis. At the same time, Nazism was a sort of alibi for the fascists to begin um, introducing certain measures, including also anti-Semitism. The first noticeable result of these new international responses with Germany was the joint partition, participation in the Spanish Civil War in the second half of the 30s and on the side of General Franco. Mussolini's envoys began to attend Nazi, Nazi, uh, Nazi uh, rallies, congresses and other ceremonies more often. There, some of them, especially Roberto Farinacci, were infected with uh, racism and anti-Semitism. 
At the same time, Germany demands uh, of Italy that it uh, align itself with the Nazi, Nazi uh, ideology uh, as a confirmation of its um, partnerhood. The influence of um, Mussolini's circle grew, and there were many strong supporters of full uh, cooperation with the Nazi Germany. The so-called Italian national anti-Semitism as um, um, was supposed to be different from the German one without the brutal persecution of the later. The fascists simply, simply uh, envisaged the removal of the Jews from the society and country as their goal, but without clear objectives uh, on how to achieve this. In Italy, an old medieval religiously uh, conditioned anti-Judaism was preserved, which was quite far from the anti-Semitism, modern anti-Semitism. Few believed that, few Italians believed what racial ideologies uh, said and wrote about the Jews uh, to justify and excuse racial legislation. There existed, of course, a fear of diversity and uh, otherness of the entire racial theory by the so-called scientists. Some Italians accepted primarily the part that spoke of their superiority, superiority because uh, it uh, justified their self-absorption. But uh, for, the more, uh, the, for the most part, they did not understand why the Jews were considered a treat to the Italian society and, of course, the Italian state. In fact, many Italians have never met a single Jew in their lives. Since Pope Gregory the Great, the Catholic Church maintained a rather cold attitude towards the Jews, but uh, did not persecute them as heretics. Their uh, religious uh, tradition predates the Christ uh, Christian one, so they uh, never fell away from it uh, or betrayed it. At the same time, however, they were considered by the church to be the killers of the Lord, or the main uh, uh, culprits of death of the uh, Jesus uh, Christ. The Italian press launched, uh, launched a fierce anti-Jewish campaign in spring 1937. It was inspired uh, by Liebredi in Italia, The Jews in Italy, a text uh, published in Rome by a writer and journalist uh, Paolo Orano. And uh, uh, in this writing, Orano drew uh, on both the classical treasury of anti-Semitism and the controversies with Zionism and those Jews who supported fascism. The publication itself provoked a range of uh, reactions from silent public opposition to enthusiastic acceptance among the, the anti-Semites. At the same time, under the fascist regime's control, the press launched a propaganda campaign against the Jews. This was done in a number of ways. Anti-Jewish legislation in other countries, especially in Europe, began to be widely written about. At the same time, the, they targeted the Jews in the country by highlighting other their crimes. They began um, to, be, to begin to write uh, ex existentially about Jewish particularities, their anti-fascism, international Zionism, and the strength of the international Judaism. All this led to the progressive adoption of the anti-Jewish legislation in Italy. It is probably no co coincidence that in October 37, there was a proposal to reprint the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a classic anti-Semitistic uh, um, text prepared for publication as early in 1921, by a well-known known, uh, politician, former priest, translator, and uh, public, publicist by the name of Giovanni Preziosi. The first official step was taken by the uh, Mussolini-led government, which uh, used notice uh, number 14 on February 38. The notice remained uh, without uh, firm positions and was uh, 
written. This document demonstrates all the confusions in the drafting of the anti-Jewish legislation. The Jews in Italy found themselves under um, uh, bureaucratic um, suspicions. On July 38, Italian scientists uh, produced a manifesto of the racist uh, scientists, which was published in the Giornale uh, Ita the Italian newspaper. On uh, September 38, the fascist authorities established the General Administration for the Demography and Race, in Italian language uh, sarebbe Direzione Generale per la Demografia e Razza, known by the short name, name Demorazza, this state body actually planned and led the persecution of the Jews under fascism. In fact, it was in charge of implementing the laws for the protection by the so-called protection by the Italian race or Italian language difesa della razza italiana. In early August 38, the fascist state authorities announced that, in their view, discrimination did not simultaneously mean persecution. Uh, the, uh, the fascist definition of the Jews in Kingdom of Italy was similar to the Nazi one, based on racial ground. However, the fascists uh, determined uh, an individual Judaism based on their parents' religion, while the Nazis, uh, Nazis uh, changed the religion of an individual's uh, grandparents. Thus, uh, under the Italian fascist regime, anyone with a Jewish father and a Jewish mother was considered a Jew, regardless of whether or not they themselves were Jewish. Likewise, anyone uh, with a Jewish father and a foreign mother, and anyone with a Jewish mother and an unknown father was considered a Jew. A Jew was also defined as uh, someone origina originating from a mixed uh, marriage, where one of the parent parents was an Italian Jew, and the other was Jewish or displayed uh, an um, connection to Judaism in some other way. An individual of those Italian parents, one was Jewish and who before the beginning of October 38 practices a religion other than Judaism was not considered a Jew. Contrary to Nazi racial legislation, there were those not categories of mixed race in Italy. A person could be only be a Jew or Aryan race. From September 38 onwards, the Italian authorities introduced several legal measures to exclude Jewish from public life. The Italian Jews often sold their properties on the basis of that loss for example, including the ownership of the Trieste daily newspaper Il, Il Piccolo, the latter was uh, founded in 80, 1881 by Trieste Jew Theodoro Theodor Meyer, who also <coughs> reigned it and was trusted by the uh, leading fascist. Okay. The, this un, initial anti-Jewish measures was fo was, uh, were followed in October 38 by others, others which were uh, much more severe. Uh, on 18th of uh, September, a crowd gathered on the unity of uh, Piazza Unità d'Italia, Unity Square of Italy in Trieste, uh, mainly due to the fascist propaganda. Mussolini made a fiery speech on that day announcing from the balcony the uh, racial law concerning the Jewish Jews uh, had come into force in Italy and that the Jews uh, needed to be excluded from public life in Italy. He stated that uh, they were not Italians and did uh, not belong among them. Uh, therefore, in the words of the Trieste historian Silvia Bon, Trieste became, became for Duce the central periphery, the central scene of um, de developments that had been uh, in the making for several months ahead uh, by the attacks 
of the most visible Italian racial antisemites. For example, Roberto Farinacci, Giovanni Preziosi, Gino Sotokiesa, et, um, and others. It was uh, they who presented Trieste as an ideal place and scene for a fierce strike against the country Jews. The Jews in uh, Venezia Giulia communicated among themselves mainly in Italian, but before the First World War, also in German. Yiddish uh, was also present, but as uh, elsewhere and in the monarchy, Jews began to abandon Jewish after moving to the area due to the process of acculturation. In the years before the outbreak of uh, World War II, many Jews uh, traveled through the Venezia Giulia or stopped there before of their way from Germany and countries uh, already occupied by the Nazis, for example, Austria, Czech Republic, and so on. Uh, in the early 30s, a few four Jewish communities existed in the um, northeastern border of the Kingdom of Italy. We say before, uh, Trieste, Gorizia, Rieca, Fiume, Abbazia, or Patia. The Jews, uh, Jews of these uh, communities also demonstrated their loyalty to the Italian state, and after October 22, they are supported for the ruling fascist regime by joining the Partito Nazionale Fascista, Italian Fascist Party. The fascist movement has been presented in the region from the middle of uh, 1919, initially as the Fascio, Fascio Operazione Operaia. Um, in their activities, the Jews in Venezia Giulia also had to be considered uh, competition in form of various uh, fascist association. Their operations increasingly permanent, uh, permitted uh, every aspect of the daily life in all parts of society in the Kingdom of it Italy. The Jewish communities were no exception, exception for even the Jewish children who uh, were um, uh, school children were obligated to participate in the fascist state uh, programs and organizations, for example, Fili di Lupa, Balilla, Giovanni, Giovanni Fascisti, Avangordisti, and so on. The period was also marked by the constant arrivals, uh, arrivals of and departures of Jewish families from Central and Eastern Europe. The, uh, Julian Marco, Venezia Giulia, was often only a point of transition through which most of them traveled onwards to Palestine. In, uh, in that time, um, Trieste was considered as Porta di Sion, it means the main uh, port to be uh, uh, for Jewish uh, emigrants in, uh, uh, in Switzerland, in um, uh, Palestine, America, Great Britain, Africa, South America, and so on, and so on. In Trieste, Enrico Paolo Salem, a mixed Jew, became mayor of the town in October 33. He followed the typical path of an Italian heritageist, a volunteer in the Third World, one, World War I, and the fascists from 91. His uh, Jewish religion did not hinder um, his political and economical rise until the adoption of anti-Jewish legislation in 38. In Venezia Giulia, nationalism and ethnocentrism, known as border fascism or fascismo di confine in Italian language, dominated people's emotions in hand. Uh, from its uh, very beginning, uh, many racist filters, uh, especially in relation to Slovenians and Croats. With the beginning of uh, World War II, European borders was practically closed for Jewish immigrant, uh, immigrations and immigrants, of course. This is also evident from the date uh, for the um, local Jews in Venezia Zulia, who were at the time that time only able to emigrate to the other uh, Italian cities or to Switzerland. The final uh, aggravation of the situation came with the capitulation of Italy in, uh, and the arrival of the German army in the Venezia Giulia, in uh, all of the Italian land uh, occupied by the German army in September uh, 43, a real hunt to the, for the Jews began known in Italian, and not only in Italian historiography, as uh, uh, caccia, la caccia all'ebreo. 
In the last two decades, an interest on, in the Holocaust and its aftermath in it, Venezia Giulia has been increasing, especially in Italian historiography, as well um, the well-organized Jewish communities uh, of Trieste, Gorizia, and uh, Rijeka, Fiume, were severely uh, affected. The Jewish communities of Rijeka and Trieste have preserved it to this day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renato. Our last uh, paper in this panel will also deal with anti-Semitism and the persecution of Jews in the city of uh, or town of Osijek. Uh, our presenter will be Lauro Kral, who specializes in the fields of fascism, anti-Semitism, and Holocaust studies, with an original focus on Central and Southeastern Europe. He holds a bachelor and master's degree in philosophy and history from the University of Rijeka. Uh, he earned his second master in comparative history from the Central European University. In 2015, he started his PhD, uh, again at the Central European University with the dissertation titled Paving the Road to Death, Antisemitism and the, in the Ustasha movement. Uh, Loro has already authored many academic publications, from book reviews to journal articles. His work was published in academic journals and edited volumes issued by Rutledge, uh, Macmillan, and Wallstein Verlag. Uh, in academic year 2020-21, with the support of the Holocaust Educational Foundation, he launched the first Holocaust course um, at the University of Rijeka. Loro, welcome. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, this is the... Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, I would just like to congratulate the organizers for organizing this very necessary uh, uh, conference, workshop, however we want to call it, because I really think that there is not enough uh, academic events revolving around the topic of fascism, Holocaust, and anti-Semitism within the region nationally, but also tying different researchers from the region together and bringing them together to, to, to uh, kind of analyze these topics in a comparative way. So congratulations uh, for that, and I hope it will be continued in, in other events as well. So uh, I would also just like to ask Matic if you can warn me when it's five minutes, and be, you can be very assertive, you can also be loud. Okay, so just so, so I know where we're at. Okay, so in my presentation today, I will examine how different ethnic uh, groups and fascist movements interpreted anti-Semitic anti ideology and policies, as well as how they adapted and tailored them to serve their specific nationalist programs. By taking a regional approach, I will address the question of how do the dynamics between perpetrators from different ethnic groups influence the Holocaust? And finally, I will address the question of how the interaction between various fascist movements cha change the dynamics of genocidal violence. So the topic of our oh, okay, good. Uh, the topic of our uh, uh, of my presentation today will be the city of Osijek, which you can see on the far north over here, if you can see it, which was located right at the border with Hungary during the Second World War. <laughs> So, <laughs> the city of Osijek, uh, which was basically a, a border it, located in the borderland regions throughout its history, and due to its uh, Austro-Hungarian legacy, uh, the city hosted a myriad of different ethnic groups, mainly Croats, Germans, Serbs, Hungarians, and Jews, as you can see in this pie chart here. This is a very rough estimate. Don't take these ethnic categories or national categories as very fixed. There were cases of, for example, ethnic Germans who would also identify as Croats or Jews who identify as German speakers. So there is a certain kind of fluidity between these categories. So during the Second World War, this, the city of Osijek became a part of the fascist-led independent state of Croatia. Despite the proclaimed totalitarianism of the Ustasha regime, which envisioned Croatia under the dominance of a single party system, the case of Osijek shows a curious case of multi-party fascist system in existence. Due to its multi-ethnic setting, the city of Osijek hosted no less than three fascist movements, each espoused with radical anti-Semitism. During the summer of 
During the summer of 1941, a wave of anti-Semitic protests or demonstrations swept the streets of Osik. You can see, for example, members of the Arrow Cross marching through the streets of Osik here. Fascists and ordinary uh, citizens of Croatian, German, and Hungarian ethnicity joined together in their demands that the city be cleansed of Jews. Cutting through ethnic, gender, and generational boundaries, the anti-Semitic demonstrations seemingly demonstrate a consensus be behind the anti-Semitic policies. Here you can see ordinary citizens participating in those anti-Semitic demonstrations. The sites of marching columns of the Ustasha, Nazi, and Aerocross members side by side in Osijek invoke the image of the ideal new European order, which was propagated by various fascist intellectuals across the European continent. All three movements saw themselves as the avant-garde of the new fascist man which was being created, acting in the name of an all-encompassing and regenerated nation state. Through creative destruction, they were supposed to annihilate the old word of world of perceived decadence and purify the nation. There was no other group which embodied everything that the three fascist movements opposed better than Jews in their own anti-Semitic mind, right? The anti-communist, anti-liberal, and anti-capitalist political concepts were all wrapped within the anti-Semitic rhetoric, binding them together into an ideological glue. Yet the history of the Holocaust in Osijek was written with contradictions. While the three fascist movements were basically overproducing anti-Semitism in a single location, this, the city of Osijek was one of the last places in the independent state of Croatia where large-scale deportations of Jews actually occurred, leading us to a pretty big paradox of the case. <coughs> Many Holocaust survivors reflected themselves on this paradox which one of them called a case of delayed Holocaust, learning about the fate of Jews after the war in many other locations. Other survivors, such as Vlado and Nada Salzberger, tried to explain that this case of delayed genocide in the following manner. The long gap between the first convoys, so there was technically a, a deportation of a smaller number of Jews from Osijek in August 1941, and then for 12 months, there were no deportations until August 1942. So they're referring to this first deportation. The long gap between the first convoys and the mass deportations of the Osijek Jews may be explained by the ethnic makeup of, of the city of Osijek. Osijek was the center of Croatia's German ethnic community, and although Croats were in the majority, they regarded the activities of the Germans gathered in the Kulturbund, which is German institution at the time, which gathered political activists, as a serious provocation. The Croats wanted to decide when the mass transfer of Jews to camps would begin. However, this would have been seen by Germans as an expression of independence by the Croats in resisting the German plan to deport them as soon as possible. In other words, the decision making regarding the deport deportation of Jews became a means of a certain power, a certain power over the entire city, depending on which fascist movement was uh, uh, kind of being considered. The struggle over the, over the control of how, when, and who would spearhead the anti-Semitic persecution became a battleground of fascist power struggle in the city of Osijek. Let us dive into causality behind this case of delayed genocide by, by outline, outlining the ideological aims between the three fascist movements. So the Hungarian Arrow Cross was the least numerous of the three fascist movements in Osijek, yet its members were ambitious and active aspiring to turn Osijek into the breeding ground for political agitation outside of Hungary. It was our cross members who organized one of the first anti-Semitic protests in the city during May 1941. This is basically a month after the independent state of Croatia was proclaimed. Dressed in their green uniforms and waving flags with party symbols, they bore standards, let's go back to the picture, they bore standards with trilingual inscriptions in Hungarian, German, and Croatian declaring victory persists. Anti-Semitism was supposed to become a unifying idea behind the mobilization of three fascist movements in Osijek. Yet anti-Semitism also became a weaponized tool in the hands of various fascist movements to discredit and delegitimize the competing group as not belonging to the new order. For example, ethnic Hungarians in the independent state of Croatia were divided between conservatives who supported Horthy and on the other hand, the Aerocross, 
which was mainly supported, of course, uh, uh, Ferenc Salashi, who was kind of in their direct opposition to Horti at the time. In order to discredit the pro-Horti faction within Croatia, the Aero Cross was spreading rumors that the rival organization was smuggling Jews from Croatia across the border to Hungary. Therefore, they weaponized anti-Semitism in order to discredit the rival group in the eyes of the Ustasha authorities. In a subsequent investigation which the Croatian authorities conducted, it was of course completely false what the Aero Cross reported about the mass organized uh, smuggling of Jews across the border by the rival organization. However, this didn't prevent further friction, and there was aggressive, the aggressive agitation of the Arab Cross often ended in physical brawls between the rival groups within the Hungarian community itself. More importantly, despite the commonalities of the fascist ideology, which was supposed to bring them together, Arab Cross and the Ustasha movement couldn't coexist due to severe differences in their political programs. Arab Cross members supported the idea of greater Hungary, which was also supposed to incorporate large parts of Croatia. The Ustasha distrust towards the Arab Cross was further facilitated by the reports that Hungarian agents were infiltrating Croatia, and I quote, they were spreading rumors that Sirmia and Slavonia, two regions in Croatia, will be annexed to the Hungarian crown, end of the quote. Seen as a threat to the territorial integrity, as well as, as, well as the totalitarian monopoly on meaning-making systems in Croatia, the Ustasha Secret Service supervised the activities of the Arab Cross. In June 1942, the Ustasha police arrested its leader, Ante Kovac, under the suspicion that they were conducting espionage for the Hungarian authorities. Soon afterwards, in September 1942, the Ustasha's declared that all the activities of the Arab Cross in Croatia were, I quote, illegal, including the public display of any party symbol symbols and flags associated with the organization. The conflicts between the Ustashas and the Arab Cross, however, remained in the shadows of a larger power struggle between the two largest fascist movements in Osijek, the Ustashas and the Nazis. The local Nazis were put into a contradictory position ever since the occupation of Yugoslavia. They were encouraged to perceive themselves as the members of the master race destined to lead new Europe as the continent's foremost elite. Yet, at the same time, they were supposed to subjugate themselves to the decision-making of a de facto Slavic-led, second-tier fascist regime, as was the Ustasha uh, regime in Croatia. Nevertheless, considering that the Third Reich would be the primary arbiter in international relations after the war, or that's at least what they believed in, some members of the Volksdeutsche in Osijek still fantasized about the creation of a German-led state in, south, in southeastern Europe, which would include large swaths of Croatia, Serbia, and Romania, parts of these three countries which contained a higher proportion of ethnic Germans. Even though the proposition of a German state in Lower Danube, which they refer to as Prinz Eugenland, was a wild political fantasy, as historian Mirna Zakic, who dealt with the question of Banat, Volksdeutsche, uh, has said. This, nevertheless, fed the fears of some Croats and the Ustashas that ethnic Germans would agitate for a similar idea in the future. Beyond the potential territorial dispute, the conflict between the Ustasha and Nazis in Osijek also revolved around the control of economic power in the city. The Ustasha and Nazi shared anti-Semitic belief that Jews ran the economy. Paradoxically, this shared idea of economic anti-Semitism pitted, pitted the two fascist movements against each other. They maintained that whoever controls the Aryanization, meaning the requisition of Jewish property, would control the economic future of the city. Therefore, the struggle over the Jewish property became a battlefield over the fascist elite building and was attempted to be used to secure the dominance over the future city politics. This has led some Eustaches to refer to ethnic Germans as, I quote, other Jews, due to the xenophobic projection that Germans as foreigners would dominate the political and economic landscape in Osijek if they were permitted to take 
Jewish property. In other words, there was a threat, and you have the common thread in uh, Romanian fascism as well, where Romanian fascists oppose also the idea of German participation in the Romanianization of the property, arguing that Jews had political and economic power in their anti-Semitic thinking, but Germans will have a military, political, and economic power if they were permitted to take the property. So the feeling of resentment was further deepened by the special privilege that the Ustasha regime in Zagreb gave to the Volksdeutsche. This privilege has included the right that the ethnic Germans could completely take political and administrative power in places where they had more than 50% of the population. And in places where they had 20% of the population, any person appointed into a public office had to be approved by the local Volksdeutsche. The Ustasha elite in Zagreb considered this to be a minor, minor concession because ethnic Germans constituted around 3% of the population on the statewide level. However, what was seen as a minor concession from the perspective of Zagreb was in fact a major political threat to the Ustashas in Osijek, where the numbers of ethnic Germans reportedly skyrocketed from about 30% to almost 43% in a couple of months. This growth of the population can be credited to a lot of different factors. Excellent. Uh, to a lot of different factors, but one of the main ones was this competition of mobilizing different sorts of these different parts of the population according to uh, various promises of economic and political prosperity. For example, Serbs who were discriminated and persecuted in the independent state of Croatia were promised by the Volksdeutsche if they would join their organization that they would be protected from the persecution by the Ostashas. And there were actually uh, quite fierce struggles uh, for people who had German-sounding last names, right? So there were some German-sounding last name people who joined the Ustasha and they were exposed to violence by the Volksdeutsche because they were seen as traitors to their own national agenda. <coughs> okay, so we have five minutes, so we're gonna go closer to the end. Uh, to come back to our presentation. Sorry. So coming back to the original question which we asked in the beginning of the presentation, uh, why were the mass deportations of Jews delayed in Osijek for a year in comparison to many other locations across the NDH? I would argue that beyond the economic and power struggle between the Nazis and the Ustasha, it was in fact the population policy, demographic policy, and political mobilization between the two groups that can explain the delayed genocide in Osijek. Namely, if Jews and Serbs were deported too quickly, this could drastically change the ethnic ratio in the city in German favor. Through aggressive recruitment, ethnic Germans already increased their population in Osijek, getting dangerously close to the prescribed 50% of the population needed for the total takeover of power on the local level. The potentially sudden deportation of all Serbs and Jews would have threatened the status of Croats as a relative majority and would that therefore provide significantly more political power to the Volksdeutsche. This could be one of the potential explanations as to why the Osijek Ustashas avoided radical and total deportations and increasingly relied on religious conversions of Serbs and ghettoization of Jews in 41 and 42. The Ustashas hoped that, that through these conver conversions, they could outpace the ethnic German mobilization. However, these local negotiations of genocidal policies between various perpetrators were ultimately overridden by the orders from the Ustasha regime in Zagreb. Ever since October 1941, the Croatian government was trying to persuade the Germans to deport Croatian Jews to the east. Uh, the Ustasha requests were denied until May 1942, when Germans agreed to negotiate the matter. Okay, so we just have to understand that the Holocaust in Croatia has two distinct phases. In the first phase, up until mid-1942, the Holocaust in Croatia is almost exclusively a Ustasha-driven process where almost 75% of Jews were killed in Ustasha ran concentration camps. And only in the second phase in 1942, summer of 1942, did Germans come into the play. Ultimately, it was agreed through this cooperation with Germans that 5,000 Croatian Jews would be deported from the Andeha 
independent state of Croatia during August 42. The Jews of Osijek and the surrounding areas made more than 50% of all deportees to Auschwitz in this deportation wave. The Ustasha saw the ethnic homogenization as a shortcut in catching up with the imagined ideal of the West, and therefore a means of rapid modernization of the society. This gave rise, rise to the fa fa fantasies that did not end with the destruction of Serbs, Jews, and Roma in Croatia. The ideas of ethnic homogenization could target anyone identified as a non-Croat. In Osijek, members of all three ethnic groups, which produced Holocaust and genocide perpetrators, meaning Croats, Germans, and Hungarians, both feared and fantasized about the question of who comes next after the last Jew, Serb, or Roma disappeared from the state. Leading Eustache officials in Osijek complained that, I quote, every single day, delegations of Croats from surrounding villages of Osijek visit me and complain that various members of the German national group openly speak that after the gypsies and Jews were deported, then Croats would be next, end of quote. When a Croatian teacher in a company of a Eustache activist tried to uphold the order to start a Croatian school program in one of the German-dominated villages near Osijek, they were chased away by the local Germans who told them, I quote, for us, there are no legal decrees. In Croatia, Germans have 75% of rights and Croats have 25%, end of quote. A brawl ensued between the Ustashas and the Germans and children, because it, it, it was related to school, uh, and children also followed in the footsteps of the adults and entered into a brawl. Afterwards, these Germans around the school uh, told Croats that they will be deported to a concentration camp intended for Jews and that not even hundreds of poglavniks, meaning leaders of the Ustasha movement, can save you from us, end of quote. Folks group and members similarly reported that the Ustasha were spreading rumors that Germans would be soon deported from Croatia. Local Ustasha leaders said, I quote, first the Serbs, then the Germans. Either they will convert and assimilate, or they will be deported. When the Ustasha escorted the column of Roma through the street of Osijek on their way to the rail sta railway station destined for uh, the Asenova's death camp, large crowds of citizens gathered to watch the marching crowd. When some ethnic Germans ridiculed the Roma, one Croatian family turned towards them and shouted, Hitler still hasn't won. One day you will march here just like these gypsies today, and then it will be our turn to laugh. This was not the only such case. Uh -huh. Here we are. This was not the only such case. In a vi village nearby Osijek, a Croatian peasant told the local German, I really love my source base, so I can quote these words, fuck your Hitler, he will never enter Moscow. Rather than that, all of you Germans will lose your heads, and time will come when we Croats will deal with you. So these fears and fantasies of mutual annihilation testify to the power of genocidal ideas and practices and demonstrate how the persecution of targeted groups, such as Serbs, Jews, and Roma, could create visions of annihilation which transcended what the ideologues in the center determined as the limit of their policies. The clear case of genocidal ideological surplus, surplus means the additional creation of ideological content among the receivers of the ideology, testified that citizens from below could take the ideas emanated from the top and further develop them, creating, creating added ideological value. Therefore, propaganda and meaning-making process emanated from the top are never a one-way street. They must always be seen in an entangled way. They continuously influence each other. We're out of time, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for this really interesting and original paper. Uh, so the lunch is waiting for us, and I think we are all uh, getting a bit of hungry, but perhaps we still have five, five minutes for if there are any questions.
Anybody? Yes. Can I, yeah. Maybe I would just I'd like to ask Laura where you mentioned Serbia and Romania. Uh, are there similar cases? I mean, which which cities would be similar case? Maybe if you have some time to look into that. Yeah, I didn't. I, I relied on uh, certain comments on analysis of other topics, such as Aryanization of Jewish property in Romania, and there are studies related to that. But I also wanted to say in the beginning that it's, it's cases like these which are really uh, kind of understudied, also in terms of fascism studies. I think we need to go a bit lower to the micro historical level and then see the interaction, not only between fascist movements, but between different political agents, for example, Women also played a very important role in this entire process, but there was no time to, to get into that. Oh, how informed they were, they threatened to organize counter protests to these protests. And this is one of the first open uh, political protests to the Ustasha governance on the local level as well. And you can really see that the regime is scared of these things. So they, they forward these, uh, these things to the security offices saying you, you have to prevent this immediately. So uh, overall, I think that fascism studies could really benefit uh, from employing the, the local regional approach, uh, because I think there is a lot of these cases which we haven't touched. Uh, I know of certain regional studies related to Alsace and Lorraine, where there were some uh, interwar dif different fractions of fascism, uh, but there aren't very many studies where Czech would use for comparative analysis. Mm -hmm. Holocaust studies, there's much more studies of Lviv and other cities, but then they lack the perspective from fascism studies itself in that methodology. So kind of the convergence between the two fields, I think, would be very beneficial for more better comparative research regarding these questions. Thanks. Okay. Perhaps another question? Um, I suppose I could ask too, but well, I mean, I can I can just say that very very quickly. Anyway, uh, uh, they're they're probably broad questions, but they demand a sort of very very short answer. Uh, one uh, or uh, or um, the borderline is a very interesting concept. Whether you know how, however it translates, I wonder what, what your opinion is as to the best methodological approach to those. I mean, you, you spoke about the area around the estate and, and on the other side as well, but what is the better methodological approach to analyze those regions? Because clearly, national historiography is not sufficient, okay? So is this is going beyond this? I mean, what, what is your take with regard to approaching them? Because they cannot be appended to the national narrative about this one. And for, for Lobo, when I was, Listening to your paper, I was reading in my I was reading it in my own terms. So you know, forgive me for saying this. These people were basically translating directives from the top and refracting them through the local experience in that respect. Uh, do you? I mean, do you see them as going? I mean, your notion of surplus here. Do they go? Do they become heretics of their own creed? Or do, they, or do they reproduce their own ide you know, ideologies by taking all those things? Mm -hmm. I go first? Okay. I don't think there is one, the, the approach or the methodology to study, I mean, borderland, because it's, I mean, it's more a kind of, uh, rather than a methodology, I will speak about a new perspective, or rather, because it's, it depends on what you are studying, and then, so, of course, you apply different methodologies to this. Uh, to this to this research is I would say it's, we need a more uh, kind of okay, this, this, a transnational approach which it's it could be very much a general idea but this this is what it is I mean it's not a, a specific methodology I mean we are trying to to, to put in a box transnational transnationalism already since 20 years maybe and to, there's not a one concrete, a specific methodology. It's more a way of doing research, I would say, more than just a specific methodology. So it's looking at uh, in a broader perspective from different angles, and then it depends on on the on the um, uh, on the question that you are trying to analyze. If, in my in my case, I would say. Um, Combining both the, the macro and the micro that was just mentioned in in Lowell's case is a very uh, is a very useful 
uh, approach. So uh, this, what I really try to do, to do is we're just mentioning uh, colleagues doing this micro uh, micro uh, studies with some um, general uh, regions of uh, what the question is, what generative question is mentioning the Felici Cataluza and all these uh, general historians with others who as uh, investigators, for example, uh, Nunez Seixas, who is working on the specific question, nationalism and ethnic minorities and fascism. So, and this approach of micro and macro, I think, in, in this perspective is, is very much, I mean, useful together with this transnational approach. Super great question. Something that I'm, I'm struggling with myself to determine, are they more close to the original or is this a variation? And uh, first, I think it's much more close to the original, what the ideology says. And we could even say that citizens in this regard, even taking these anti-Semitic protests, are actually holding the government accountable to their own promise. Which, which might sound, seem weird, but it, it really is the case. And this is not the only such case. There are anonymous petitions written to the main ministries in the end of, half of ordinary citizens saying, you introduced these race laws, you said that Jewish stores should be marked, that Jews are going to disappear. You know, 12 months have passed. <laughs> well, you know, what are you waiting for, right? So, so, so this is showing a certain kind of interaction between the macro level, you could want to say genocidal architects and the ideologies they emit, and then whether we can factor in a whole set of different motives, such as some sort of a desire for Jewish uh, property, upward social mobility, uh, uh, some kind of uh, conformism, how quickly people, people can adapt to new ideas which they didn't have because there was not an overabundance of anti-Semitism in Yugoslavia. And this makes, makes it a very interesting case for comparison. Even the Ustasha movement itself was not very anti-Semitic until the second half of the 1930s. So we have a case of a movement which I analyzed with Russian newspapers, never mentioned a Jew until 1935 in their publications. And then in a matter of six years, from 1935 to 1941, it becomes one of the most radical anti-Semitic movements. Right? So this is a very interesting research question, especially, especially if we juxtapose it to the Italian case, where it, the Italian fascists go through a very similar process. No anti-Semitism, adoption of anti-Semitic uh, uh, laws, legislation entering the propaganda. But then in 1941, we have pretty different outcomes. Mass deportations of Jews start in the independent state of Croatia in May 1941, before Operation Barbarossa, which we very generally take as the beginning of the decision-making regarding the final solution. So these are really interesting questions from the case. But returning to the question, is Yustasha ideology very clearly says, and in, in its propaganda from the 1930s up until 1940s, and there are very clear continuity of the xenophobic attitude that only Croats by blood, and that's all quote, can govern in Croatia. So the fact that these guys have quarrels with Hungarians and, and Nazis is more original to the po political thought of the, of, the, of, the, of the Ustasha ideology than is the compromise with the local folks Deutsche. Right? So uh, I think that they're not heretics. <laughs> they see themselves as the original, the purists, the original believers, right? I hope I answered it. Okay, uh, thanks for uh, the questions and also for the answers. I think we have had a great panel. Thank you for all the uh, presenters. And now it's really time to go and get some, some lunch. Yeah, right. Thank you. Thank you. Dear colleagues, uh, we are just starting um, the third panel. Unfortunately, our colleague, Bojan Dimitrievich from the Institute of Contemporary History from Belgrade, he's out. I don't know if he should be here with us, even via Zoom, but there is no response from him today. So I hope, really, sincerely, that everything is okay with him. Maybe, maybe he's uh, joining a little bit later. I don't know. So let's start with the second uh, speaker of this third panel, Dr. Dr. Uh, Igor Gardina. Uh, 
researcher, well-known histor Slovenian historian, uh, researcher at the Academy of Science in Ljubljana. And uh, he's going to speak uh, about a very, very interesting story. So, about so-called Slovenian fascist. So, did, the question would be, did the fascism exist in Slovenian territory before the Second World War? So, colleague Igor, Dr. Igor Rudina, the floor is yours. Dear colleagues, Slovenes in the literal who after the First World War either expected the Italian occupation to be temporary or some sort of substitution of the Habsburg Emperor with a new Italian king as a supreme guardian of benevolently composed and enacted laws were in for a shock after the arson of Slovenian National Hall in Trieste on 13 of July 1920. From their point of view, civilization was replaced by a new form of barbarism, which also employed in its manifestation all instruments of cultural and technical progress. No later than the induction of Gentile school reform, it was clear to every Slovene behind the border of Rapallo that the future upon the, which the Italian state had embarked would not tolerate natives of other origins. This was not limited to the public sphere. On one hand, this realization resulted in expedited assimilation, and on the other, in resistance ranging from armed assaults to the less extreme practice of local appropriation of the name of the fascist movement, its adherents were labeled snopari, which was a type of ironic Sloweniaized counterattack on Italianization. In the eyes of the country's majority nation, the authorities succeeded in framing assimilation as inevitable and self-evident. This process was also undertaken, undertaken by those who generally did not display animosity in their personal dealings with the natives of other origins. For example, Pietro Sticotti, who was the director of the Municipal History and Art Museums in Trieste between 1920 and 1940, participated in the Italianization of last names and also names, even though he was not only considerate of his Slovenian relatives, but plain kind to them. Slovenes who resisted assimilation needed to exhibit a great deal of caution. This included conduct with their own homes, irrelevant of whether they worked in a liberal profession or in state or any kind of administration in Trieste, in towns. Even children were not taught their native language until they were old enough to comprehend what was at stake. Composer Pavle Mercou, from middle class family, you see, with family Chernigoy, uh, left a valuable testimony to this effect. First, he learned from his father. We are not Italians. This was followed up by the clarification that certain things which he cannot yet understand will be explained to him years from now. All this, of course, in Italian. But the son worked it out for himself when he noticed that some of his peers, who were members of the children's fascist organization Balila, 
were just miming during the compository chairing to the Duce. He only began learning Slovenian after his mother, who stemmed from an Italian Germanomanical family, decided it was, uh, it was time, which was practically simultaneously with ancient Greek. The later language was, of course, included in the high school's curriculum, while Mercou was getting acquainted with it at Scipio Slataper's sister, who was astonished with his view of his motherland, which he was tasked with framing in a school essay. This type of caution was entirely sensible, being that one of Mussolini's future ministers, Giuseppe Coboligili, who did not Italianize his Slovenian father, Nikolai's last name, Cobol, until 1928, found a place for those who wouldn't Italianize in one of the karst caves near Pazin. East of the Rapallo border, Slovenes responded to the challenges of fascism in a different manner. During the Italian Biennero, as it was becoming clear that Mussolini's power and influence were on the rise, the organization of Yugoslav nationalists, or Yuna, please, pretty fascist look, on the border on Montriglau, uh, Yugoslav uh, Italian border. Uh, was established in the kingdom of the Karjorjevici family. The arsenal of its means included violence, while it found allies in patron and patrons in Unitarian liberals. Meanwhile, the list of the, its enemies included fascists, its Chelniki and Chetashi, captains and company men, also wage armed combat across the western border of the Serbo-Croato-Slovenian state. Of course, they also counted numerous internal enemies, communists, separatists, federalists, and autonomists. The means they used against them were not unlike those they used against fascists. Even through the political constellation in the serbo croato slovenian kingdom and Italy were similar, Yugoslav nationalists also had a rather rich prior history within the Habsburg monarchy. Their efforts bore entirely different results. On 1st of June 1924, 800 members of Uriuna embarked on provocative march on the center uh, of the Zasawia called Bezin. They were even accompanied by a military brass band and won a victory against communist paramilitary formations, so-called proletarian, uh, proletarska akcijske cete, proletarian action companies. However, the ruthless clash, which incurred casualties, turned the tide of public opinion against the Chelniki and Chetashi. Through the liberally oriented authorities exerted pleasure, uh, pressure and held a trial in Celia against those who stood against the armed Unitarians, the public opinion saw the later as the true instigator of the bloodshed. Oriona did not fare any better on 1st of February 1925, when it attempted to disperse Slovenian national leader autonomist Anton Koroshet's electoral campaign rally. His local Catholic peacekeepers were lying in wait, ready for the Chelnik and Chetashi, who otherwise never missed the chance to pose with weapons and pounced on them with great vigor. Thereafter, the Catholic Party won their first term in Parliament in Loblana's firm Liberal Stronghold. So, counterproductive. 
uh, Unitarianism, uh, fascism, this first wave of Yugoslav fascism. During the period of communist Yugoslavia, Uryuna was considered an undoubtedly fascist organization. However, this designation is not entirely fitting. Anti-fascist with fascists uh, uh, um, uh, with fascists uh, structure of organization with uh, means and so on. A nation whose vanguard it considered itself to be did not exist. This is also evidenced in the later fate of its powerful men. During the uh, Second World War, Dalmatia, native Ljubo Leontic, crossed over to the communist anti-fascist resistance led by, by Marshal Tito and later became his ambassador in London. Slovenian author Vladimir Leustik, uh, also outstanding translator of the classic of Russian realism and French and English literature, never considered to Yugoslav unitarianism. In his later novel titled Dejanje, uh, he unmasked the fascist cult of personality and its demonic influence. In his way, Leustik was a visionary. His book came out in 1934, which was before the fascist-backed assassins succeeded in murdering the Yugoslav king Alexander. The fact that his novel was translated into Czech in the year of Munich Agreement speaks to the topicality of his work by an author who was for a short time Oriuna's most eminent representative in Slovenia. The patron of the nationalist organization, Minister of the Interior, Svetozar Pribicevic, occasionally referred to by his opponents as the Yugoslav Mussolini, also took, uh, took an enigmatic turn. He ended his life as an ardent federalist. In the course of its struggles in the serbo croato slovenian state, even the aspects in which it approximated fascism, Oriuna never became anything more than a project. A mere pure design of political references obviously does not suffice for organization of this type. Perhaps it is precisely the example of Uriuna that demonstrates that fascism was not a secular or indeed any type of religion, but rather a movement which combined a utopian quantity, a required ingredient of any political grouping with reasoning in which some people saw a promising interpretation of reality on a historical axis, as well as in their time. The question of Slovenian fascists, therefore, possess itself entirely in isolation. Due to their Yugoslav, Yugoslav unitarianism, adherents of Uriuna cannot be counted as fascists in the strict sense of the word. In one way or another, Slovenian fascists had to alter their primary identity, exchange it, elsewhere they could only gradually increase. This was anecdotically demonstrated already at Branko Cousins and Adolf Hitler's uh, 1921 meeting in Munich. Cousins, a Slovenian national socialist, his party was comparable to the leftist liberal Czech grouping which counted Edward Benesch among its members, reproached the then future 
German Führer for accepting money from capitalists, even Jewish capitalists. His host replied that morality had no place in politics. This was in keeping with Mussolini's relativism and faith in the instinctual, both of which were directed against the observance of the usual models of conduct and thereby against predictability. But Slovenian National Socialists found this unacceptable. They were Democrats and advocated parliamentarism. Due to the terror adherents of Mussolini movement imparted on Slovenia beyond the Rapallo border, there was no place among them for snoperstvo even during the time of the formation of the fascist international. Only Salazar's Estado, Estado Novo garnered some interest among a part of the Catholic community through it would be impossible for it to serve as any kind of example in the religiously diverse Yugoslav kingdom without profound adaptation. At the time, uh, proponents of Slovenian independence were still few. What enthusiasm for Portugal there was, was surely intended to conceal the flirtation glasses towards the ideals of the political and economic order of the modern age corporatist stations such as Dolfus Shushnik Austria. Due to historic reasons, the latter could not be publicly adopted as any kind of example. In the period of the internationalization of fascism, individuals, radicals, and throughout with the total reconstruction of reality, preferred Germany and National Socialism to Italy and its fascist model. They included Danilo Gregoric, the grandson, the grandson of one of the founders of Liberal Edinost, the Central Slovenian Association in Trieste. After the First World War, he and his family moved first to Ljubljana and then to Belgrade, where his father Cvetko was a valid senior official and economist. Initially, Danilo Gregoric was captivated by leftist radicalism and later by Nazi Germany. He even sent Hitler his dissertation on the economic order of the Third Reich published in book form, which he had uh, so uh, successfully defended at uh, the University of Belgrade in 1936. Führer's office even sent him a letter of gratitude. Gregoric ardently supported Milan Stojadinovic's government, which was moving away from France alliance and its successor, the neutralist ministerial company under Dragisha Cvetkovic. Sredinovic was some kind of duce, but without apparatus of duce. After the tour in, the, in relations between Yugoslavia and Italy, which followed the march 1937 agreement, he wrote a book sympathetic of Italian fascist corporatism. By the time of its publication in 1940, its author was already the editor and manager of Yugoslavia for most pro-government journal Vreme. Due to his connections with the German Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Prime Minister Zvetkovic also used him for secret assignments with the heads of the Third Reich. As representative of the previous government, Grigoric was imprisoned during the pro-British Cup on 27th of March 1941. This picture took uh, two days before. And you see, Gregoric with Adolf Hitler. 
and then conscripted. After Yugoslavia military defeat, neither the occupying forces nor Milan Nedic's government were interested in reinstating him as he had no standing with the public and no influence to speak of. Still, after World War, uh, Second World War, he was convicted by the Communist court for acting in the interest of the Axis powers and died in prison. Thank you. Many thanks to dear colleague, Dr. Igor Verdina, for his uh, very interesting presentation. We heard, already heard something new about uh, fascist attempts among Slovenians. And now we have uh, some unique uh, presentation made by both uh, my both colleagues from Study Center of National Reconciliation. So, uh, the, the question could be, a case of Slovenian clerical fascism. Did uh, something like that uh, exist in uh, Slovenian history between two wars? So, uh, the topic will, will be um, presented on the case of political orientation among the so-called strajarie or guards movement, very, very popular among um, Slovenian students between two wars. The paper or the presentation will be present uh, by um, Matic Batic and uh, Dr. Matic Batic and Dr. Tomasz Ilšić. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, our paper today deals with a group of Slovene Catholic students from the 1930s called Strajari. Uh, Strajari is a Slovene word that can be translated as guards in English. And for easy representation of our argument, we will use the Slovene word from now on. But at the very beginning, we need to devote a few words to the political situation and the state of political mm -hmm. Catholicism in the interwar Slovenia which was shaped by wider European social and ideological trends. We want to emphasize that not only the general situation, but also the situation in the Catholic camp has to be understood in wider transnational context where new ideas, cultural sensibilities, etc., derived from. The transnational dimension was especially pro pronounced for the Catholics at the time due to the inherent transnational character of the Catholic Church and due to the great importance of the Papal Magisterium for the Catholic political and intellectual life at that time. The European political history during the 1930s was characterized by increasing political polarization and the demise of liberal democratic political order, which was most pronounced in Central and Southeast Europe. The same political polarization likewise strongly influenced the development in Slovenia, at least those parts incorporated into the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, as there was growing differentiation and fragmentation even among various currents in the same ideological camps. The Catholic political movement since the beginning of the 20th century, the dominant political power in Slovenia, thus experienced a gradual split into left and right wing camps, the former adopting Christian socialism, the latter arguing an adaptation of a corporatist socio-political order. The intellectual vanguard of the Catholic right in Slovenia were the Catholic students at the University of Ljubljana, which joined the group called Strajari under the spiritual direction of Lambert Erlich, a Catholic priest and university professor. Many existing historical works on this period of Slovene history have already dealt with this group and its political orientation. However, the so far existing historical research on this phenomenon has been modest and methodologically deficient. Strajari are thus often characterized as being Slovene clero fascists. In socialist times, this characterization was often indiscriminately used in order to discredit political opponents of communism by blurring the distinction between anti-communist Catholics, conservatives and fascists. Since the independence of Slovenia, historians have not conducted a lot of new, of new research on this topic, so that the image of Strajari has remained mostly superficial. 
In some of the new existing works, they are accused of ideological similarities with fascism, of approaching Nazi-like biological racism, etc. However, this prevalent characterization is not based on thorough analysis of their writings or political positions without selective quotations. Furthermore, the research on this topic has not yet utilized modern analytical concepts of various scholars who have studied the European radical right in the interwar period. But as Michael Frieden said, we have to put political concepts such as democracy, liberalism or corporativism in a wider historical, geographical and political framework in order to understand them as they were understood by contemporaries. Our analysis is therefore focused on the political positions taken by Strajari, which we mainly infer from the writings in their journal Straja Vihario, meaning a guard in the storm. Based on these findings, we will then compare their political program with the main ideological premises of fascism, as synthesized by the most important referential studies on this topic. On this basis, we will place them in the context of European radical right at that time. The Strajari were a group of Catholic students from the University of Ljubljana that began gathering under the spiritual direction of Lambert Erlich, a Catholic priest and professor at the theological faculty of the University of Ljubljana. The group was established in spring 1932 as a result of tense situation in the Catholic Academic Association, which was divided between Christian socialist and righty students. Strajari began to publish a paper called Straja Vihariu, which was meant to be an answer to the expert informative paper of the university called The Voice of Academia, or Akademski Glas, which was in the eyes of the guards, run as a hidden instrument of the Marxists. First guidelines on their political program were given to students Cyril Jebot and Franz Zassar, two leading members of the group, by Anton Koroshets, an undisputed leader of the main Slovene Catholic political party, the Slovene People's Party, in summer 1934, with the latter, when, when the latter was interned at the Iceland of War. These programmatic points can rightly be described as a basic political orientation of Strajari throughout their existence. In the program, Koroshets outlined the following main points. The fight against communism, fascism and capitalism, as well as the need to develop a corporativist system following the con contours set in the papal uh, pe encyclic Quadragesimo Anno. Further, he emphasized the fight for the protection of Slovene lands against foreign influences. A special point was also made on social justice. The core of their ideological profile can be traced in the first issues of the newspaper Guard in the Storm. Their writings were characterized by contempt against Marxism, communism and the Soviet Union, but also against socialism, liberalism, individualism and parliamentary democracy. Strangari instead idealized the self-government system of medieval cities and declined so-called false prophets who offered a materialized understanding of the world, moving people away from the Christ. On this basis, Strajari regularly attacked all those features of the modern world which they deemed to be in contradiction with Catholic teachings. In order to ascertain their position within European radical right at that time, we will present their writings on corporativism, anti-Semitism, racism and fascism. Uh, so on corporativism. One of the main preoccupations of the political life in the 1930s was the economic question. Following the Great Wall Street crash of 1929, a severe economic depression engulfed the United States and Europe until the end of the decade. Correspondingly, free market capital economic order was rapidly losing supporters on both sides of the political spectrum. The same phenomenon also took hold in the Catholic camp in Slovenia, where left-leaning students and the intellectuals began to advocate Christian socialist views, deeply influenced by Marxism. As an alternative to Marxist economics, the conservative side began advocating for a corporativist restructuring of society. Their ideas were based on the encyclical Quadragesimo Anno by Pius XI, published in May 1931, which suggests corporatism as the ideal way of organizing economic life from a Catholic point of view. Catholic corporatism was meant to be a kind of middle road between capitalist free market and a communist planned economy. The Pope thus wrote, I quote, just as the unity of human society cannot be founded on the opposition of classes, so also the right ordering of economic life cannot be left to a free competition of forces. Far from this source, as from a 
poison spring have originated and spread all the errors of individualist economic teaching, end of quote. The encyclical seems to suggest that, corporati that corporatism, an organization of society by corporate groups such as agricultural, labor, military, business, scientific, or guild associations, is the preferred Catholic social, social order. However, while describing a just economic order in principle, the Pope left many details about a just corporatism from a Catholic point of view unexplained. As after praising corporatist experiments taking place, by which he, were, he was in all probability referring to fascist Italy, he expressed the fear, I quote, that the state, instead of confining itself as it ought to, to the furnishing of necessary and adequate assistance, is substituting itself for free activity, end of quote. This ambiguity in the papal encyclical left, on the one hand, a lot of free space for various political actors to present very different ideas as being in accord with the papal teaching. At the same time, it stimulated a lot of intellectual activity in Catholic groups searching for so-called right sort of corporatist order. As already pointed out, the papal magisterium played an immensely important role in the intellectual Catholic life in the 1930s. Strajari were in this regard especially keen followers of the papal teachings. Accordingly, they backed the papal endorsement of corporatism wholeheartedly and began analyzing European regimes in search for the real corporatism as a third way between capitalism and socialism. They paid a lot of attention to corporatist experiments developing in the 1930s Europe, especially the Estado Novo of Antonio de Oliveira Salazar and the neighboring Stindestat established by the Austrian councillor Engelbert Dolfus. Likewise, the corporatist system in Mussolini's Italy greatly intrigued them. Cyril Jabot, one of the leading members, went to Milan in the late 1930s to research fascist corporativism. Based on his research, he published a book in 1939 titled Corporative National Economy, in which he stated the totalitarian tendency of the Mussolini's regime. Strajari put great hopes into political developments in Austria and Portugal, hoping that real Christian corporativism will be built there, but were also disappointed due to the lack of self-government on a lower level. Their writings given an impression that they really hoped for an ideal corporatist synthesis of personal freedom in a Catholic sense and subordination to, com to, to communal interest. They advocated for self-government on a local or lower levels, as corporatist regimes in practice amounted to a tool of authoritarian or even totalitarian control, they were disappointed. I quote, a state is something, it's a lot, but it's not everything, before the group is the person's personality and family. Wider than a state is the church and the homeland, and for all estates there are various public and private institutions. Homeland in its essence, for example, is not a collection of estates, and the state therefore cannot be a cartel of corporations." End of quote. I will leave Matisse to continue. Thank you. So, thank you, Tomasz. The other big issue is, of course, anti-Semitism. Apart from corporatism, the other main issue, as I was just saying, on, uh, on which the previous historians working on this topic have identified a kind of similarity with fascism is, as I just said, anti-Semitism. Strajari were indeed strongly anti-Semitic and the criticism of supposed all-pervasive Jewish influence on the well-being of Slovene people and Europe in general is often mentioned and condemned in their newspaper Straža Viharion. For example, already in the second issue, the newspaper condemned some Slovene translated literary works through which the Slovene youth could read a lot of, I quote, Jewish bourgeois and Marxist origins, which is poisoning the healthy thinking of Slovene youth even before they are developed in the nation spirit. Jewish materialistic poison is with force tearing sprouts out of the nation's such uh, end of quote. Such sentiments were often expressed throughout the whole time span of its publication. For example, in 38, Straja brought an analysis of the presence of Jews in the Yugoslav public and economic life, in which it stated the supposedly ruinous influence of the Jews on public health by accusing them of having a leading role in the distribution of alcoholic drinks. However, as indeed repulsive the anti-Semitic discourse employ employed by the Strajari was, there were nevertheless important differences 
in comparison with Nazism and also Italian fascism since the racial laws. Their hate towards the Jews was based on two premises, both representing two pillars of old anti-Semitism, which was widely spread in Europe. The first reason was, of course, religious, as Jews were, I mean, were supposed to have, to have uh, denied and then crucified uh, Jesus Christ. The second reason was economic, as Jews were identified as capital holders, as propagators of individualistic capitalism and individualism. At the same time, after the rise of communism in the Soviet Union, they were also paradoxically identified with the communists. Accordingly, the anti-Semitism espoused by Srajari was not racially conditioned. In October of 38, Straja published an editorial discussing the question of modern anti-Semitism. The editorial drew attention on the novelty of modern anti-Semitism, which was based on ethnic and racial grounds. The hatred of the Nazis towards the Jews was said to be based on the fact that Jews are symbolically the carriers of transcendental religion and the idea of sinful fallen humanity. Jews were thus directly compared with Christians, and the article emphasized the kinship between both religions. I quote, from this national pride, we can understand that supporters of the blood religion and the racial theory simultaneously hate and persecute the Jews and Christians. Understandable. Both Judaism and Christianity are fundamentally opposed to their conception of pure racism and blood national nobility. They do not need grace and salvation. They say that they will redeem themselves and rise above all other unclean nations." End of quote. Even more, oh, sorry. Even more generally, Strajari were often critical about racist ideology and critically described the conditions in Nazi Germany. N Nazism was understood to be a form of modern <coughs> paganism and thus completely in in incompatible with Christianity. As the Hitler's regime began to prosecute the church, Straja began publishing reports describing the conditions of Christians in Germany. I quote, another manifestation of modern paganism is the worship of one's own race, racism or national socialism as it appears in Germany, end of quote. So, as it was already mentioned, the older Slovene historiography uh, clearly emphasizes the closeness between Catholic right and fascist ideology by using a syntagma of the so-called clerical fascism. However, as we have shown, there were indeed some similarities, but also profound differences between Strajari and fascism. They might have used some of the same concepts, for example, corporatism, but the understanding of them was not the same. So the question naturally poses itself. Where should Strajari as the most paradigmatic example of Slovene Catholic right-wing politics in the interwar period then be situated on the political spectrum? We believe that it does not make much explanatory sense to describe the political field of inter Europe merely in schematic binary terms. Instead, every political ideology should be analyzed from the point of view of its genealogy, worldview, and politics. In this way, it's possible to see their commonalities as well as differences. On this basis, it's also possible to create a kind of more or less convincing taxonomy of European political spectrum, as some of the scholars have already done. So in order to analyze European radical right politics in the interwar era, we find especially useful Stanley, Stanley Payne's model of division between fascism, radical right, and tra traditionalist or conservative right, which seems to explain the political positions of Strajari and their differences with fascism very well. Likewise, Roger Griffin's thesis on fascism as a form of po political modernism can also be applied quite convincingly, as Strajari were definitely strongly anti-modern. From this point of view, it's untenable, uh, it's untenable to merely characterized Straja as being fascist, even though there were some common viewpoints between their ideology and fascist movements, especially in opposing Marxism and liberalism, 
The differences were likewise very important, not only regarding concrete political goals, but also in worldview. In this regard, fascism was based on secular form of neo-idealist philosophy, vitalism, and social Darwinism. Therefore, the concept of palingenetic national rebirth, which also marked the political efforts of the Catholic right in this period, at least in Slovenia, of course, was significantly different from the fascist one. If the former aspired to the re-Christianization of society, fascism aspired to the creation of a reborn new man, free, free from any constraints of traditional morality. Accordingly, important differences also existed in the field of political goals. The, the social concepts of the Catholic right strove to preserve the status quo or even to bring society back to the past. The social structure of the society should not change and the masses should be politically demobilized. At the same time, the leading role of Christianity should be re-established in society. On the contrary, fascism, fascism at least in t t theory, demanded a radical social transformation and the mobilization of masses in a new form of total political community, which left no room for any autonomy of civil society, included to religious communities. This is, we believe, the reason why the Catholic right in this time period needs to be researched through the lenses of anti-modernism, but also why it makes sense to differentiate between different forms of, let's say, authoritarian rightism. The conservative right in Slovenia was fueled by their contempt towards the modern world, the French Revolution, and everything that came after it. Among those novel novelties, they also co considered fascism to be one of them, especially in its Nazi form, as well, of course, as racism. And we, I would like to, to conclude this, this paper with perhaps a bit longer quote from one of the articles published by Thierry Jabot in March 1940. So, let us sum up once more. The hellish spirit and the satanic character of the French Revolution, for which the schism, renaissance, the pseudo-reformation and the encyclopedists had prepared the way, in which is the mother of all the an anomalies of the 19th and 20th centuries, individualism, liberalism, democracy, parliamentarians, League of Nations, socialism, Bolshevism, fascism, Nazism, Nazism and racism. Thank you very much. Thanks to uh, Matiz and Tomas. In meantime, uh, there is still no voice uh, from our colleague uh, Bojan Dimitrievich from Belgrade. So I have, I have to, or I can open the debate. We have still 15 minutes to ask some question, to add something to these uh, last two presentations before our coffee break, the last one for today. So if somebody, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Matisse and Tomas. Uh, you made some very interesting points, so thank you for, for your presentation. I have this question about the clerical fascism. In, uh, in Slovakia, uh, the Marxist historiography termed the Slovak state as a clerical fascism because it was easy to put Catholics and fascists together, like this is our, our enemies. But since the, the, the fall of the wall and you know the, the third, three decades of the free research, uh, there, were, there was a, on the, and there is an ongoing debate on clerical fascism. What it is? There are plenty of definitions, and we can't really agree on any of them. There's no consensus. And uh, so, my question is: How, how would you de define clerical fascism? What, what do you mean when you when you say clerical fascism? What would be your definition? Thank you. Well, if I may. Uh... This was basically not really the topic of yeah. our paper, so to say. So it's hard for me to um, to say. Um, as far as I know, there were indeed some Catholics, first in Italy, which kind of really embraced uh, fascism, not only tactically but also ideologically. And um, as far as I know, uh, there is, I mean, 
I'm not an expert of Slovakia, I have to admit, but really the position taken by Tiso's re regimes was, was much more closely aligned with some of the basic tenets of fascist ideology. So I'm sure you okay. can okay. tell it, uh, more about it, but perhaps uh, this uh, can be can be then uh, described as a, as a kind of, indeed, a kind of clerical fascism, perhaps, if we kind of, uh, you know, have to deal with real infusion of kind of heretical Christianity and fascism. For example, the Iron Guard in Romania would be perhaps the most Obvious case. Yeah, in the obvious case. Yeah, but this, when I saw the studies in Slovakia, they, they, they were priests, they, they went from positions of radical Catholicism, right wing, and they tried to do to make some sort of a fusion between Catholicism and uh, fascism, but they couldn't do it. They, it. It didn't make sense. At the end, at the end uh, they ended up as fascist. The, the ideology was fascist. So uh, there was a real problem to define the clerical fascism. Where, 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 where is it? In the, when, at what point? They became clerical fascists. Yeah. Uh, we couldn't find anything in their ideology, so they were either started as radical right and then changed their ideology to, to really fascism. They couldn't make a fusion between the Catholicism and fascism because it doesn't really make sense. So uh, I know it's a really hard question. Uh, I, I said that there's no, no, three, three decades of debate about this. I agree completely. I mean, if we are having such, uh, let's say, attempts of kind of fusing both. Then I think we can really uh, talk about the uh, kind of theoretical fascism, but in the long run it's untenable because yeah. both concepts are, in my opinion, completely. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm saying. What, what did your journal make of the Spanish Civil War? Was it, I mean, how did they have much commentary on and did they see it as a struggle between good and evil? My mm -hmm. Or should, should I uh, go ahead? So, uh, yeah, the Catholic country in Slovenia was also divided on the question of Spanish civil war. We have the Christian socialists, more, more um, most especially about what the, the leading example who were on the Republican side, whereas the rightists, uh, it's also the dark and the storm, they were clearly on the side of the uh, Trump. Uh, and was it an absolute dispute between good and evil? Is the question that I'm really asking you for the people from the journal. Well, I mean, I can't really say if they use this, this exact words, but, but more or less, yeah, because they were really influenced by the attacks on the church and the, by the Spanish Republic and so on, and uh, about the influence of communism in, in Spain and uh, if communists were, I mean, in the midst there, it was for them definitely completely even and uh, you can't make any, any uh, let's say, uh, yeah, concessions. Too. But so in Italy, we had a strong debate uh, about um, uh, clerical fascism, uh, um, a Catholic fascist mm -hmm. is a different mm -hmm. Catholic fascism, clerical fascism, or Catholic nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the main scholar who did uh, this uh, matter was, uh, I don't know if he's, <laughs> he's uh, Renato Moro, do you know? And uh, because uh, his book are not very uh, translated in, in, in English. And uh, the, for Italy, the, the, in the conceptualization uh, is uh, uh, fascist ca Catholics, uh, it's clear that they, they are fascist, but uh, they are also believers, uh, etc. Uh, the clerical uh, fascist, clerical fascism, uh, um, uh, is a, a definition uh, uh, in, in which uh, the um, uh, emphasis is uh, put uh, on the reciprocal uh, instrumentalization. Uh, huh? So they are Catholics uh, that uh, see in uh, fascism the opportunity to um, um, transform Italy in a real Catholic nation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, are, they are not in their mind uh, 
uh, their minds fascist, but they see in fascism uh, a medium, a tool to transform Italy in the real Catholic nation. And um, similar to this um, um, position uh, is, the, is uh, that of uh, national Catholicism, national Catholicism, uh, because uh, in, with this expression, the um, accent is put on the national project. Mm -hmm. And inside this uh, definition, the fascism uh, is, uh, uh, again, uh, a tool, a tool uh, for the Catholicization of Italy. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't know if we, these are the terms uh, of the discussion uh, in, in Italy about this work. Uh, we have another 10 minutes. If I could uh, add something, uh, and the first represented paper of our colleague uh, Igor Gardina, the so-called Slovenian fascists were mentioned. Even uh, among Slovenian and even Croats in Istria uh, between two wars, it means uh, under fascist regime, there were some attempts to establish so-called Slovenian fascist party you know something, Bort? Mm -hmm. So uh, in 22, some months before uh, March to Rome, in the mid-22, in Gorica, Gorizia, now on the border between Slovenia and Italy, a so-called Slovenian governmental party or Slovenska Vladna Stranka was established by local Slovenians who embraced fascist regime. And maybe most important uh, Slovenian fascist, he proudly declared himself as Slovenian fascist, was Vincenz, Vincenz Bandel, Italian, 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 with his name with uh, Vincenzo Bandeli, former Austro-Hungarian teacher, who was an interpreter, co-founder of that uh, Slovenian governmental party, and he even established a newspaper, a weekly newspaper, called Era Nuova, Nova Doba. It was bilingual, Slovenian and Italian. It was still possible in the time in Italy. And um, he declared uh, himself to be a proud uh, Slovenian fascist. And the uh, underline of that uh, weekly newspaper uh, Era Nuova, Vita Nuova was the echo of Slovenian fascists. So official name in that time. It was only an attempt. Uh, it uh, listed only one hour and a half until mid-23, but still an attempt. So another, something else, another 15, uh, 10 minutes until the break we have and then the last break and then the fourth panel. Perhaps like to add, perhaps coming back to Professor Alice's uh, great paper from the, from the uh, morning. Uh, I certainly agree that the taxonomy is not easy. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very complicated and of course a lot, I mean, a kind of personal interpretation, so certainly different interpretations are possible, but um, if we deal with concepts, these concepts have to be kind of based in reality. I mean, on their real political program and on the politics, on the worldview, on, on genealogy, and so on and so on. And if we kind of abandon this attempt at taxonomy, then we are left, you know, only with kind of words, right? I mean, who has, who can, who can speak better and so on and so on. So it, 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 everything becomes kind of a power play, in my, in my uh, opinion. So, for, for this reason, I will still argue for the use of taxonomy, at least in our, in, in Slovenian case. Come on, let's say something in, just a quick, quick response. Of course. Okay. Yeah. And I, have, and, uh, I was being a little bit provocative, of course, but what I would say with regard to this, because I noticed that in your paper, you, you posed that question as well, about you know, where, where do we uh, touch on this? When we say, when we make a statement such as, and I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about everyone, okay? Um, this movement has a lot of similarities with fascism, but it's also different. 
To me, that's a universal uh, statement. It applies to everything. It, it even applies to, to, to Italian fascism. If you compare Italian fascism in 1922 to 1924 to 26 to 29 and everything. So I appreciate the need to make conceptual differences and I appreciate so a sort of lab of laboratory of clean concepts. And I appreciate the need to look at reality with the, with the uh, use of those concepts. I suppose what I'm saying is sometimes we expend a lot of intellectual effort on an, an agony on whether something is or is not, mm -hmm. when, number one, I would say it matters, but it doesn't matter as much as we make it sound. Number two, because it is a shifting sand, you know, the, the whole landscape of what fascism is, or what Italian fascism is, or what, whatever fascism is. So in that respect, I would say that taxonomies are useful, but only to an extent. And not, I think we have expended a lot of time and effort. And there are perceptual models, right? I mean, they are not reality itself, they are models of reality. So, yeah, in this, I mean, in this way, I know. I mean, we. I think we basically have agreed. Right? I think there is, there is one. Yeah. If I might, may. I mean, this is a very interesting debate that I think is very useful for everyone. So I, I want to keep keep up with it. But I think uh, uh, in your presentation, uh, for me personally, racism uh, in sort of differentiating whether it is fascist or not is not such a useful concept because we don't really use it so much in, in definitions and differentiation. There are fascists, fascists don't necessarily have to be racist, and there are racists who don't have to be necessarily fascist, right? So it's, it's not a necessary ingredient for a definition whether something is fascist or not, but something that could be very useful that you mentioned, and that I think hits, hits the nail on the head, is the difference between mobilizing or demobilizing the political body, right? Yeah, this is no. one of the things. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. That's one, what I want to tell you. Keep, I would keep up with this because I think that this is really a profound difference between authoritarian right yeah. and sort of the, the totalitarian right, which could be said that it's fascism, right? Uh, whether there is complete mobilization, this is like Juan Linz's idea, you know? There is an authoritarian guy who comes out with a gun and asks you, are you against me? And if you, if you don't have a political opinion, you're fine. There is a fascist guy who comes out with a gun and says, you have to prove that you are for me and that I don't shoot you. And this is sort of a difference in a very reduced way. But I also think that it would be really useful to, like Roger Griffin has worked on this quite, quite recently and Casamuda as well from Political Science and Populism, to see these conceptual differences between radical right and extreme right. This is something that's very much within the political science right now because we're trying to figure out uh, whether populism, for example, is belonging into the radical right in certain cases or to the extreme right. And the difference is sort of whether the radical right would still kind of accept the system in which we operate, right? They would accept kind of democracy, maybe even they would demolish certain rights uh, and so on, but they kind of operate within the system, while the extreme right would be the revolutionary right, mm -hmm. which would kind of completely demolish the entire system and say openly we are anti-democratic, we are anti-liberal, we want to demolish all the institutions and completely radically reform the political system as such, right? So I think that just, just in conceptual terms, this could potentially be useful to see the evolution of, of, uh, of the movement, just mm -hmm. an idea. So, I, mean, uh, I completely agree with your first point about mobilization and demobilization, um, but about the second, I mean, this conceptual model of radical versus extreme right, where do you see a big improvement over the model that already Fanny and others have proposed about, uh, about uh, radical right, uh, conservative right, and, and fashion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, this is a model which is right now being also used in political science in, in general. So you can okay. just address it, not necessarily completely for fascism studies, even though, like Griffin in his relatively recent papers, is, is really developments on, on this thought quite extensively. So he's basically adopting Kasmuld as, as a kind of a model of reinterpretation of that. So I think that the, the, the difference between the two is quite clear cut 
it's not mudded, you know, in, it, there's no kind of very big fluidity. Do they accept the political system or they do not accept the political system in a way? I simplified it a little bit, but there is no confusion there, right? Whether someone says we need to annihilate the current moral and political system and bring something completely new to the game, mm -hmm. or we accept it under a different kind of standards, some things have to be reformed, they have to evolve, and uh, harmful influences have to be removed, but do they, in a way, accept the system that exists? And this would kind of be uh, a, a kind of definitional difference mm -hmm. between the two. So, I mean, for example, I see a lot of similarities with something that I was studying. There is a very strong radical Catholic movement within Croatia in the early 1930s, Križari and so on. Mm -hmm. and, and when you track their evolution, there's something we were talking about earlier, something happens during the Spanish Civil War, and something really profound happens. Uh, and and anti-Semitism really plays a key role here because it becomes a cultural code to denote a lot of other political things. So some can, someone could be anti-Semitic in 1930s in a profoundly different way than they were anti-Semitic in 1937, 1938, because with the Spanish Civil War, there is this idea of labeling different terms in conjunction, right? It would be very difficult to be anti-Semitic in 1938 in Croatia, for example, so I don't know how replicable this is to other cases, and be pro-democratic and pro-liberal. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of forced, if you accept one model, that's why it's a cultural cult, because it denotes a lot of other political concepts which you have to adapt, you would kind of be forced logically to accept anti-democratic, anti-liberal, anti-communist, uh, which was coded into free, anti Freemasonry, for example, was coded word for democracy and liberalism. And, and this is something that really happens with this media blitz because everyone's reading about this war on a daily basis, the way we read about Ukraine today, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and this creates a very profound influence on, on all European societies, in, in my view, or at least I see it very clearly in my case. And this is a turning point where I see that a lot of these radical Catholic intellectuals are really starting to abandon their Catholicism, and they start to turn much more towards fascism, right? So they start as radical intellectuals, mm -hmm but they transform themselves into pure fascists, right? Because we have the same debate, right, from the communist historiography. Are, is the, are the Ustasha's clerical fascists or not, right? And, and this is what we discussed. I, I, for example, think that because you have a lot of priests in the Ustasha movement, through evidence, this doesn't mean that there is a Catholicization of the Ustasha movement, but there is a Ustashization of the clergy, which is an upside down model from what exists in the term. Sorry, this is a very long monologue. <laughs> I think this is a very a big difference between Croatia and Slovenia. We cannot talk about uh, fascization of uh, Slovene clergy, I think. And uh, uh, Stajari, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put him on this, this part at all, because they. Uh, Express his values uh, were against fascism, Nazism, and even uh, when uh, Austria was uh, uh, after an exhibition of Austria Anschluss, uh, the uh, Stragari were were the ones who uh, uh, criticized that the most in Slovenia actually. It was a constant not to, in the newspapers, not to write too much about, about Germany and not to criticize it, but the Strajari, they did. So there is a big difference, I think. Yeah, we have also identified some other differences uh, with oh, yes, uh, the Croatian. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, I mean, as far as I know, that uh, Krijari in the late 1930s stopped using the word Yugoslavia at all. And that's why they are in favor of the to favor of to welcome the new state. While even though, as we saw, one of the main ideas is Rajari, they would still think of Yugoslavia as the best choice for Slovenes to survive. So in this way, kind of loyal to the state. Uh, but I just wanted to add at the very good beginning that you said 
the, the point of <coughs> having um, this shortcut right? is in, in, in our paper wasn't on uh, correspondence with the fascism. It was just to point out that their anti-Semitism was not racial. Mm -hmm. It was really uh, so uh, religious and mm. economic. Thanks to everybody, thanks to all the speakers, and uh, we have just uh, earned our break uh, until uh, 3 or 15.30, it means 10 minutes, and then the last uh, panel will start. Enjoy your coffee. Okay, thank you. So, first of all, uh, I'm very sorry that uh, I was not able to for, to participate in person, it was precluded by illness, but still at the same time very grateful that nevertheless I can uh, do my presentation via Zoom. So um, let me just share the screen with you. Okay, so I will say something about the Austrian case example and let's uh, proceed not to lose time. Criticizing the policies of the Portuguese Prime Minister Salazar, Rolao Preto, the leader of the fascist national syndicalist movement in 1939 also raised sharp critique against the then already defunct Austrian regime of chancellors Engelbert Adolphus and Kurt von Schuschnigg. Using it as an example of, of a sham fascist regime distinguished by militias corporations, youth organizations, as well as one single party, all, however, being just substitutes for the real thing. Uh, he stated that Dolfus and Shushnik did not succeed in mobilizing the masses and were unable to create a true fascist regime simply because they were not truly fascists. As Preto stressed, revolution can only be made with revolutionaries and fascism has only been realized by fascists. Whereas Shushnik, skeptical about the very ideas he is advocating, according to Preto, represented, I quote, the perfect negation, the total negation of a fascist leader. Um, oh, uh, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, I, I, I realized that uh, the this, this screen has not been shared properly. So now, now you see it, I, hopefully. So I hope uh, now the screen, uh, the screen is visible. Okay, I'm sorry for this uh, technical problem. So um, I, gave, I gave this uh, example of Rolao Preto. Basically, we have a fascist criticizing regimes, which themselves have commonly been and are still referred to as fascists, especially in broader public discourse. Now, emphasizing the difference between the Portuguese Stado Novo and the Austrian Catholic Ständestadt on one side, and what he perceived to be the true fascism on the other, Preto, whose own movement has, had by then already been outlawed, however, also touched upon an issue that is still being heavily debated. While in modern scholarship, there exists a general agreement concerning the variety of interwar right-wing authoritarianisms in Europe, and the ined inadequacy of subsuming all of them under a single analytical category, for instance, fascism, the question which of them may be treated as members of the fascist family and which not remains disputed, particularly since most of these regimes at some points did incorporate certain elements or at least trappings borrowed from Italian fascism or German national socialism. <clears throat> Um, now, in yeah, in my paper, I will try to approach this ambiguities by focusing on the Austrian example, and I will do this by a introducing the controversial term Austrofascism and its possible reference, and b by discussing some key characteristics of the regime that reigned Austria between 1933 and 1938, and referred to itself as the Ständestadt, corporative state. 
Here, I will offer a, pos a possible classification by using one of the established approaches in the modern studies of fascism. That is the one by Roger Griffin. But let me begin by saying something about the overall political context of interwar Austria. Founded on the ashes of a former multinational empire, the first Austrian Republic comprised its relatively small core remnant, still bearing its name and containing its capital city. In many ways, it was, however, a state that nobody wanted to quote the title of the Helmut Andich book. The majority of its political elites were skeptical about its capacity for independent survival and at the time supported the idea of Anschluss to Germany, something that was, however, forbidden by the great powers. Sharp political divisions, characteristic already for the pre-war era, continued to mark the interwar years. The double shock caused by war and the collapse of the old order, accompanied by economic troubles, political instabilities, and widely shared feelings of uncertainty, provided fertile grounds for their further radical radicalization. Through the 1920s, Austria was governed by the Catholic conservative Christian Social Party in coalition with the much weaker German nationalists. Its main competitor was the social democracy, which enjoyed similar rates of support, as you can see from the table, um, also controlling numerous important municipal governments, particularly that of the so-called Red Vienna. The political struggle thus ran primarily along the dividing line between the Bürgerlich and the Marxist forces, being also connected to high degrees of political militancy and violence, which reflected the prominence of paramilitary organizations, such as the Social Democratic Republican Defense Union on the one that you can see on the left side, and the more loose association of Heimwehr or Homeguard militias, enjoying both the Catholic and the nationalist support on the other side. You can see members of Heimwehr on the right side of the screen. <clears throat> now, let me say a couple of words now about the term Austrofascism. Firstly, it needs to be said that its meanings are highly contested. Within the post-World War II Austrian public discourses, its usage or non-usage for that matter, have been largely ideologically conditioned and it's even today largely linked to political positioning, being more prevalent on the left. This has to an extent transpired in the scholarship as well. Um, but regardless of these controversies, we may however agree with Gerhard Otz in his general observation that when applied by scholars, Austrofascism can refer to, I quote, three different fascist or pseudo-fascist phenomena <clears throat> on on two different levels of definition and at different points in time. Firstly, it can be used to refer to two distinct and mutually opposed movements that developed within increasingly volatile political environment of the late 1920s Austria, the National Socialists and the already mentioned Heimwehr. The Austro-German National Socialist tradition reached back into the pre-war time and was therefore originally not fascist. Standing on the radical fringe of the German nationalist camp, the National Socialists were throughout the 1920s weak and split into various factions. One of these was also the Austrian branch of the Hitlerite movement. Being mainly responsible for the movement's fascization, it by the end of the decade largely succeeded in pushing aside the other factions. Still weak, at the 1930 elections it attained 3% of votes, its power rose swiftly afterwards. And by 1933, it managed to absorb most of the nationalist camp, while also increasingly taking votes from both Christian socials and social democrats. Like its German counterpart, Austrian Nazism was marked by revolutionary rhetoric, including demands for radical social change and national rebirth, leadership principle, militant appearance and, prepare, and preparedness for violence, and an extreme type of nationalism that included racially based anti-Semitism and the pan-German orientation, two features which together with anti-clericalism had however been already characteristic for the entirety of German nationalism in Austria. And some of these traits were also characteristic for the other strain of indigenous Austrian fascism that developed within the framework of the far-right militancy of the Heimwehr, mainly those parts of it that stood ideologically closer to the Catholic and to the German nationalist camp. <clears throat> 
a highly complex, co complex subject. The Heimwehr may hardly be treated as fascist in its entirety, and especially not during its beginnings. The term Austrofascism may, however, well apply to those sections of the movement that in May of 1930 adopted the so called Kornelburger of Korne or Kornelburger 8, outlining a manifesto for regeneration, regenerating the homeland by means of setting up an authoritarian system based on leadership principle and organized along corporatist lines, and unleashing of a two pronged attack on the Marxist class war and liberal capitalist econ economics. In the same year, parts of them formed a party called Heimatblock, under the leadership of Ernst Rüdiger von Starrenberg, which received direct financial assistance from fascist Italy. And it needs to be mentioned that Starrenberg also originally introduced the term Austrofascism as a self-label. With Nazis, they shared militarism, the leadership principle, as well as the rhetoric of national polygenesis. On the other hand, the anti-socialist climate bloc was more conservative in social demands, more elitist, less openly anti-Semitic, even if attracting some support among Jews, and more favorable of Catholicism. The key difference, however, lay in the position towards independent Austrian statehood, where the two movements were diametrically opposed. At the same time, it should, however, also be noted that there were also intertwinements, numerous levels between the two forms of Austrian fascism, as well as considerable degrees of personal transfer at certain points in time. <clears throat> Treatment of these two movements, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, put this slide a little too early, of these two movements as two instances of Austrian fascism is largely uncontroversial. Most commonly, however, Austrofascism is being applied to the regime that was in place between 1933 and 1938 and they referred to itself as the Schenderstadt. Being commonplace, especially in broader public discourse, this usage involves considerably more controversy and has usually been linked to evaluating the actions of the chancellors, Dolfus and Schuschnigg. These actions took place within the settings of increasing political turmoil following the Nazi takeover of power in Germany. The inner instability has furthermore been conditioned by deep economic crisis, widespread discontent, continued struggle between the two main parties and increasingly violent Nazi activities. During the governmental crisis of 1932, the Christian socials were compelled to let Heimat block into the coalition, which in this way returned, retained a majority of one. In March of 1933, the government of Engelbert Dolfus evoked the 1917 War Economy Enabling Act, beginning to rule by decree and closing the parliament shortly thereafter. To counter the German pressure, it allied itself with Hungary and Italy. Bans were put on the National Socialist and Communist parties, as well as on all political gatherings. Freedoms of press, speech and strike were suspended, and social democrats, although not immediately outlawed, were put under increasing police pressure. In February of 1934, Street fights erupted within the Schutzbund and the Austrian security forces, joined by the Heimwehr. They included shelling of the Viennese working class housing complexes, resulting in numerous civilian casualties, and were followed by banning of the Social Democratic Party. Internment camps were set up for political opponents, such as one on the bottom right in Bolaslav. <clears throat> in May 1934, a new constitution was promulgated, establishing federal state of Austria as, I quote, social Christian German state founded upon states and under strong authoritarian leadership. Parliamentary democracy with us was thus also officially abolished. Both the executive and legislative powers were now concentrated in the hands of the chancellor, who was given the power to nominate members of the plan for corporate bodies. All political parties were forbidden and the Fatherland Front, established as a mass political movement, meant to direct all political participation and comprise all loyal Austrians. It was based on Führer Prinzip and its official leadership was entrusted to the Heimatblock leader Scharenberg. Chancellor Dolfus was assassinated during the Nazi coup attempt in July 1934. 
He was succeeded by a fellow Christian social politician, Kurt von Schuschnigg, who largely continued his authoritarian policies, but was in constant conflict with the Heimat bloc. In 1936, the latter was officially dissolved and integrated into the Fatherland Front, whose leadership was now taken over directly by Schuschnigg. The international political situation changed greatly during the same time as Mussolini and Hitler established better mutual relations. Austria lost the security previously provided by Italy and was put under direct German pressure. In July, Schuschnigg was forced to sign an agreement with Hitler, which led to toleration of national socialist activities in Austria. In turn, the Nazis began to infiltrate the Fatherland Front on a mass scale and Nazi-friendly politicians got appointed to minister posts. Schuschnigg nevertheless continued to follow the policy of Christian corporative state up to the German ultimatum, ultimatum in March 1938 that deposed him and concluded the era of the Schenderschaft. Now, <clears throat> as mentioned already, different verdicts exist concerning the character of the Schenderschaft regime and on whether it represented an instance of a fascist regime or not. Connected to this are also the choices in terms for characterizing the regime. Here, different authors have been putting the main emphasis on different aspects. While some, such as Emmerich Talosch or Florian Weininger, who advocate the use of the term Austrofascism, have stressed the fascist element, which beyond doubt was present, others have rather either emphasized the conservative, traditionalist, and backward looking nature of the Ständestadt or pointed at the central role that the chancellors, Dolfus and Schuschnigg played in the regime. While some, for instance, Thomas Simon, Helmut Vonaut, or Dieter Pinder, categorically reject both the fascist characterization and the term Austrofascism itself, others, such as Ernst Hanisch, who proposed the term authoritarian regime under a fascist disguise, have arised at nuanced definitions. <clears throat> Gerhard Botz, for instance, distinguish three different periods of the Ständestadt. The one of authoritarian semi-dictatorship between March 1933 and January 1934, of semi-fascist dictatorship from February 1934 to middle 1936, when a balance of power between authoritarianism and fascism existed, and a phase of effective defascization after 1936 when Heimwehr was neutralized. Ulrich Kluge, on the other hand, pointed into different direction and designated the regime during its final phase as representing an authoritarian bureaucratic state on a rudimentary corporatist basis in informal coalition with Austrian National Socialism. In the older Austrian historiography, Schuschnigg's rule has furthermore also been described as enlightened bureaucratic absolutism um, in Adam Wandruschka and centralist administrative state on corporatist basis these labels do tell us some, particularly their centeredness in the roles of the two chancellors. Great discrepancies existed, namely, between the official order of corporations and the actual realities of the regime where the real power stood in the hands of the chancellor and can perhaps with a greater degree of possibility be characterized as chancellorial dictatorship. The corporative system was, was moreover never, never truly set up. As by 1938, only two out of the four forcing in corporative bodies were established and remained dysfunctional. Haus der Geschichte Österreichs thus chose to use the neutral term Dolphus Schuschnigg dictatorship, whereas the modern historians Bertrand Michael Buchmann and Oliver Radkolb tend to use simply Dolphus Schuschnigg regime. <coughs> It is also quite uncertain whether the regime ever possessed a unified ideology. Its propaganda reflected an eclectic, eclectic mixture combining appeals to Catholicism and Catholic identity, Austrian state tradition, and also including some Habsburg symbolics, and German character linking to the memory of the Holy Roman Empire. All combined with the generally anti-modernist attitudes expressed through romanticist imagery propagating ideas about harmonious order of the pre-1789 era and rural life, as well as appeals to the papal encyclicals Rerum Novarum and Quadragesimo Anno. Despite mass rallies, youth organizations and similar, 
the official ideology did not seem to have a considerable impact on the lives of ordinary citizens. Which is also linked to the character of the Fatherland Front and the role it played. Although the assessments in scholarly literature range from those claiming that it was hardly more than the Christian Social Party under a new name, all the way to those labeling it as true fascists, one thing is quite certain. The Fatherland Front was a forcefully imposed top down organization. It was formed to provide a mass support for the regime and an alternative to increasingly popular national socialism, which is to some extent imitated by adopting partly similar symbolics, most notably the Krukenkreuz, and staging mass rallies. According to Michael Mann, such structures were common in what he calls semi reactionary authoritarian regimes and were established by the governments in order to domesticate rather to, than to excite the masses. <clears throat> by 1936, the membership in the front reached 2 million. Such high figures may, however, hardly be interpreted as a result of a genuine mass appeal, being largely linked to the fact that membership acted as a precondition for many jobs and benefits. This is nicely illustrated in the following anecdote. When Shushnik, visiting an industrial town, inquired with the local front functionary about the conditions, the, lat the latter replied that, I quote, well, there is a little handful of communists, perhaps two, or two to three percent. The Nazis, unfortunately, are fairly strong. Let's say 20%, perhaps 25. The Reds, meaning uh, social democrats, were always well organized here. There is no doubt that 60% remain with them. My God, interrupted, interrupted Shushnik, how many are, are in the Fatherland Front? Why, every, why everybody, Herr Chancellor, absolutely 100% was the answer. Now, now, looking back, uh, back at Preto's quote from the beginning of my talk, another verdict on Schenderstadt, in certain general points quite similar to his, came from an undisputed anti-fascist, the exiled social democratic leader Otto Bauer. Labeling it as half-fascist authoritarian corporate state, he argued, that the Fatherland Front, being artificially invented by the government, lacked mass appeal. Consequently, fascism in Austria was, I quote, an artifact imposed on the people by the legal authority of the state. <clears throat> While participation of the Heimat bloc in the regime, its alliance with Italy, which persistently pressured it to pursue a more decidedly fascist course, as well as brutality involved in suppression, suppressing the social democracy, all speak in favor of the fascist thesis, there are other, in our opinion, more essential aspects that preclude such categorization. Especially if we decide to apply modern theoretical models, such as the one by renowned expert on fascism, Roger Griffin, whose definition we may see on the slide. Despite the numerous outward fascist trappings that it adopted, the Austrian Ständestadt regime lacked the revolutionary energy, the palingenetic spirit, and especially the aim of radically transforming the society and creating a new man, which would put it by the side of Italian fascism or general or German national socialism. At best, an example of an abortive fascist regime, given the course of its development, it lacked a strong fascist movement standing behind it, as well as a charismatic leader. Its impulses were deeply conservative in nature, and the immediate motive for its establishment was largely a reaction against the advent of National Socialism. We can thus concur with Griffin, who characterized Dolphus as a kindred spirit of Salazar, who, I quote, was killed in 1934 because he embodied a conservative rather than a revolutionary solution to the interwar crisis of the newly formed Austrian state. In his opinion, both him and Shushnik were still, I quote, insufficiently palingenetic or ultra-nationalist in their inspiration to lead even in principle to the creation of a new national community for the radical overhaul of existing political, economic, ideological, and social structures. While its overall nature, in particular the question concerning the true intents behind its establishment remains contested, it might, it might for the named reasons be therefore more appropriate to treat the Austrian Schenderstadt as an example of a para-fascist or semi-fascist regime. Thank you for your attention.
I know that uh, it's not uh, necessary to stress this here, but as this is also recorded, uh, naturally such a cultural approach does not seek to provide the retrospective legitimization of Czech fascism, nor does it seek does it seek to celebrate its cultural or artistic output. Like other manifestations of fascism, Czech fascism was offensive, violent, uh, intolerant, and we must stress the moral and political imperative to expose its true face for the present and future generation. Now let's start with, uh, very briefly, with NOF. NOF was established in March 1926 and from January 1927 was led by Radola Gaida, uh, the famous former uh, legionnaire general. The NOF was the largest and indeed the only relevant fascist party uh, in Czechoslovakia. NOF looked toward Mussolini's Italy for its inspiration. It campaigned for abandonment of a nation's uh, liberal democracy and adoption of a fascist-style uh, corporate state. It was highly critical of the government, was anti-Semitic, anti-German, uh, anti-Marxist, and to a certain degree also anti-Hungarian, especially the Slovak parts of the Republic. Uh, it advocated the need for the moral, cultural, and spiritual revival of the nation and for the policy of pan-Slavism. It attracted uh, no small amount of support in its early days, but uh, uh, in the elections uh, it didn't performed that well. It won only three seats in the national parliament in 1929, and then uh, or six deputies in the elections in 1935. Um, during the Munich period, the NOF was among the strongest supporters of the formation of a national defense against uh, Germany, but it was dissolved soon afterwards by its leader. Um, as much as it was a movement for political change, uh, the NOF was also a cultural phenomenon and movement for what they themselves called a moral regeneration of Czech society. The fascist obsession with perceived cultural decline of the nation and need for radical cleansing of the nation's cultural life was an apparent uh, part of movement's ideology since the beginning. In 1927, uh, fascist journalist Otakar Lebloch published uh, the book Fascist State, or Fascistický stát, in which he expressed his fears of the moral and cultural decline of the Czech nation. He saw the new Czechoslovak Republic as infected with a protracted and grave illness. Uh, he said of the Czechs that they are living, and I quote, culturally by fake culture and alienation, in every step forward we actually go back. Moral decay is universal and where there is no pure morality, there can be no true freedom of of the nation, nor the state's independence." Uh, end of the quote. Uh, for Leblok, uh, the, these alien dangers were, of course, democracy and parliamentarism. The only remedy for the moral and cultural decline, uh, according to him, was a revolutionized nationalism, by which he meant fascism. Um, in later years, other Czech fascists elaborated upon these uh, topics. Another fascist writer, Vladimir Baltazar, a prominent Czech natural scientist, ornithologist and zoologist, blamed socialism and Jews for the sorry state of Czech culture. In an article entitled uh, Culture Walks the Path of National Self-Confidence or Kultura de po cestach národního sebevědomí, he claimed that it was socialism, internationalism and Jews who were constantly, and I quote, constantly beating down Czech national culture, uh, end quote, and were responsible for the degradation of that culture and for its poor state of health. Internationalism, he wrote, means the decline of culture, whereas flaming rampant nationalism is the basis of its prosperity. Balthazar suggested that in the first years of the New Republic, cultures has declined because of the Czechs' excessive pride in their achievements, Czechs had stopped struggling and fighting for their culture and had been fooled by socialism and internationalism. Uh, Czech fascists, however, were not content with just criticism and gloomy visions of decadence uh, and doom in Czech culture. On the contrary, they tried to bring their own revolutionary solutions, their own project of national cultural rebirth. Jan Scheinos, that you can see on the Picture, one of the most prominent ideologues of Czech fascism, saw the movement as part of the wider European struggle against Bolshevism and against cultural, political, and economic decay. For Shinos, fascism was, and I quote, 
the latest manifestation of the European spirit, a blend of civilization as developed by Greek philosophy, Roman state and Christian religion. It is a work of this civilization and for this civilization whose life is now at risk in both Moscow and Washington. So you can see this third way approach between capitalism and Bolshevism. Uh, Vladimir Baltazar claimed, and it's the guy that I mentioned before, he claimed uh, in the article uh, that only fascism offered the hope of restoration, and I quote, in the sea of cultural internationalism, fascism wants to capture the islands still resisting the red surge. The islands of national cultures as national cultures are the indicator of the living power and spiritual potency of the nation. Fascism, again uh, quote, fascism, fascism was a versatile, organic worldview, world predestined to the task of reviving our culture at the most critical time, end quote. Uh, fascism would wake the nation from the poisonous apathy created by the Jews and realism. Realism is the philosophy of uh, President Masaryk, Tomasz Gary Masaryk. Uh, they, the fascists criticized his, his philosophy, of course. Uh, the Czechs uh, should stop imitating foreign culture influences such as, and I quote, American nigger jazz, and end quote, and create their own specific cultural values. Um, another Czech fascist painter, Alois Zabloudil, who was a member of NOF and allegedly also participated on the march on Rome. Uh, he lived in, in Italy. He saw the decline of culture in Czechoslovakia as reaching its peak. And I quote, with the help of alcohol, low quality movies and jazz bands, these cultural surrogates morality is declining shamefully. End quote. However, there was hope in fascism, of course, and its potency to prevent further decay. Zablodil called fascism, and I quote, a new world culture, end quote. End quote. In a lengthy article, he explained the all-embracing fascist revolution, beginning with the moral reawakening of families and concluding with the creation of an authoritarian state. I quote again, fascism will arise in the nation whose cultural decline is the deepest. Cultural decline means the decomposition of state in the village and in the family. In this decline that fascism seeks to face and must face, that is the task of fascism. Uh, the source of cultural rejuvenation, according to Czech fascists, of course, uh, but this is the case for all the fascist projects around the world, uh, the source should be looked for in the glorious national uh, history. Uh, apart perhaps from the years of the Czech national revival, principally the years uh, 1880, 1914, the golden age of the Czech nation and culture was the medieval era of Bohemian Kingdom. Czech fascists especially glorified figures from Czech history, uh, such as Wenceslas I, uh, John of Bohemia and Charles, especially Charles IV. The ideologues of the NOF saw the principles of Czech fascism as being deeply embedded in Czech history and themselves as a continuation of a tradition that linked feudalism, the guild system, centralized authority and the cultural spirit of the Bohemian kingdom. Uh, Czech fascists were able to create plenty of outlets for propagating their vision of cultural uh, rebirth Apart from different books, pamphlets, public speeches and lectures, the most important was arguably the fascist monthly journal Stijen, you can see on the picture. Uh, it's it, it is number five, uh, there were at least 25 numbers. Uh, Stijen served as kind of a cultural review, offering a wide range of topics such as literature, architecture, sculpture, music and painting. In vast majority of cases, these articles criticized the prevailing state of Czech culture, along the lines of movement's ideology, namely the decadence of decaying Western liberal culture and an inferior Eastern culture infected by communism. While some articles offered great general criticism of a decaying culture and of dangerous trends in the world of art, others highlighted more specific problems and focused on different topics. I will now go through some of these topics, for example, architecture. Several prominent Czech architects wrote for Stjezen, uh, Bratislav Storm, for example, one of the, I, I don't want to say the famous Czech architect, but one of the, one of the most uh, important or more important architects, uh, graphic designer and illustrator, published some of his architectural and graphic designs in Stjezen, one of them you can see here, it's uh, uh, advertising tower, whatever that means. 
uh, as well as lengthy articles. Storm and Rudolf Mikula, Mikuta, another uh, architect, dominated several of the 1929 volumes of Stjezen in, in which they vehemently opposed the modernist avant-garde movement in Czechoslovakia. In contrast to this, they favored constructivism. Although naturally not all constructivism, Soviet constructivism was considered decadent and barbaric. Uh, Storm was also a great admirer of the neo-Renaissance and neoclassicism in Czech architecture, visually very similar to the Italian fascist architecture. There are some other pictures for, of, of their designs. They published them regularly in, in this fascist monthly. Then there was film. Fascist critics of the film industry focus on the, uh, quote, Californian movie machine, end quote, which, quote, produces films in the way it produces cotton or cars, end quote. Uh, it echoes the fears of Americanization and of the cultural fallout of Hollywood, which was shared by fascists all across Europe. The NOI frequently publicized and reviewed films in its press, praising those they saw as patriotic, such as films about legionaries, and condemned those they deemed harmful to the nation with a particular dislike of German films, of course. Uh, Czech fascists were similarly very concerned about what they saw as the complete decline of Czech music and musicality. According to one, and I quote, the decay of Czech musicality is a product of the philosophy of realism, again, um, Tomasz Gary Masaryk's philosophy, which dominates our progressive teachers and is their only spiritual food, end quote. The NOF even organized its own musical concerts, uh, the women's organization, uh, Fascistická Pomoc, or Fascist Help, uh, organized several pan-Slavic concerts in Prague. As one fascist commentator concluded in a short report, it, it is, I quote, very necessary in the age of various foxtrots to lead the citizens in the spirit of a true and noble art that is so forgotten and neglected these days. Then, of course, literature as well. The perceived decline of literature also alarmed Czech fascists. One of the fascists lamented over the terrible state of Czech literature, which he felt was too commercialized and was losing its high values. I quote, today it is no longer about lifting the heart and the spirit, but simply about the release of tension after a hard day's work. It seems we are approaching the twilight of the spirit of the creativity and genius that is able to create from dead ashes a divine spark. End quote. The poet Jan Maria Augusta, not very good poet, but poet nevertheless, often wrote for fascist periodicals as well, focusing on an indignant critique of Czech culture and cultural institutions and of what he saw as corruption in cultural circles. Augusta went on to condemn every aspect of Czech cultural life as either corrupt or, dis or dysfunctional, mostly because the liberal politics of the country allowed that to be the case. There was, however, still hope, as the future belonged to the everything extraordinary, young and revolutionary, and by that he meant uh, fascist, fascist youth. Um, then there was a regular supplement of the NOF's uh, official newspaper called uh, Literature and Art. Uh, this ran myriad book reviews, poems, commentaries and short stories. Uh, poems were published quite frequently in Czech fascist press, although of a very uh, little artistic worth. Uh, then there was a theater. Czech fascists also were, were also very much concerned with what they saw as the decline of the theater. Their newspaper, uh, Ryska Straż, it's um, Reich's Defense, maybe the translation, regularly published uh, theater programs and reviews, predictably praising the patriotic performances and actors and condemning plays by the Germans and Jews. Uh, the NOF even organized its own theater called Fascist Scene and sold tickets to its rank and file members at discounted prices. Now, they also uh, attempted to create other works of art, uh, such as sculptures. You can see uh, the leader on a sculpture, on a picture. Um, conclusions. Uh, I'm, I hope I'm, I'm in time. Uh, culture was at the very heart of the fascist project in Czechoslovakia, and the cultural concerts permeated many aspects of its ideology. One of these, uh, in one of his articles, the uh, school teacher, uh, Ladislav Schweitzer, insisted that the role of fascism was to change not only the political system, the change needed to be radical and revolutionary, and the national rebirth all embracing. 
I quote, it would be a mistake if some of us were to think that a small correction of our current problems was sufficient for automatic overall improvement of our whole political and cultural life. Such remedies would do little more than treat the symptoms and ignore the organic causes of Czech sickness." End quote. Schweitzer argued for awakening of the Czech nation for, uh, and I quote again, tough fight that awaits all honest fascist spiritual workers. He claimed that Czech fascism must also address the question of Czech artistic and literary culture. There are some of his uh, other quotes. But let's skip that. NOF had no clearly laid out cultural policy. Very few educated or intellectually capable ideologues and propagandists went up through the ranks of the NOF. There was very little time and insufficient human resources to set out the precise cultural standing of the movement or bring about the range of specifically cultural policies. Czech fascists failed to produce comprehensive vision of uh, cultural renewal and artist artistic endeavor or any kind of Cells, scientific, biological, anthropological, or eugenic underpinning to the notion of Czech cultural superiority typical for the fascist movements and regimes elsewhere. Czech fascists also failed to produce a comprehensive plan on how the culturally reborn Czechoslovakia might be integrated with the new fascist Europe in the future. However, despite being an abortive movement crippled with financial difficulties and a lack of intellectually mature members, it did nonetheless create a surprisingly profound discourse on cultural matters. Culture was an indispensable feature of fascism revolutionary project and the NOF was very much part of this. It would be incorrect to assume that Czech fascism was nihilistic and anti-culture or that it operated without a recognizable ideology. Even as a marginal, underdeveloped, small and basically politically insignificant movement, it was an embryonic project of a mass nationalist cultural revolution comparable to the other fascist movement in, in Europe. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Jakob, for this uh, very interesting paper. I hope um, that our colleagues on, on the Zoom session can uh, can hear me now. We had some some technical difficulties. Um, so the last uh, panelist is uh, Anton Hrubon, who works at the Matej Bell University in Banska Bystrica as Associate Professor in Political Science and History. In his research, he focuses on historical and contemporary fascism, political radicalism and nationalism in Slovakia and Central Europe. He has published uh, eight academic monographs, uh, over 70 academic articles in Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, Romania, Serbia, Belarus, and the Netherlands, including reputable national and international journals. Since 2014, he has been a postdoc and visiting scholar at the Charles University in Prague, Slovak Historical Institute in Rome, Institute of Contemporary History and Collegium Carolinum in Munich, University of Vienna, Foundation for the Memory of Shoah in Paris. As a guest lecturer, he has participated in teaching at the universities in Prague, Ostrava, Ustin nad Labem, Koper Novi Sad, and Bologna. His uh, paper has uh, titled The Slovak Historiker Streit Wartime Slovak State as an Object of Historiographical Clashes in a Young Post Socialist Democracy. Please. Okay, here we go. So today, uh, I'm going to speak about what we call living history. I'm not going to be too analytical today, but instead, on a case study of Slovakia, I'll try to point out to several issues related to comparative study of uh, fascism with special emphasis on relation between history and politics in post-socialist era we're living in right now. Uh, primarily, I'll focus on the uh, basis of post-socialist discourse. Uh, of post-socialist discourse on uh, fascist past and changes in its um, communication in comparison to pre-1980 uh, nine period in East Central Europe, of course, with uh, special focus on Slovakia. 
Secondly, I'm going to focus on narrative strategies of revisionist historiography and intentions uh, of this historiography and its disseminators beyond history as a scholar discipline. And thirdly, I'll focus well on impact of historical strike on historical awareness of general public and politics. So uh, the collapse of the communist regime represented a hope for society in Slovakia, which was at that time part of Czechoslovakia until 1993 uh, dissolution of the state. Former communist regime structures hoped that nature of political changes of November 89, called Velvet Revolution or Gentle Revolution, would allow them to avoid charges to fate and persecution. Uh, the largest part of the public was euphorically excited by the idea of freedom, the possibility of travel and the gradual improvement of standard of living in which the Eastern Bloc significantly lacked behind the West. A small but not insignificant part of Slovak society, nationalists hoped that post-socialist transformation uh, would lead... Oh, sorry. I was told that you don't see the slides properly, and I don't know what the problem might be. Well, I didn't know what the problem might be, but I can go ahead with our presentation. That's not a problem for me. I can just click the slides over like this. Well, um, a small but not insignificant part Okay, the small but not uh, insignificant part of Slovak society, the nationalists hope that the post socialist uh, transformation would lead to dissolution of Czechoslovak Federation and to a declaration of independence Slovakia and the return of the spirit of the Hlinka Slovak People's Party wartime regime during the existence of the Hitler allied puppet Slovak state. This included the main figures of Linka's party, Poles were exiled, settled mainly in the USA, Canada, Argentina, and West Germany. Uh, returning exiles and domestic supporters of Linka's party, which was officially banned in 1945, saw the restoration of democracy as a tool to shift general perspective on wartime fascist exist regime under the slogan of fighting against distortions and history's re-evaluation. The nation uh, has only one identity, one statehood, one history, uh, said Bartolome Kunz, leader of Slovak Christian Democratic Party, which was Nationalist Party, uh, who co-organized the seminar called DS Ater, unfortunate day, uh, August 29, 1944, uh, within which he declared um, this this motto. Uh, this seminar was uh, about the Slovak national uprising, the most extensive anti-fascist riot the Nazi occupied or controlled Europe after the Warsaw Uprising. Kunz claimed that their, their history is systematically debauched to Slovaks and that the so-called Slovak uh, national self-confidence has been undermined by foreign masters, mainly Marxists and Czechs in his narrative. This seminar held in Bratislava was part of already ongoing uh, passionate confrontation 
uh, regarding uh, the reinterpretation of Slovak history, especially the 1938-1945 period. Uh, historian Josef Jablonicki uh, identified the unwilling of the memorial plaque to President Josef Tiso uh, in Banos and Avebrau in town where Tiso was a parish priest on 8th of July 1990 as a trigger for a nationwide dispute to which even historians reacted just after initial hesitation. The installation of the memorial board on the facade of the former teacher's academy, which was consecrated by the resident bishop of Nitra, uh, newly appointed cardinal by Pope John Paul II, Jan Kredostan Koretz, meant crossing the red line. Even uh, caused outrage at the highest level. However, the protests of the government of the Czech and Slovak Federative Republic against this form of, of honoring Tiso's personality were ineffective. In the name of democracy, freedom of speech, and under the slogan of revealing the hidden or concealed truth, the revisionist tendencies began to spread in Slovakia, seeking to rehabilitate the Linkas party regime and push and push the exile made cult of Josef Tiso into the collective memory and history tactics. The soil for historical revisionism uh, was yet a few months before the collapse of the communist regime prepared. Uh, in summer of 1989, Milan Stanislav Durica, a Catholic priest and professor of history based at the University of Padova in Italy, visited Slovakia as a kind of first wall for the first time after a long stay in exile. Together with František Nuk, another prominent uh, revisionist historian living in Adelaide, Australia, Duica pro proclaimed his wish to provide Slovaks the real truth about their own history. At that time, at the beginning of the 1990s, after decades of communist mystification of history promoted uh, kind of opening of the 13th chamber, it sounded magical. It was kind of secret history and it was in demand of the Slovak post socialist society. The aura of these two historians, promoted by themselves as expert affiliated to reputed foreign universities who came back uh, to their homeland after decades of forced exile to wash away the ideological sediments from history and tell the true history was impressive for men. However, uh, the magic of the secret with which Yurica Vnuk and the last surviving protagonists of the Linkas party, like Josef Kirschbaum, uh, Pavel Chernogorsky, or propagandist Stefan Polakovic, promoted their revisionism, was not brand new. It was just a recap of propagandist construct made up by the wartime regime and post-war Linkas party exile. Contrary to what exile stressed, the domestic pre-1989 historiography, despite all its limitation and Marxist approaches, processed the basic factual line concerning the Slovak state at a quite solid level. Problem problematic were not the facts revealed, but the interpretation. Uh, prominent exile leaders such as Josef Kirchbaum, who we see on this slide, sought to push the man of November revolution in Czechoslovakia to sp state sponsored uh, re evaluation of history. Anyway, the leaders of a Christian democratic movement and public against violence, the most notable political parties after 1989, were aware that signing up to the legacy of the wartime. Slovak state would put Slovakia in international isolation and besides that they did not share the exile views too. Uh, the symposium on Josef Tiso organized in May 1992 uh, under the auspices of the historian and then the vice president of the Slovak National Council, Milan Zemko, was thus the first and the last broad open forum of domestic and exile historian focusing on the Slovak state. Uh, in the outcome of the symposium, a collection of papers on various aspects of Josef Tiso's career, 
Although the exile historians were able to maintain the culture of basic scholar standards, this event already showed that no cooperation would take place for diametrically different starting points. While the historians uh, based at the research institutions in Slovakia before 89, who before supported the Marxist spirit of wartime history interpretation, did not oppose the discussion about the analytical and critical re-evaluation and new conceptualization of uh, history of the Slavic state and Josef Tiso, the exile historians like Yuri Sarnuk, etc., envisioned accepting solely their starting points and interpretation under the re-evaluation process. This, however, meant nothing but repeating the palingenetic narratives and cult of the golden era, including all, all the uh, revisionist narratives you see right there on the slide. The conflict culminated in 1997 after the second edition of Burica's book called The History of Slovakia and Slovaks. Uh, it was a publication intended for regular uh, book distribution to bookstores. And the reactions to it would not probably be so critical, uh, but there's no doubt that the case affected the highest levels of politi politics. Uh, the Ministry of Education of Slovak Republic, led by uh, nationalistic Slovak National Party's nominee Eva Slavkovska, uh, sponsored the second edition of this book and dis distributed it to schools throughout the country as a special purpose publication. In addition, uh, the costs, the printing costs uh, for this book, uh, amounting to 90,000 copies. Uh, were covered by the FIRE project sponsored by European Union, which by its very nature fights against nationalist interpretation of, of history. The employees of Historical Institute of Slovak Academy of Sciences in Bratislava uh, pointed out the speculative formulations with uh, which Juica slightly downplayed the political responsibility of Josef Piso which corresponded with the strategy of his cult creators. For example, Jurica portrayed the Holocaust of Slovak Jews as a matter of purely, uh, as a matter purely under the responsibility of Nazi Germany. He reduced Tissot's role in its context to sort of charity in relation to granting exemptions from anti-Jewish uh, racial legislation at the same time However, he did not mention these are numerous anti-Jewish speeches. The overall composition of Buritza's book gives the impression that Josef Tiso was essentially an anti-Nazi resistance fighter and kind of Slovak Schindler, savior of Jews, which is in stark contrast to reality. Um, here on the slide, you can see the demonstrations at the beginning of the 1990s praising the Slovak state and cult of Josef Tiso, and contrary to these demonstrations against book published by Jurica, the slogan stated right there uh, is, is rhyming in Slovak. In English, it means uh, Josef Tiso, Bela Tuka, who was prime, uh, prime minister in the Slovak state, are the idols of Jurica and Vnuch. Uh, Jurica responded to the objections by publishing the brochure to approach to the truth supplemented by uh, documentary materials, mapping his entire case together with appendices which are dominated by supporting letters, reviews, articles and interviews. Anyway, uh, on this guy's support of representative of some representative of the Roman Catholic Church in Slovakia, and at that time, a uh, ruling movement for democratic Slovakia, led by authoritarian leader Vladimir Mečiar, did not help either. The barrage of criticism, the voices of the civil sector and uh, the Slovak Union of Anti-Fascist Fighters, veterans of the Second World War, prevented Burita's narratives of the Tissot cult from spilling over into teaching of history at schools as well as their wider social acceptance. 
Regarding the textbook case, uh, there is a complaint about the lack of church elites who would help reverse this trend and blame uh, politically insufficiently developed Slovak society for his personal failure and scholar defeating conflict. I'm afraid we lost connection, but it should be okay right now. So my my final words to conclude. Uh has personal friends and admirers uh among the Catholic clergy, for example, uh Archbishop Jan Sokol or Cardinal. Jan Kresostom Kores took a fierce criticism on Yurisa personally. Instead of clear stance towards uh, the wartime regime and the Roman Catholic Church in Slovakia as an institution, not on an individual level, um, adopted rather opportunistic approach. Nominally, on one hand, its representatives condemned the genocide of Jews, the political motivated violence occurred during the Slavic state, etc., etc. But parallel, on the other hand, they held a very, let's say, indulgent stance to the Tiso and the regime itself. After 1989, many Slovak bishops promoted the thesis that the scandalous perception of the church did not stop with the fall of communism, and it only changed its form, which, for example, Cardinal Koretz proved by saying that even in the time of freedom of speech, it is allegedly not possible to tell the whole truth about Josef Tiso reacting on the case of Milan Stanislav Durica. The threat for some of the Catholic clergy this time was not the communist regime, as before 1989, but emerging civil society rejecting Tiso cult. The abolition of censorship and the milieu of parliamentary democracy also opened up the question of uh, political and moral responsibility of the Roman Catholic Church and its figures during the existence of Axis independent Slovakia uh, for the Holocaust, persecution, etc. The fact remains that never before or never uh, after in modern history has it achieved such an enormous political influence like during years 1938-45. Catholic priest was the president of the Slovak state and the leader of the state party. Catholic priests uh, occupied seats in the state council and parliament, 12 out of uh, 63, and Catholic priests had in many county and district organization of the party. She openly admits that Catholic priests, many of whom subscribed to the idea of Hitler's Neue Europa, participating in the persecution of the population and uh, on the policy of the Holocaust during the Second World War, it requires uh, courageous self-reflection. Uh, the church after 1990s, even during this uh, Gurica, uh case, uh, has not found yet enough encouragement for that. Uh, among the statements of bishops' conference, on one hand, we might find declarations condemning racial violence in the era of the Hlinka Party regime, but on the other statements of its representatives on individual level, uh, contrasting with these declarations. Therefore, the church has stepped onto a slippery path between diplomatic restraint and covering of the perpetrators. And you ended up um, in Slovakia, religious historiography uh, still has notable impact on non-academic audience and uh, it's frequently being used until nowadays by far-right and uh, openly pro-fascist parties in their PR 
and making of their uh, historical motivated ideology. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so we have something like um, 10, maximum 15 minutes for discussion. So we should end at, at 5 p.m. Um, due to slight technical problems, my phone currently works as a microphone for Anton and Oscar. So if you have a question for these two panelists, I will uh, I will get the um, the, the microphone uh, to you. Uh, so please. If there are any questions or comments. Yes. Ah, okay. Well, anyway, I will just stand here so that they can listen as well. Yeah, okay. And um, well, I mean, yeah. So, do you want to speak to this? No, no, just speak normally. I think they, they, they will. Okay, well, three. Very, very interesting papers, and thank you because part of coming to conference is to learn new things as well. Um, Jakub is kind of specific question. Uh, we have been talking about movements or parties that may or may not have been fashioned, but they didn't use the term mm -hmm. as a name. Your people I'm have sure. no problem. <laughs> they, they're very happy to use it. They're very happy to use it in everything. They're very happy to put in the, the symbol and, and so on and so forth. Um, I could surmise why they would do it, but I wanted to hear, to hear your word. I mean, you know, it's one thing to say that we admire fascism and another thing to say we are fascist in, in Czechoslovakia. So, why is this? And whether you can offer, I mean, I don't know, take it a bit further and just offer some generalization between that distinction, because not using the name doesn't mean that you are not inspired by the ideology, by the practice. But here, that's a pretty full on example. I mean, yeah. yeah uh, well, it's an interesting question, and it could be a like whole lecture. Uh, and there's one very interesting thing. I don't think Radula Gaida, the leader of the movement, I don't really think he was a fascist. Which is a very strange. I, I have to write an article about this, but I, I so far it's just like uh, first impressions I have because he was this old legionary general who fought in the uh, against Bolsheviks. He was in the Kolchak's army, so he was very anti-Bolshevik, anti-communist, and he was in the army. He was kicked out of the army because uh, President Masaryk was really concerned about his uh, ambitions. Let's say. So when he was kicked out of the army, the, the fascists actually offered him the job. Uh, it was a paid job. He, he got paid for it. He, he got a car. He got a new Skoda car for being a leader and so on. And he wrote plenty of articles. And in none of the articles, I saw anything that would uh, like make him fascist. He, he, he wrote a very anti-communistic stuff. He was very conservative. He was an uh, uh, Orthodox church. He, his wife was a Russian Orthodox church. He was very strange kind of the mix and but the, the fascists themselves the organization was clearly fascist and uh, the things that Gaida published like books for example it, they were written by different ideologues not by him he was written like an author but he didn't write this stuff and then um, the NOF uh, National Fascist Committee they they uh, were founded as a response to the uh, success of the Communist Party in the uh, elections in 1925 but the first movement that, uh, and I talked about this in, in Padova, the first movement that emerged as a fascist movement in Czechoslovakia was called Czechoslovak Fascists. And it emerged six days after the March on Rome. And they wrote an article like, we are clearly inspired by what Mussolini did, we admire this a lot. So we are now uh, calling ourselves fascists. They, they existed before as a nationalist organization, but when they saw what, what fascism did in, in, in Italy, they were like, yeah, this is us, this is what we want to be. And uh, I believe this is from partially from the wrong um, uh, understanding of what Italian fascism was about. They took basically ideas of corporatism. They're very much like the idea of this being anti-communist and anti-Bolshevik. And uh, they uh, admired the sense of unity uh, of the nation that uh, Mussolini was able to create, according to them. And uh, lastly, uh, Catholicism. Uh, they they uh, they 
perceived Italy as a, a fascist Italy as a, as a exemplary Catholic state, and wanted they wanted to create this in Czechoslovakia as well. So there, there you go with this collection of fascism. There were a lot of uh, priests, a lot of Catholic intellectuals in the movement that really tried to uh, create this strange mix of fascist Catholic Czechoslovakia inspired by by Italy. And then slowly it, it developed. So it's it, like we talked, it's different in the 20s, different in the 30s. There were some ideologues that came to the movement, tried to uh, make this a Catholic movement, but then realized it's not really possible. The guy that the leader was Orthodox uh, Christian, so there was a conflict. And But they stick to the name. Uh, but if you read this, their stuff, it's clearly fascism, but very... Uh, uh, it, it's clearly a national permutation, quite different from what the Italian fascism was. But they call them so proudly uh, fascists. They had this, this uh, um, the, the symbols and, and the uniforms, and they were trying to copy this. But they were also very anti-German. And uh, during the Second World War, many of the Czech fascists actually fought against Nazis. Very, a lot of them ended up in concentration camps. They died in concentration camps. They are not really uh, Bolshevist heroes because they were fascists now, but they actually died fighting for not really a democracy, but against Nazism. So very strange and very interesting case that uh, there is a lot of research to, to, to do. And another thing is that they were, according to the electoral results, a very small movement, right? They, they had 1% and then 2% in the election, which is very small. But the influence was much bigger on the on the this rising factor. So yeah, it's an interesting case. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Question, what, yeah. what for you? Um, in uh, your presentation, uh, you then uh, didn't indicate uh, the dates uh, of the of your quotation. Uh, yeah, I I want to ask if uh, it's uh, uh, methodological uh, yeah, well, yeah perspective and uh, why. Yeah, yeah, no, I forgot that. Oh, okay. yeah, I'm sorry, but these were all from 1927, 1928, yes, yes. and 1929. Because yeah. uh, in the 30s they didn't have money to publish the papers. So in the 30s they, they only get the papers for a couple of weeks, and again nothing. And I didn't really. They are very, very rare, so they're hard to, to get. And I, I didn't have time to you know, go through all of them. So basically, what I was talking about is the Czech fascism in 20s, 1920s, yeah. 30s is you know, a little bit different. Well, basically, also today we have the same problems with paper. I can tell you that uh, it's, it's problematic to publish a book these days. Uh, so is there any question or comment? Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I have a question uh, uh, to Antoine mm -hmm. yeah. up here. Yes, uh, I, I am Lucia Ceci. Um, do you think that uh, the um, line of uh, John, John Paul II of purification of memory around uh, the passage of millennium in, uh, influenced uh, uh, the position of um, the bishops uh, in uh, Slovak in, um, in um, Slovak state? Uh, well, thank you for your question. That's a very complex problem. Uh, well, I guess that's the core feature that, let's say, clericalism or the religion as such shares with the fascism. Uh, the rebirth was very attractive. Uh, not me, but my my colleague, uh, Miloslav Sabo, wrote a book about the radicalization of priests uh, who were supporters of the Linka Slovak People's Party. And in late 1930s, they became radicalized and they transformed their uh, religious views in that way that they're trying to combine and to try to make some compromise between, between the religious faith and passion itself. So yes, partially um, many or, or some uh, Catholic priests who supported the Linka Slovak People's Party uh, were obsessed by the idea of pangenetic uh, rebirth and, uh, and the coming of the new uh, bright era, but I would not generalize 
this because uh, of course that many many other uh, didn't do so so um, okay um, so as in 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 an English pub I will ring the bell for the last question and uh, apparently Matiz is the one I have one question for Jakub and uh, because we're talking about Czech fascism and of course it existed in a unified state of Czechoslovakia so uh, I'm interesting what was their opinion on Slovakia and Slovaks and so on and the uh, development of the Czechoslovakia itself that is a very interesting question and again this is what makes uh, case of Czech fashion is such an interesting one. If you look at the Czechoslovakia, you are looking at basically three, maybe four fascist, different fascist projects. You have the German fascism, which is sort of like Nazism, but a little bit different in the, in the case of Czechoslovakia. Then there might be the Hungarian uh, fascism, that was quite a huge, quite, quite big Hungarian minority, but we don't know almost anything about Hungarian fascism, unfortunately. And then there you had the Czech project and Slovak project. So Czech fascists in the beginning started with this idea of Czechoslovakism, which was also the nation's idea. Tomasz Masary came with the idea of the brotherly nation or one nation with two uh, like uh, parts. And they, they were even trying to like um, unite it to one Czechoslovak nation, which didn't really uh, um, ended up well. But this developed in the in the 1920s. They went there on the positions of Czechoslovak. Uh, they claimed this was, is a Czechoslovak nation, and then they changed this to okay, there are two nations, Czechs and Slovaks. And but if you look at the ideology of Czech fascism, they really were obsessed with the Czech culture. They they went to the Czech history. They 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 really. The national fascist community, it's, they call them some Czechoslovak fascists, but they were not really Czechoslovak, they were Czech fascists. In Slovakia, fascism looked completely different. Uh, you had uh, Slovak fascists, again, uh, uh, that was created uh, in 1922, uh, after the, like, two or three weeks after Mussolini's march on Rome, like, you know, this is, this is, this looks nice, this is us. And then you have Rodo Brana, uh, created in 1923, sort of like a security service uh, of the Hlinka Slovaks People Party to you know, guard their um, lectures, manifestations, whatever, but which developed to more ambitious project of a paramilitary wing. Uh, and they were really fascist. You had this really radical, obsessed with the purity of the Slovak blood and, and so on and so on. And uh, they were um, disbanded in 1929, but they sort of survived in different sports clubs and so on until uh, they were recreated as a Hlinka guard during the Slovak state. So you have like a, two very different uh, fascist projects in Czechoslovakia, the Slovak one and, and Czech one, that they are not, they're not really the same. That's why I, uh, when I speak about, uh, when I talk about national fascist community, I don't really talk about Czechoslovak fascism. Also, this might be, you know, put to a question and might be a good discussion somewhere in Czechoslovakia, but I think, I believe this is really a Czech fascism, not a Czechoslovak fascism. Yeah. Okay, um, well, thank you, Jakob, Anton, and uh, Oscar, for uh, the last uh, panel. Um, our host, uh, Janko Bushanchis, kind of kindly um, uh, put forward an idea that uh, those of you that would like to visit a museum for a short tour of uh, one hour before we depart for, for uh, dinner. Of course, if uh, some of you would like to head Towards dinner, we can also arrange that if someone wants to skip the, the tour. It will be a short one. Normally, it takes three hours, but we have one hour. So um, we will uh, look at each fourth thing. <laughs> okay. Okay. It so, will be a really uh, short walk around. Yeah. So uh, thank you again, uh, all of the panelists, uh, for your time, for being here, for great uh, discussions, and uh, we'll continue our debates uh, over dinner, and uh, thank you to uh, uh, Oscar and Anton as well, and uh, I hope at the next occasion you will be with us in person as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.